I'm here poking around in the setup menu for Nexarellion, the mod for Star Sector, because we're going to be doing a complete campaign commentary looking at the most important moments on my rise to glory, as this time we conquer the Star Sector universe, doing some stuff that Star Sector was sorely missing. Nexarellion is a mod which I thought was really cheeky, because they're sort of self made goal is to quote unquote finish Star Sector, like to take the game and add more stuff to it to make it more of a complete game. But the game itself still isn't done, it's in early access and this feels really like, I don't know, like if I was the developer of Star Sector I would be annoyed that this other dev team is working on my game. And they've made it quite different, and I suppose the point I bring up here is that it's actually quite a lot better than the base game. I think that is a debatable position still, but actually within the settings of Nexarellin contain things that allow you to essentially make Nexarell in just the base game but better. It can be a really vanilla adjacent mod if you want and it's still a bit better. Or you can embrace what it does to make the game a bit different and essentially add on like a final third of the game. Like it adds on an entire phase of the campaign that when I played Star Sector initially I just thought it's weird that the game builds up to what appears to be nothing and Nexarellion is the thing it was supposed to be building up to and it adds meaning to everything else you do in the game while still containing the old game. Just a great example of a mod that I wanted to <laughs> praise for being this good and I'll try to praise some specific things as we go along but I wanted to focus a bit more on telling the story of what actually happened to me in the campaign because we went through various trials and tribulations and it begins off here in the middle of a Star Sector sector, I'm going to assume you know something about Star Sector, but because with the way the mod works, I basically have to play some of the vanilla game before getting to the mod content, as it turns out, we'll be going through the vanilla game also as well as we go along. So we start off as a ship in space, and we'll work out what we're going to do with that and why we're here in a minute. Firstly, I was poking around with my ship, and you might note that Normally in Star Sector it gives you a few options for what ships to start with, and you start with a fleet, but in this mod you had the option to start with just one powerful ship, and I thought that might be a meme, let's go in for that. This kind of turned out to be a really bad decision, because just having one powerful ship doesn't really help in a lot of situations, although specifically it's this ship isn't a very good powerful ship, as we'll see. So what's happening is there's some kind of war in space, and that's about all you need to know really. We're fighting for the Green Faction, the Luddic Church, and we need to conquer the galaxy and also colonize the unoccupied parts of the galaxy, which is a big part of Star Sector. There's a lot of empty space where you can do stuff, and to me, that's the best part of the game. Luckily, this mod, while not focusing on it very much, gives you options to make the empty part of space a much bigger deal in that the other factions will also go there. You have the option to allow other factions to colonize parts of the empty space, and because Nexarellin is about more of a war in the Star Sector setting, that becomes territory in the war, so it's not just the sort of faction sitting in the middle of the map and you control everything else. It's much more like a 4x game, where the other factions will be playing against you, they're doing what you're doing, they're also trying to colonize areas, and you will either be part of a faction, so you'll just do it alongside them, or you had the option in the beginning to be your own faction, which gives you a start condition where you actually start with your own colony already. And when I played Star Sector the first time, I was thinking this game sort of would benefit if you started with a colony, because in my opinion, almost everything you do in the game is secretly hinged around the colony system, that everything only has meaning if you eventually get a colony or already have one. What I don't know is how intentional that is, because you could kind of play the game for the plot, but there's not very much of it, or you could play it for the combat, but there's not very much of it or any sort of context to it if there isn't a colony system. So it's a confusing situation where it does feel unfinished and Nexarillin throws some stuff in to give meaning to a lot of stuff and I really enjoyed that idea. I liked the work they've done and I noted the dev team for this mod is much bigger than the dev team for the actual game. I think the actual game might be down to like one person at this stage. It did have more people working on it I presume. Well, something's going on and I've seen people arguing like should Nexarellin just be implemented as the base game? I find this to be a very interesting discussion. I was talking about this with regard to Mountain Blade Bannerlord recently as well. A situation where you need to ask when do the devs have some sort of responsibility to mod authors? 
because the mod authors have done work that a decent amount of the player base rely upon to enjoy the base game. And when do the devs just say, I'm just going to buy out the mod team and just make this in the game? Like all the options, all the optional stuff that Nexarellin has would be absolutely A-OK -okay to shove into vanilla and just have opt-in or opt-out, which is how it works in the mod already. And should the developers do something about that? And at least, do they have any duty to the mod authors? Because the mod authors have, in effect, made the base game more popular by making a more popular version of the base game and releasing it for free, but you have to have bought the base game already. There's some sort of mod ethics argument that I enjoyed thinking about, but I want to not rant about things too much right here. I wanted to talk about what's happening. This is sort of a prelude to my main campaigns. I'm not going to talk about this phase of the campaign too much, but to summarize what's happening, well, this battle summarizes my early game experience in Nexarellin pretty well. I just wanted to get in on the war and do something, find any fights, to try out my spaceship and just see what would happen, see what the mod had changed effectively. And it didn't go well at all because this ship really doesn't work very well on its own. Its big weakness is it turns very slowly, it rotates very slowly. So even these tiny ships can just stay out of my really narrow arc of fire. Like this ship is set up for shooting forwards and really just only that. It has a special ability that extends its forward range, but it's kind of hard to get a target to be in front of the ship because it moves so slowly. And as you can see, we're basically dead, getting taken out by these tiny ships. I almost died fighting a space station earlier, and it took me a full 90 seconds to escape from that battle because the ship is so slow. And that's 90 seconds in modded Star Sector, where the battles run twice as fast, I should note. This is one thing that I really liked, a really appreciated mod feature. Not of Nexarellin, but of the general utility mods I also added, I should say. I've got like 20 mods running here and they're all just vanilla friendly, like quality of life improvements. One thing is that you can optionally double the speed of battles by hitting a button. And I absolutely love that feature. I said this about Bannerlord as well. It's just too good to have features like that in games. You just can't go back after seeing them because it adds to not only your enjoyment by letting you choose to skip the downtime, but your mastery as well, because the choice of when to do that and the feeling of sort of speeding through unimportant stuff and only applying yourself to the important stuff is better than sitting through both equally, I think anyway. And we'll see throughout this campaign that I pretty much had the double speed on for almost all of it. And it also, that same mod, added the ability to quadruple the speed of the campaign map gameplay. And I had that on the whole time as well. I unexpectedly, I guess, found that the game's very comfortable to play at much higher speed multipliers. And I didn't really think that when I was playing without, like, oh, I imagine this game would be better if it was running at four times the speed. But after actually doing it, it's like, yeah, it is better at four times the speed. I guess the reason is there aren't enough inputs. You don't need to be watching things so slowly and reacting with that amount of finesse in a lot of circumstances. And the ability to choose when you want to do that just feels better than not being able to choose, which is always going to be the case. It's one of those nice features that I really like because it feels like it wouldn't be much work to implement, but it makes such a huge improvement to the game. Those are the sorts of things I want to hunt down in my quest for the ultimate game design. Well, anyway, it looks like my initial prelude to the campaign is over. I tested out my ship for a while, as we saw there, decided that it sucks big time, but there was a pirate station in this Tritachian sector, so I decided to land there and just see, can I make a different fleet using the money I would get by selling the big ship off? So I sold my basically dead battleship to go and buy some rubbish from the pirates, and the real campaign will start here. And I'm using the phrase campaign very liberally. I was still under the impression at this stage that I needed to sort of engage with the mod content right away. Like, I'm playing Nexarellin, not Star Sector. I need to be, like, hunting down enemies for cash or something. It's not that heavily supported. It's not that different to vanilla. You need to play a decent amount of vanilla before you start doing the Nexarellin stuff. And in the mod settings, a lot of Nexarellin's mod features are straight up disabled for a certain amount of game time after you start the campaign. Like, it's just the stuff that this mod does isn't happening here in the footage and isn't happening in the game world at the moment. And you have the option of choosing how long that period is. And that's a case where you could just like slide the slide up to 9999 days and play vanilla, but with a few extra features, that sort of thing. But we're not doing that. I think it's 90 days in the default setup. Well, anyway, 
we now need to make this terrible fleet of bad purchased pirate ships. We're going to throw a few weapons in, and one thing I wanted to do in this campaign that I hadn't done before was to try and analyse how the weapon system worked, because people were telling me that there isn't necessarily like an obviously good or bad way to set it up, only that I have done it badly before. And I was like, I guess I just don't know what a good weapon setup is. I'll try and spend more time looking into it. We've got the mods in here and the mods add a lot more information about what the weapons do. The tooltips are expanded in modded Star Sector. So there's more numbers to compare and look at, which makes it a bit easier, if a bit more daunting. It takes longer to compare weapons, but you can get a lot more information about them and make those judgments. But for me, I was still confused, I guess. So in the early game, I spent a lot of time poking around, doing the refit menus and trying to change what weapons various ships had. And as time went on, I went back to just auto fitting stuff, because as long as you have some good weapons in your inventory, the game will probably put the good weapons on your ship. Again, people will say there aren't quote unquote good weapons. I think they're wrong. I think there are good weapons. And there is something that Nexa Nexarellin specifically adds, which helps you out with that quite a lot and allows you to get better to weapons more easily or allows you to even just learn what the good weapons are more easily and we'll see that later on. For now, a terrible fleet has been made. Some thought has actually gone into what this fleet's composition is and what weapons it has, but I'm not going to tell you about those thoughts because they were almost certainly stupid thoughts and they won't really matter as it turns out. Soon I'm out testing my new fleet against the enemy and it works way better. The other thing I'm testing here is a custom control setup I made. I basically have a video on this channel a way back where I was complaining about the camera controls and just controls in general in Star Sector. And I found a relatively easy way to get around some of the issues was to rebind the thing that makes your ship point towards the mouse cursor onto the mouse. That makes doing small maneuvers near the enemy easy. I won't explain the details because this is like a feeling that I have, so it doesn't matter too much. But other things we can comment on are still there, other issues like me not being on the screen half the time. My ship floated off somewhere, looks like I decided to switch to a ship that's just closer to the action to get back into things, which is a nice feature. Yes, the camera is bound to the mouse's position permanently, and this is a big thing, like a big point of contention I had with the game. On the campaign map it lets you switch between having the camera bound to the mouse or just focused on you and in battles you can't focus it on you and you can get cases which we saw just there where your ship isn't even on the screen and it adds to the difficulty of the controls because the game has tank controls basically and it also has half inertial physics i was complaining about this in a different video so i'll just leave that aside there's something going on with the controls and the camera is the thing that i really don't like and the revelation was that the developers do know about this issue and they actively don't want to solve it. They, well, they described it as an execution tax or something was the words they were using. It's supposed to be hard to control. And I'm just so against that philosophy. It really annoys me, that sort of thing. It kind of turns me off the battle system of Star Sector. Not only that it's kind of like this and I don't really like it, but I know the devs want me to not like it, that sort of thing. Well, anyway, things go better with our worse fleet. So we've overcome some tactical hurdles to some extent, although you can see I'm also having the classic Star Sector issue, the thing that I also don't like about combat, which is where the battle is taking place with every ship running at max speed. The enemy are running at max speed backwards. So it kind of looks like we're stationary, but the, the thing is actually moving towards the edge of the map. And the battle only concludes, we only force the enemy to engage when we're at the edge of the map, which we can see on the mini map, another mod added fe feature in the bottom right. We're on the edge of the available battle space and that stops the enemy flying backwards for a while. That allowed me to close in and engage, but that didn't necessarily go very well because my engines got disabled very quickly and we end up just sitting there getting shot. Well, it's not going that well, broadly speaking, as usual. I was sort of here thinking I'm going to try to learn Star Sector more broadly because before I used the AI a lot. And what we'll see is my attempts to learn it while they found some success, I felt more confident. I didn't have any fun. So I just stopped doing it again because I straight up find it more fun to not pilot the ships myself. 
that's really the end of the day comment I have to make. And well, it's up to the devs to interpret that. Their interpretation based on their reaction to other people saying that on the forums that I've seen is, you're wrong, you're playing it wrong, please leave. Well, what can I say? I have more fun playing it this way, and I'm going to do that. I suppose the actual comment to make, the thing I want to see is the devs be more neutral about this, or more open-minded to the idea that playing the game a bit more like an RTS and playing it using the map system more and less about using the piloting system should be considered valid. It's officially not valid, but it's sort of supported in the game already in a half-hearted kind of way, and there was enough there for me to do it, so I suppose we can be grateful for that. We'll see later on my quest to master the playing Star Sector without piloting your ship meta, the unsupported way of playing that can be very effective with the right build and with the right treatment of the game's strange AI mechanics. We'll get to that. As you can see, things are still not going very well because, well, I sucked too hard to win even with ships that were more able to win. I just can't do it. And, well, it's a bad time to not be able to do it because if you lose, then you lose. You might as well just start the game again. And that's pretty much where we're going. We get obliterated once again. And I thought, well, we need to come at this from a different angle. It's that angle is to do the thing that people recommended we do, or I do, in a previous campaign. And the thing that, in my opinion, is like the touchstone that this game has with like the, the world at large. What am I talking about? I'm talking about selling drugs. And the actual point I'm trying to make is that in my like anecdotal experience, when I hear about either Star Sector or also something like RimWorld, games where you can sell human organs and sell drugs, that's like the thing you hear about. It's like, that's the claim to fame. It's like, this is the space trucking sim where you can sell drugs. While this doesn't do anything in the game, they're just another commodity. It's, I don't know, it's a thing. I think people want to sell drugs. <laughs> we are a, an oppressed people here on Earth. The government doesn't want me to sell human organs. Well, you can now in this game and a few other games. And for some reason, I see that like push to the forefront of like the memory around the game is that you can sell drugs. So we're doing it right now and we use the fact we saw it earlier where you could bring up a little menu where it tells you where to buy and sell things. When I played the game initially I was like the trading system kind of sucks because it's hard to work out where to buy and sell things because I never found that menu and it's sort of like night and day really. You can either buy things when it vaguely says that something is cheap and write it down yourself, which is the way I was doing things the bad way, and then take them somewhere else and try to sell them. But there was the tariff system, which according to the developers at least, is supposed to stop you from playing the game like a space trucking simulator. You're not really supposed to be trading things, although it's there in the game. Another weird feature where it's like, it's kind of supported, but you're not supposed to do it in like the developer's intention. You're supposed to smuggle things. I think that's what they're trying to push you towards doing, so you don't have to pay tariffs. But I thought, well, why not also have a gameplay style where you don't have to do that? Like you can buy a cargo license or something like that. Nexarelin solves that problem because <laughs> it brings in features where the tariffs go away when you're working with factions who like you. So you can earn your way to not having to pay tariffs. So there is a sort of trading playstyle that is now supported because of that which is nice we're not doing that we're doing the smuggling so this is what you were supposed to do in vanilla it's still just as effective in the mod of course because tariffs aren't really a factor if you're buying and selling drugs all we have to do is not get engaged in combat and we rely on our ships being small and nimble and the nice thing about having a small nimble fleet that i remember discovering in star sector vanilla and sort of forgetting after a while is that you're just completely free like when you have a small number of ships you can just never fight and you can travel wherever you want and things like all of the limitations the game puts on combat fleets just aren't there so i enjoyed this part of the campaign let's say for the algorithm purposes that i didn't enjoy selling drugs don't do drugs, kids. Although because I've said drugs enough times and that's what the algorithm's looking for, just the words you say, I'm already in trouble. So we might as well just commit in for a penny, in for a pound. Hey, everyone, selling drugs is a great way to start a business. It's a great way to start a militant empire as well. 
And I suppose I'm talking about Star Sector, I'll leave that up to you. The lesson in Star Sector is that if you press F1, it tells you where to sell goods and where to buy goods as well. There's a trading computer equivalent thing like in X4 or something like that, which when combined with mod features at least could allow you to do some space trucking simulator or at least could allow you to do some <laughs> smuggling simulator in an easier way. And well, it's a game where the core worlds where you would do this trading aren't really like safe enough for you to do this because there are pirates everywhere in vanilla. I saw someone complaining somewhere that Nexarellin's big problem was that it made the core unsafe because the factions can war with each other and they might come after you as well. And I just thought, well, you were playing a different game to me, I guess, because when I look back at vanilla Star Sector, the core worlds were 100% of the time being absolutely ravaged by pirates and like the Luddite path and stuff like that. Like I never wanted to go there. It's not like I would feel safe there. I can't stop going off on tangents. Let's get down to business. We've got a thing that tells me where somebody wants some drugs. I don't know how I'm getting this info or why this is publicly available. There's some kind of uh, broadcast system for who wants drugs. Luckily, the authorities have not cottoned onto this quite yet. Let's go and do it. The only comment I wanted to make about that is it should be an upgrade. You should have to buy something to be able to have that like trade computer style thing. I'm just thinking of like X4 where you have to buy a trade thing to be involved so heavily in the trade system. Feels like this should be a secret thing that you unlock and not a base feature because you can play the game without it and it's kind of cool. It would feel cooler to be a progression than to just have a thing that tells you how to do the trading because it's kind of too easy, I think, even though I was complaining not having it is too hard moving towards it would be fun. Doesn't matter, we're only going to do this once, and it's right now. In order to supplement my drug selling, I, at the same place I sold the drugs, I think, went to church. There was this little quest line you could do with the Ludic Church where you go and say something to a priest. I don't know if it does anything, which is basically my review of all of the quest lines in the game. I don't know if they do anything. There's at least one quest line that does do something, which somebody told me long after I played the game for the first time, and it's the one where you unlock teleport gates. In Nexarellin, they're unlocked from the beginning, so we don't have to do whatever that was. I remember the reason I didn't do it was because I thought it was boring. <laughs> That's why I stopped doing it the first time, but if I'd known something actually happened, once you finished it, I probably would have done it. But anyway... Something happened there, we did a quest, I don't think it's important, but I bring it up to give somebody in the comments the opportunity to tell me whether it was important. After that, we take all of our drug money, which was like 300,000, we made loads, and I started making a little fleet. And I was taking this a bit more seriously than usual. I was going into the combat simulation menu to try out using the ships before I had to go and use them in real battle. To get a bit of experience with them specifically and just the game's controls more generally. One thing that's added in mods is you can see there's this little diamond to shoot at, so the diamond is where you need to shoot to lead the target, giving the player AI tier accuracy essentially, so it's just easier to fight like this, it tells you where to shoot. That's one fewer thing to think about, because for me dealing with the combined camera movement versus tank controls versus inertial physics thing going on with the controls, it was enough for me to think about already, I was fine not wanting to lead targets. Now here's a big change to the game that actually doesn't come from a mod. This is one I just did myself after realizing you could do it. There's a text file somewhere in the game's folders that allows you to change how far away you have to be from a mission giver to take their missions. And this revolutionizes the game. This is a great example of the tiny change with a big impact. By increasing it from like 10 to 50 distance units, whatever it actually was, we can now take on like four or five missions at the same time. And I remember the first time I played thinking, it sucks that you can't do this. And well, it turns out you can if you just edit the game files. And yes, it does the business. Now, you can go on a fully fledged expedition out into the outer realms of the star sector by just taking four or five things to do that are vaguely close to each other. We can be like, right, we'll crusade between these places, doing these things, making cash, completing the missions, and then maybe also some other adventures will happen along the way. And in many ways, it's the other adventures that I'm looking for. That's the thing I really liked about the game. But just having there be a reason to go out there in the first place really helps as well, just so that it's part of the game's overall meta progression as well to be doing that. We'll make some cash and be able to come back stronger, even if nothing particularly interesting happens. Well, we'll see anyway. Let's go see what happens. Right now, we set off with our tiny fleet, because my vague goal was to avoid combat or confrontation entirely, thinking I'll take this small fleet, we've just got a couple of ships, we're going to pop in, 
do easy missions like scan the thing, which are what many of the missions are, or survey a planet, which is a bit harder, but our fleet's perhaps just about big enough to do it, and we won't have to fight anyone. As you can see, this plan goes wrong immediately, because on the way out of the system I was in, we get attacked by a tiny pirate band, and our fleet is weak enough that even like a couple of pirates are going to start hunting us down. So all that training in the simulator is going to be put to use right now. I'm desperately taking fire here to try and take out that half-dead ship behind the other one. We essentially lose our main ship here, although because it's not completely dead, it will regenerate by just spending supplies instead of having to buy another one or anything like that. So that's all fine, we'll just sit in the corner, the AI ships will do the business. Normally, I'd be like, hmm, did I do any better than the AI actually did in that fight? I think in this particular fight, I made a bit of an impact by piloting the ship myself, so maybe I learned or <laughs> progressed in some way in that regard. Anyway, we won the fight, but afterwards I was like, right, let's just go make a bigger fleet, I'm not going to put up with being attacked by like two ships and nearly losing. Along the way, here's my level up progression. We take the good level ups. This is a game where... At first I didn't really understand the skill tree, but after having sort of been up and down it a couple of times, now I'm like, okay, there is a build that is thousands of times better than other builds, and this is sort of good and bad in that all other builds are made negligible, like you don't want to do anything else. Take a certain set of, I think it's like five or six skills along the bottom, which do massive things in comparison to everything else, so there's a couple in particular that reduce your fuel use by 50% and reduce supply use by 50%, which makes the game so much easier because your profit margins in terms of fuel and supplies are quite tight. So halving their use means your profits go up by like five times, ten times. Like the, they're extremely powerful. They're more powerful than just the number 50% would make you think. So buying those in the beginning, which I did, just means the actual monetary management of the game is going to be negligibly easy, which is the opposite of the experience I had when I first played the game, when I thought it was way too hard, because I didn't have double salvage then either, which we'll talk about in a bit when it comes up, if you don't know what I mean by double salvage. Anyway, what am I doing here? Here's another thing which I wished was in the game, and it is, but I just never found it in my first playthrough. You can install surveying equipment in your various ships to make surveying not just cheaper, but practically free, if you just put it in all of your ships and all of your auxiliary ships as well, because even ships that do nothing, like your fuel carriers, can carry the survey equipment, making surveying cheaper without sacrificing any battle potential. Normally, you have to take weapons off your ship, for example, to allow you to put survey equipment on them, but not so much for fuel carriers or cargo haulers, things like that. So, we're making a fleet that's really good at surveying. That was another thing I complained about the first time I played through, that surveying doesn't make you enough money, it's not worth doing it, and it was lame because I thought I want to be a survey fleet. If you get that upgrade, you can do it, but you have to take a certain level up path to be able to do that. Now that we know that, I can just take it from the beginning, it's going to be easy enough to get started with our surveying fleet. But I get this feeling, which is similar to Mountain Blade, Bannerlord in particular, or just Mountain Blade, all of them in general, where there's a build which is correct, and it gives you these options you can pick for your skills, and a lot of them aren't very useful. I think I'm thinking about Bannerlord, really, where in Bannerlord, you can take a lot of skills that are about what you do personally, like your personal combat skills, and it's the same in Star Sector, where lots of abilities are about your ship, so things that only affect ships that you're in and not your fleet in general. It feels to me like you're just leaving stuff on the table if you don't take the fleet upgrades, because there's no other way to get them. Whereas you can put officers in ships who will also provide the same abilities as you would if you upgraded yourself to be great at piloting ships. So I wonder, like, what's the intentionality there? And it's the same deal with Mountain Blade. I'm thinking about Bannerlord specifically, where you would spec into, like, stewardship and leadership and things that only the player can do. But if you wasted points on something else, you're just leaving stuff on the table. You can never now get the bonuses from stewardship because you can't get them in any other way. Whereas things like personal combat ability, well, you could get somebody else to do the personal combat in both that game and this game, so you don't really want to focus on it yourself. It feels like some kind of rework might be needed. I don't want those skills to be less powerful. I think those skills make the game playable, basically, by taking them. Like, I couldn't imagine playing it without it. And it goes further than just like balancing or number difficulty because of the effect it has in game. So, for example, we've taken the plus 20% supplies dropped in battle and minus 50% supplies used buffs quite early on. And 
Not only is there the profit margin thing I just talked about, where you make a lot more money than double, like you make more than what it sounds like you're going to make from that, but it opens the game up. That's the real thing that I like about them. If you just have more fuel and have more supplies, there are just more things in the game you're allowed to do. So it just removes restrictions to be trying to get those things as economical as possible. If you want to fly a long way, you need the fuel buff. If you want to like bomb a planet or something or do more military operations, which is something added by the mod, which we'll see later really, I'm referring to something that hasn't happened yet. You need supplies more than usual in this mod and there's more cool stuff to do with supplies. So you want to keep as many of them as possible just to do more gameplay content. So I can't imagine, as I said, playing without the buffs that give you way more of those things because you would just be playing less of the game, you would just be playing a worse game. Like, it's different than saying it would be harder, it would be worse, that's what I'm committing to saying there. And what I wonder is, is there some other viable build possible? Are those skills just there so that you can take them and, like, giving you the option to not, not take them as a beginner's trap? Like, what do the developers expect you to do in that skill tree? I wonder gives off the same vibe as Mountain Blade, where it feels like there are correct options to pick. I guess it's nice to be able to pick something else, and in my recent Mountain Blade campaign, I did a campaign exclusively picking the something else options, and had a lot of fun with it, but only because I had mods to enable that as a viable build. Well anyway, there's something going on with the skill tree, I'm not really going to talk about that, I'm just going to take all of the passive things that don't affect you personally and stack them all up, so I have a massive fleet, massive number of officers, high level officers, things like that, that's what it all does. And there's lots of things about buffing fighters specifically, so we'll get into fighters later. Now while I was ranting, you can see what's happening, I got involved in a gigantic space battle, and this is what I was hoping that Nexarellin would provide. By having the factions fight each other, there would be big engagements that you can get involved in, feel like you're doing something, and basically force the scale of the action to be bigger. My huge like day one disappointment with Star Sector, when I sort of heard about it and thought this sounds promising, played it, then thought oh okay it's not going to do the thing I was thinking it was going to do is the scale. Battles are very small and they're very slow, but here we have a case that is not really like that at all. A massive battle between two fleets. The reason is there are millions of caps on like bringing things to battle. Not only like soft caps in that you have to pay to bring things to battle, like the player might not be able to afford having a big fleet, but if you could it also wouldn't let you use it because there's a limit on how big the fleet can be in space, there's a limit to how many ships you can deploy in combat. I was thinking they would go the other way, since it's in 2D, there's going to be lots of performance to use, lots of space for having there being a hundred ships on either side, that sort of thing, and having a big flashy engagement. Like the one we're in right now. So it did happen, there you go, it can happen. I don't know if this is really mod exclusive, because I think I've seen battles like this happen now and again in vanilla as well, where two large armadas take part in combat. I guess just being in Nexarellin means this is much more likely to happen. And this is good, this is what I wanted to see, and basically I want this but also with improved RTS controls so we can be looking at this fight from a slightly more zoomed out perspective and see all of the action. You can see there are two <laughs> blobs of fleets fighting each other. We do die, that doesn't matter though because I think I've already taken the buff where any pilot or any ship piloted by either you or an officer is immortal, quote unquote, in that if it dies it just comes back after combat. Again, that's a pretty powerful thing to not take in the skill tree, so a useful thing to have. Anyway, this fight, what I got here, was basically what I came into this game and this mod looking for. My metagame objective is, while it's technically to fight for the Lodic Church and conquer the galaxy in their name, what I want out of this is battles like these. I want to take part in large-scale space battles in Star Sector because I, re I really like the visual effects, I like the flow of combat to some extent, in that when big fleets start fighting each other, the floatiness and the weirdness of the controls matters less and less, especially if you're piloting a big ship yourself. And it starts to feel just more cool instead of weird, to me at least. And I wanted to see as much of that as possible, and I hoped I would get this from the beginning with this mod. I'm getting it now, towards the beginning, so you could say I got it a little bit, but basically not really, this was a one-off, I happened across this battle that I could participate in. For the most part, we're going to have to work to get our gigantic space battles, and we're going to have to try and organise them ourselves, which the game is tilted against, but
but with enough work, we can get the action that I'm looking for. I really am a maverick renegade. I just want to see spaceships burn in space. I want to see lasers and missiles flying all over the place. I want absolute battlefield chaos. I'm a bloodthirsty monster, and I will do it in the name of whatever the religion I'm fighting for is about. I'm very mercenary in my allegiance to the Luddic Church. I'm doing it for them just because I hadn't really been to their systems before or something. I don't remember. The point of all this was, well, not only to rant, I left that footage in knowing I would rant over it, but also to show you how I got this ship. This is one of the best ships in the game, I think. It happens to drop out of this fight that's quite early on. It's another case where, as we saw earlier, getting a really good ship doesn't really help you in the early game because you probably can't use it for anything. And while they're good, they're not good enough to make up for how expensive they are to use. So it's not like I'm going to make a profit by bothering to put the supply investment into using a good battleship early on because you can't kill enough stuff with it with only a small supporting fleet to make it worth it. Something, something. I had some balancing concern or some calculation I was making in the background which causes me to not use this really good ship which we saw me getting just there. So I'm going to take that good ship and store it and come back to it later. That costs money to store it as well, so we're really committing to just investing into this ship in the long run. We're not even going to use it. One day I will have the 14th Division Elite Battleship. I can't remember the exact details, but some ships are denoted as being part of the 14th Battle Group or something, which makes them slower but better than ordinary ships from the Hegemony ship line. There's something going on, it doesn't matter. There's a ship with good numbers in our fleet that won't be with us. We're going to be doing missions that don't really require us to have a battleship, so it would be stupid to take it with me in this case, I think, anyway. But this is the beginning. This is what I wanted to see. We're going to start piecing together a ship that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other mainline fleets deployed by the other factions by gradually getting a collection of battleships, and then if we can get the economy to use them, which will be the sort of playing the vanilla part of the game I mentioned, to get a colony system that's powerful enough to supply a fleet that can then contend with the other main factions, then we'll get the cool space battles, okay? Have we got the plan down on paper? We're going to do all these things with the eventual goal of seeing a big explosion. Lots of big explosions, yes, yes. Let's start piecing together our new and glorious and surely just empire of explosion enjoyers. So here we are, out somewhere, it's time to get some stuff. We're going to skip over most of the getting stuff in the campaign, but I thought for my first expedition, I'll show some of the getting stuff and do some getting stuff commentary. So what is there to comment on, really? Well, it's all just UX stuff, I guess. So first things first. We did a double salvage, and I didn't have to press anything to do it. What's a double salvage? It's where once you pick up stuff from space, you often need to press the salvage button again to keep picking it up, so it doesn't pick up all of it every time you try to pick it up and you sort of keep going to get the rest. I played a lot of my first campaign not knowing you could do that, which decreases the stuff you get from salvaging things by between 50 to 100%, depends on how big the salvage is, I'll talk about how it works really in a second. But essentially one of the mods I've got is the auto salvage, which means if you salvage something, and then there is the chance to salvage it again, it will just instantly bring up the menu again and keep salvaging it. So that's one click fewer, one stage better than the vanilla system. I mean, it's not really the clicks that matters there, it's just the fact that it does it at all. So like, if you didn't know you could salvage something twice, it just starts doing it. Like It assumes you would want to salvage all of it, you didn't just want a bit and then you'll leave, which is the correct thing to do. So that's an improvement. But as we see here, as I'm salvaging all these ships, you might note it's like five stages to salvage a ship, and this is something where it can be zero stages. There is a route through the three or four menus you go through to pick stuff up in space that the player will almost always take, that route being, yes, I want to explore the derelict, yes, I want to salvage the derelict, take the things that are most valuable up to your inventory capacity, put the things you can't take back, and then close the screen. This could be no clicks. It could be a case where it just picks up the stuff. It salvages the stuff that you want, and only in cases where your inventory is full or the ship you're salvaging could be repaired completely does it bother to interrupt you and say, hey, do you want to not do this? This is a game where that's a sort of running theme that somehow I never really picked up on on my first playthrough. It is a game that constantly asks you if you want to not do what you're doing, like right here, for example. I went up to this mining station. It said, do you want to not explore the mining station? 
there's no reason to fly up to it and not explore it. So we can cut that stage out already. Then it says, do you want to consider recovering the ships? That's a more niche case because if you say yes, it brings up another menu in which you also consider recovering the ships. So you just have to cut out the first stage of that and carry on with only one opportunity to consider recovering the ships. And then you say no, you start picking up the stuff here, I have to do some inventory management a little bit because I don't want to take everything, and then boom it says, okay, do you want the rest? Then you say yes, then it says, do you want to not take it? You say no, as in you say begin salvage operation, and then you get another salvage screen where you keep picking stuff up. So we've got a process there where I wanted to pick up the stuff at that mining station. If I just flew up to it and a thing popped up on the left saying, you picked up this amount of metal, this amount of fuel, this amount of supplies, with no full screen menus, nothing at all, I wouldn't be like, damn, it didn't give me the choice to not do it four times, like something like that. This is a major UX concern that just arises from the game being old fashioned, I guess. It's a case where it's similar to something I was commentating on about a game called Chaos Galaxy, where there are like theoretical situations when you might actually say no in these menus, like while 99% of the time you just skip through it. There's like a rare situation when maybe the menu's existence is justified. To me, that's the developer's problem. They only show you the menu in relevant situations. They need to work out when the player w might fly up to a station and then click don't explore and just, I don't know, walk away from the keyboard or something. Like, if, is there a situation when that can occur? If so, only present that option in relevant situations. If not, do not present the option, that sort of thing. This isn't the spirit the game is made in, like that sort of thing pervades the entire game. Like right there, flap to a hyperspace jump point, it says, do you want to not jump to hyperspace? Occasionally, there'll be scenarios when you actually don't want to jump through a gate you've just gone up to. Sometimes it says there's an enemy on the other side, and that's exactly the sort of thing when it should stop you. So it's already in the game in that case. It's just that when it doesn't say that, it still stops you and asks you if you want to not go through anyway. Here's a case where there actually was enemies on the other side. I'm just going to use Go Dark to try and not get killed by them. So this is the advantage of having a smaller fleet. Even if there are enemies around, there's a decent chance you can just never fight them. This is the meta that somebody went out of their way to explain to me in extreme detail. Basically, a while ago I posted a video that I unlisted at some point of me playing Star Sector for the first time. And somebody posted a quite long reply video doing what I'm doing here, saying this is how you're supposed to play Star Sector. You take a small fleet, sneak around, salvage things, and then the game's easy. And yes, that is correct, but I suppose the reason I didn't do that very much, at least in my first campaign, or at least at the beginning of my first campaign, is that you have to know that you aren't going to fight. Basically, the game is set up such that you're not supposed to take battle fleets if you're not going to fight on a mission, but it takes experience to know what missions you don't fight on and to sort of work out that it's relatively easy to avoid combat. You usually have the option to even go around in like a tiny fleet with one or two ships and just not fight and you're safe even though your fleet is vulnerable to attack. You just won't get attacked. It's just a case of knowing that and then after that it's easy. I think the way I put it to someone somewhere was that it's hard to use but easy to master, that sort of thing. Where once you know what you're doing, it's trivially easy, but it actually takes some trial and error to know what you're doing. So the game's almost in a sticky situation where if it told you like what you're quote unquote supposed to do, I think the game would lose something. Like it almost can't tutorialize these things, even though my normal complaint would be you should have tutorialized anything you were supposed to know. Here, I think if it told you everything you're quote unquote supposed to know, the game would be too easy. So sort of just failing is perhaps the intended route to get through the game and some, some games are like that. I don't think it's the best way to do things. It's a case where the developer could always do more to make something better out of that situation but if they're not going to do it well I think they should just say just say like you're expected to fail something like that or imply that in some way. I guess Dark Souls is the typical example of something like that where it's a game that's actually easy, technically. Guys, it actually is easy <laughs> if you play it because it's one of the slowest, simplest action games out there. It just doesn't tell you that and you'll probably be going all kinds of other ways in your thought process trying to play it and eventually you'll realize what's happening in Dark Souls and then it gets to the point when you see people playing like the entire Soulsborne trilogy without getting hit and things like that, which just would be unimaginably difficult in most other game franchises. And it means that learning to get to that point 
is the fun. It's not hard to pull off, which makes it accessible, like anybody can be good at Dark Souls because the actual inputs required are quite easy. It's just learning to do them. That is hard. And I'm in this situation where I'm like, I would criticize the game for relying on having to learn the game, be part of the gameplay and not like teach you the game in a fun way. But then again, that is also what it's supposed to be like. So there's some sort of conflict of tastes going on there, which also applies to my view of Star Sector. It is a difficult situation to be in from a game design nerd point of view, but it's not necessarily a bad situation to be in. It's fine. It's a case where I constantly think, hmm, could this be different? Could it do something better? But it could even be that it not doing something better is helping it. Like it being difficult to learn how to use it is what people like about it. I'm really just ranting because there's some kind of concern that carries on for me from a game design loser perspective where I'm like, I must only play the perfect games. I must take any game I play and like if I was suddenly put on the dev team, know exactly what I would change. That's the weird complex that I have. Well, I have this concern that the learning experience is more sort of frustrating revelations than empowering revelations. Like realizing you just press six to double salvage isn't necessarily fun, even though it makes the game more fun to be able to do that. And I guess you could call that part of the game experience to realize you could do that. I don't know. It would be more fun to me to just tell you to do it and then do something else. That's where it's the responsibility gets shifted onto the developers. They have to do something with that mechanic. Learning the mechanic can't be the gameplay. That sort of approach. That's what I'm trying to advocate for. I'm not convinced this is a principle that holds up. Like, there are probably situations when you'd want to do the opposite. But I feel like whatever Star Sector has done, it didn't hit the sweet spot where learning the game is fun enough that once you learn it, you could just shut the game off and be like, I'm done, which is sort of what you have to do, because once you've learned everything, you'll quickly find there isn't much else to do than learn everything, which I think is only a balancing concern, really. There's no challenge that a veteran player could only do, or only a veteran player could do to use the correct order of words. And at the same time, it has the opposite balancing problem where the normal challenges will be difficult for a new player to do, but not because they are difficult, just because the game is difficult to use. It's difficult to learn how to play the game, but easy to master it. I think that's what I said earlier as well. I'm stuck in a commentary loop once again. I could probably go on for a while. Well, the point is, I suppose, to make a meta comment, I'm rambling on because the gameplay is rambling on. We're in the phase of the campaign where we're going to be just going around talking to each object in the outer parts of the star sector, getting the stuff they drop, and now and again there's a little quest like this one, we get a thing to take somewhere else, which I think is part of like the quote-unquote story quest that does something, the one that I missed or didn't pick up on because I only played halfway through it and got bored <laughs> in my first playthrough. Or maybe it wasn't so much getting bored, it was like doing this isn't profitable and there's other things I need to do in the game and because your fuel and supplies are ticking down all the time I didn't want to commit myself to doing something that wouldn't feel like it's useful to just keeping me alive keeping me afloat this may even have been before double salvage as well so I was 50% down on supplies because of that I'm also 50% down from not taking the skill that gives you that 50% supply boost there's the real hard mode Although we are playing on some kind of hard mode added by Nexorellin, as I mentioned earlier, which I think reduces salvage a little bit. I think it reduces it by 20%, but the first level up you get also increases it by 20%, so I don't know if it does anything in the long run. I guess in the long run it does do something versus vanilla if you took the normal build. I think it also does a lot of stuff to weaken the colony system, which we'll see later. That's the main difficulty change that the quote-unquote hard mode adds. So we've done it. I've salvaged some things, looks like I'm starting to head back, and I'm failing to get through the storm here due to me toggling on and off the go dark thing. One of the skills you can get early on is something that increases the speed you can go at while still not being affected by storms. And I clearly don't have it yet, so it's not that early on, it's not in the first couple of level ups. But yes, one of the yellow skills lets you go through storms without going dark in a straight line, which makes navigation very easy avoids any calculations, quote unquote, you have to make by going around storms. I'll qualify that statement I just made. I was annoyed when I was first playing because I was thinking, is it cheaper to fly around a storm and fly quickly or to fly slowly through a storm? It's a calculation that's hard to make because you don't really have the numbers to hand. It's something you'd have to test out in specific situations and for specific lengths of journey. And it's something where I thought, 
is it better to just speed through the storm, let the storm push you on, repair the damage and pay for that because you still use fewer supplies and less fuel by just getting to your destination as fast as possible because those things are quite expensive. I think the conclusion I eventually came to through my poking around with that was that it depends on specifically what ships you have in your fleet, so it's just hard to work out what the correct thing to do is. But at some point, I'll grab the skill that lets me just fly through storms at my normal burn rate and you can just go in a straight line, hold down the make the game run at four times speed option and just prioritize getting to the destination as fast as possible, which is great for real life as well. And it's probably a decent enough economic choice in that you minimize the distance and sort of minimize the time spent in space, depending on the specific route. I'm already having another anxiety attack trying to plan my navigation course through space in that sort of way. I think me caring about the efficiency of routes is the problem there. I think not caring is pretty viable, at least it is when you have that half fuel use thing because fuel becomes much less important. But I do remember caring a lot when I first played without that half fuel use thing. I was very concerned that I was spending 20, 30,000 credits extra to go around a storm, something like that. Well anyway, let's get back to business. We've done the thing, I've done my expedition, I come back to civilized space with a load of cash, and this is something that adding those extra missions in was really important for. It's important to me, in the game design of Star Sector, to be able to go out on one expedition and then have the option to not go on another one, which I don't think is what they were intending for you to do. But I really like this idea that you could go out, do like five things at the same time, and thus come back with enough money to buy new ships and potentially go and do something else. Now what is the something else you'd want to do? I suppose colonize something in vanilla maybe, or go and do a different quest that doesn't involve going out into the outer star sector. I'm not quite sure. Well, in Nexarellin, the context is that because there is this war that you can participate in, the ability to go out and have an expedition phase of the game, like an expedition activity where you spend an hour doing something, you come back with enough progress having been made that some meaningful new thing you can do on the military side is now available. And that is in tied entirely to the amount of money you made while you were out there and the stuff you found. And if you do five or six missions, you'll come back with a few hundred thousand credits as we have here. I could buy a couple of cruisers and have my fleet be more viable as a combat thing, or at least add them to my stored fleet for later if I want to, that sort of thing. And I think that rhythm is one of these things that improves the game dramatically in the long run, and it's a resonating effect of just increasing the mission spawn distance or the mission pickup distance. It means the game's rhythm is altered in a really positive way, I think. Not having to go back and forth over and over again is a gigantic improvement, and I think when people say that Star Sector is repetitive, they're talking about that, and I didn't feel it with this just going out and doing five missions at once system. That feels much more natural to me. I think this is it, and this is what it should be by default at the very least, with of course the options to use the vanilla setup or other setups always appreciated. I spent a lot of time praising these mods, but what I really like about the mods is that they're optional. If the developers came in and said, okay, people are saying this mod is better than vanilla, I'll just implement this as the vanilla settings. I would also criticize them a little bit for that by saying, well, I guess it is better, but it's even better to do what the mod was doing, to let the player choose. Harder to balance a specific gameplay experience around that, but for expert players, they probably really want the ability to choose. I think giving as much customization options as possible is ideal and having the game be provided through mods to some extent does achieve that in a sort of vague sense. So I am getting what I want out of Star Sector with modded Star Sector. I modded it to be the game that I wanted, I changed the settings to make it feel better to me. What I want is for all players to have that option. All players should have the ability to have the fun that I had with Star Sector or to have the fun that people who like Star Sector vanilla had had. And I guess technically that exists because of the meta of mods existing, as I said. But I want it to be official, and I suppose I'm also saying, to make more of a committed statement, that I think the modded version is better, or would be more suited to a general audience. Like, the modded version is more like what I think people will expect the game to be. There are still 
a thousand UX improvements that could be made, but even if you didn't do that, you'd be fine. Well, to make a comment that is that meta, the game can release as it is right now with no mods and be fine. Like, this this is the sort of game that would get 90% positive reviews on Steam, for sure. They don't have to do anything, so I'm sort of talking from a what I want in an ideal world situation rather than a this is a game in need of rescue, it has to do this to succeed. I think it will succeed with no changes from here. I think if they took the game back one patch and released that, it would be more successful than even the current setup, which is a specific comment I'll get into much later, I think. Here was a neat little feature, which I think is added by Nexarella, and I can't remember anymore. This might even have been in vanilla, for all I know. I don't think it was, though. It's an insurance system where you can pay a certain amount of money to insure your ships for a couple of in-game years, meaning if they die, you get paid out roughly 10 times the amount you put in. And obviously you can perhaps sense a possible exploit with this system, and I regret not really trying it out. The idea would be that you capture ships or recover ships from battle rather than scrapping them, take your like terrible ruined ship, don't repair it, just put insurance on it and then get it killed, and you'll get 10 times the ship's value. And this will give you a lot more money than you'll get for selling ships, because generally speaking selling ships is very unprofitable, like ships are worth less than the components they're made of for some reason. So. I guess you're not supposed to capture and sell ships, they just didn't want you to do that. But with this insurance system, you could sort of do it, albeit in an exploity feeling way. I didn't use this very much, and I regret not using it. I think I could have made big money if I'd been paying more attention to possible insurance scams. And as I said earlier, people like committing crimes in games, so if you like selling drugs, maybe you'll like running insurance scams as well, now available in some mod of Star Sector. I think it might be Nexarellin. Anyway, we move on to this very profitable series of battles. I was in the Ludic Church's space fighting pirates who were constantly attacking this one planet in multiple waves at the moment, and there in an auto-resolve I captured an enemy VIP. This is a mod added feature I believe as well that massively increases the profitability of fighting, which is one thing I really wanted to see change, which is good, but there are other things that are changed in that direction as well. Another thing that helps us out is that there's this sort of exploit, I guess, of sorts, where you can often auto-resolve a fight using one cargo ship, and it will just blow up the enemy ships. I think once an auto-resolve comes about, it just presumes the enemy is in full retreat. Anything you send against them is more effective than usual. And I found that in both vanilla and in modded Star Sector, sending, say, like one cargo ship that technically has a gun on it will just blow up a whole bunch of the enemy fleet, and you'll get a massive return on the investment. You'll be spending like a couple of hundred on supplies to blow up tons of the enemy fleet, instead of the thousands to tens of thousands it would cost to deploy in a normal battle, or deploy the amount of stuff you think would actually be needed to successfully hunt down the enemy. The game's very generous when the enemy's retreating, and you can make big money that way, and I was just using that from the beginning in this campaign which helped out as well. Anyway, you can see what I'm considering right now, at the planet I'm defending, there was this battle cruiser for sale, cheap enough that I can buy it right now. The downside is it comes with a whole bunch of D mods, downside mods you could say, indicated by the orange bars next to the ship's name up here. So it comes with loads of debuffs as a result, but I already have the skill in the yellow tree down there that allows you to constantly remove debuffs for free. Normally that costs hundreds of thousands to do, so this is a massive saving skill as well, where it's like why would you not take this, you'll just constantly profit from doing this. So, in the background, that ship will be fixed, but I'm going to use it right now in this large battle to defend the space station near this Ludic Church planet. Another opportunity to get what I was looking for, a massive battle, and when you have allies on the field, the battles tend to be more massive and just cooler in general, so fighting alongside your faction is really what I like to see. Looks like I'm not even using the big ship I brought, probably because of that thing I mentioned earlier, where Putting a level 5 officer in the ship gives it so many buffs, there's no point in me using it. I guess the AI with all of its buffs will do better than me, piloting it badly and not getting any buffs. So the big ship's going around on the right doing its thing, it has this weird ability where it pulses forwards by blowing up a bomb in its own engine or something. It had some sort of cool lore thing going on which I quite liked. It's a very hardcore ship even though it's not really very good on balance. But I was having fun doing my thing in this fight. I felt like I was still playing very badly, like I was always struggling to use all of my weapons effectively and keep them on target and just do all of the stuff. Again, I'm just going to cite this or put this down to 
the camera moving around. I kept struggling to, like, know where to put the mouse and know where to put my eyes on the screen because stuff's moving around all the time. Here's a nicer situation. We're just going to sit still and fire at the enemy. That's fine. If we could just connect the camera to my ship, I think I'd be a million times happier. Well, what I want is the ability to detach it at will, like in Brigador, a game I was playing on a different channel recently, which executes all of that perfectly. Anyway, this battle turns out to be very profitable for us. I didn't expect it to be so profitable. I was doing it for fun, but the rewarding aspect of this battle turned out to be through the roof. One thing to mention first, though, is we're in a situation right here where the enemy are in retreat and I have the option to keep fighting them. And what I want to know is, well, does anyone else know what the correct meta thing to do here is? Because it costs money to hunt down retreating enemies and you get a certain amount of money back. And by money, I mean like resources, really in that your ship's combat readiness is constantly dropping in fights. So if you're going after a ship that's only going to drop like five supplies with your whole fleet, if it takes more than one second, like it wasn't worth doing it, that sort of thing. So there's some sort of calculation you could make in the background. And this is another case where it's just because I'm trying to make the calculation that it's annoying me. I think probably not thinking about it is what was intended, perhaps indicated by the fact that the information you would need to make that decision is not provided. Like there could be a counter in the battle saying this is how much the battle has cost you so far. And it sort of counts up how many supplies you're going to need to recover from the battle over time or how much stuff you've used. Then you might be able to say, you know, get a feel for a battle that lasts about five minutes costs about 100 supplies so like here's how much stuff i need to destroy in that time to make it worth carrying on the battle versus just quitting the battle and letting the enemy's small ships leave because they won't drop enough resources to make it worth hunting them down that sort of decision i would like to be able to make that decision i feel like it's difficult and while I'm asking you, do you know the answer? I will allege that it's very difficult for you to know the answer, but if you've somehow worked it out, tell me anyway, because I also want to know the answer to that sort of situation. Now, it shot by, and it was barely on the screen for more than one frame, but we're now really rich. You might have noted I've already made back the money I spent buying that gigantic ship. How did I even possibly do that? At the time, I thought it might have been because they fixed something that I didn't like about the game, but it's more like, well, it's sort of been fixed in a roundabout way. Allow me to explain why I'm suddenly getting rich. I'm not cheating, honestly. The first source of income was faction commission. Because I'm part of a faction, you get paid every time you kill some of those factions' enemies. And in the past, I've criticized this for being insufficient. I think it's something like 300 credits for like a frigate up to like 3000 for killing a large capital ship or something like that. I can't remember if it ever actually tells you the full price list, but you can get money for killing enemy ships. But the amount of money is broadly speaking, less than the cost of defeating those ships. So it's more like compensation for something you have to do anyway. It's not something you'd want to go out of your way to do. And that was why I didn't like it. I thought if I'm part of a faction, I want to be able to make money like as part of a faction, like as a mercenary captain of sorts, where the faction will pay you just for killing enemies. And then anything they drop or any money you make in the process using other mechanics is a bonus and you don't have to do that, which would also open up more build opportunities as well if you don't need to be so concerned about getting supplies and stuff because you're being paid enough to resupply your ship by your master faction. So that's one source of the income. That was that gave me about 10,000 credits for that battle. So that's a little bit. That's a start. Possibly not enough to sort of pay back the cost of the battle. In fact, I think, if I remember correctly, that battle cost me 90-something supplies to fight, which is about 10,000 credits. So I made back roughly the amount of money I spent going in, but then I also got 200 supplies in drops. So that's the sort of profit angle, where I'd made 20 grand overall, just taking into account the old sort of vanilla style mechanics. Then there's another payout system, which I think is also in vanilla. And maybe I just never really noticed it being this potent before, but there's this system bounty thing where you get money for killing enemies in a system. Like just the government of a faction will broadly give you money. And this is separate from the commissioned giving you money for fighting enemies. So you can get this money without being part of a faction. And generally speaking, the amount you get through that system is a lot more than what you get through the commission system. And my vague like instinct for how it should be is just the other way around there. We made a cool 100,000 from those system bounties, so that's where the money is really coming from. It was the Persian League and the Independents who had a bounty on the pirates. And I think we're benefiting from the fact that, I didn't realize this before, maybe this is only a mod feature, 
the system bounties have a, a range, so to speak. Like, if you kill an enemy of the faction offering the bounty, somewhere near the bounty area, it still counts. So while we're just fighting pirates to save the Luddic Church, the Persian League and the Independents consider me doing it for them as well, and they're paying me way more than my boss, the Luddic Church, is to save them. So, I can't remember in vanilla whether the system bounties had that sort of range system where just fighting near the correct system also gave you the bounty, because I don't remember making anything like that amount of money before from system bounties. But I don't remember very much at all because it was a while ago. Doesn't matter. Essentially, we made enormous amounts of money from that fight and I was very pleased with that. That's exactly what I want to see as the reward for those big battles. And then there was actually a fourth source of income that I didn't show, I think, which is that just before that battle I captured some pirate VIPs. VIPs I think are a mod added feature again, I can't quite remember at this stage, it's too long ago now. But I think VIPs are worth about 30 to 60 grand each depending on something or other. It seems to change sometimes what they're worth and I can't quite work out why. But they're just like a drop from battle that comes with your salvage. And just them alone is enough to fix all of my vanilla concerns, I think, because getting VIPs and then you sell them at planets makes you enough money to make fighting worth it without the commission or bounty system. With the commission and bounty system, it's ultra worth it. Combined with it being something I want to do, something I think is fun about the game, I was really happy with how all this turned out. Now let's talk about the strategic situation. My goal in the campaign now is to actually fight the Luddic Church's war with Tritachion. Here's the problem, Tritachion have a fleet right here in the system. It successfully captures one of our allied planets, and I'm sitting here feeling like I can't do anything about this, and indeed I don't think I can, because my fleet just isn't good enough. I again misjudged how powerful I need to be to really participate in the Nexarellian mechanics, because the things that spawn in Nexarellin, the fleets that spawn to participate in the war and move the territories back and forth, are pretty decent fleets. They're endgame-ish tier fleets, so you need to be pretty powerful yourself, and realistically, I think you need to have a colony system to give you the income to support a large fleet where you can constantly waste supplies and fuel all the time, like fielding a like 200 deployment points costing fleet, like something where it's going to cost you tens of thousands to use it in combat and it will cost you loads to move it around. You need something to mitigate that cost to be able to contend with the AI, which of course doesn't have to pay those costs. You are dealing with the asymmetric nature of the game. As a random side point actually, I saw somewhere on the forums, here's a pointless anecdote, the current lead developer of the game was talking about how one of the principles behind the game is that anything that applies to the player should apply to the AI as well. And I remember thinking, like, this just feels like a different game to what the developers are talking about. The AI does not play by the rules that the player does, and to me that's one of the big problems, and it's one of the things that Nexarellin goes a decent distance towards fixing. So I quite liked that now we're playing the same game. The AI actually does spend something to deploy its fleets, I believe, unlike in vanilla. Like, they're not free. It probably doesn't pay anything to upkeep them, so it's still cheating with regards to what you're supposed to be doing. But there's some system where like points are gathered in the background, like in uh, Godless Tactics, for example, but the points are just sort of arbitrarily assigned, so it's not quite a fully-fledged, like, integrated economy. They're just being generated somehow, and you can't do that, so you're still at a disadvantage, unlike in a superior strategy game like Godless Tactics. However, you can see that I am using a mod-added feature that comes towards doing what I'm saying right here. You can also use the spawn mechanics yourself, but I think only to a more limited extent. So the AI factions constantly get like these free points which they spend on deploying ships. So there's some sort of actual economy going on in the background there which I really appreciated, but you can't really see it or interact with it very much. I don't think you can like cut off the supply to a planet to stop it from spawning fleets or something like that. Maybe you actually can, but well, if you can it's not communicated to the point when I think that you can and that itself would be a problem. So what have I done just then? I've spent my special points, you also gain these fleet points in the background that charge up over time, and you can spend them, along with spending a whole bunch of your own money by the way, to deploy fleets for free. And basically this is way cheaper than deploying an equivalently powerful fleet yourself. So you're sort of tapping into the AI cheats here and using them for your own gain. 
I have tried to put together a fleet to do something about the massive enemy fleet in this territory. It will take a while to show up and generally won't really help with the current situation that we are being pushed back by the enemy and it's kind of too late. But the idea is there, I liked what I saw. Again, if I can get loads of money, I can start spawning allied fleets and tell them specifically where to go, give them orders for what to do. And I was really happy with this. I remember getting to the end of Vanilla Star Sector and there's like a late game building you can make called something like Fleet High Command. And in the tooltip, it's like from here, you will command your fleets across the sector. And I was like, whoa, you can get the ability to command fleets across the sector. And I was so let down when it doesn't do that. I can't remember what it even does now. It's just something else. It's an upgrade of some of the lesser building. And they just put some flavor text in as if that's what it does. And I was like, oh, that's not actually a mechanic. Well, that sucks. But here it is. <laughs> to some extent, it has been added in by Nexarelin. This is like the end game stuff it adds in to sort of quote unquote, finish the game as they put it. I would say you could probably still do more with this, but I'm really impressed by how much they've done with what was presumably the tools available to them. They've somehow got the game mechanics to twist into new mechanics. And I think they've gone in absolutely the right direction, or at the very least have reverted some of the courses where I thought vanilla was going in the wrong direction. I'm just overall happy with what's happening here. As for what I'm actually doing, as we saw just here, well, it's not that much, really. I started just wandering around trying to kill our other enemy, Hegemony, just because I can. This was me doing the gameplay that I was sort of wishing into existence, where I would make a decent profit just harassing the enemy, just taking out their smaller fleets for my own amusement and to feel like I'm participating in the war and maybe doing something to the economy that will have a long-term effect. I don't really know if it does, and if it does, and I don't know that it does, that is again also a problem in tandem. But we'll skip over this because it's not very important really. Later I came back to try and find that invasion force I ordered up to see what was going on. Looks like the enemy still control this planet. And it might have been, I can't remember, that there was already a ground invasion happening here or something like that. Because there had been some message on the side that this place was being invaded. There's a ground battle system that we'll look into later on. Here's the fleet I ordered, I think, that grand invasion fleet hanging around. Once the fleet has deployed a ground army, it will sort of mill about and fight enemies for a bit. And then I came back again later and the place had been captured. So something happened there. I achieved something. I put some money in and got a result. Or at least I got a result for my faction. The goal is to get your faction to win. So this is also de facto for me in the meta game. But anyway, after that, I had one other thought I wanted to try. Because in Nexarellin, some of the outer planets can start already colonized by the factions. You have this option at the beginning to pick between 0 and 50 planets to already have faction presence on them. So you could have, if you picked the larger map size, loads of planets all over the place fighting each other. I don't remember what settings I picked, but there are a few planets that are already colonized, and over time, the AI will colonize more colonizable worlds, and that's another thing you have loads of options for in the mod, for whether you want that to happen at all or how often you want it to happen. On my way to find such a place, because I thought it would be weak and easy to attack, I disturbed a pirate's nest and didn't spend the story points running away from it because I thought I can probably beat them with my powerful ship. But we had a little moment there you might have seen where I lost basically all of the hull on this ship because its shields are really small, that's part of its annoying gimmick. It's very vulnerable to just general use, like if you're in a situation where the enemy isn't directly in front of you, you get into trouble and that's what happened right there. I got hit by one of the, I forget the name of them, like Reaper missiles or something, the red ones that does a lot of damage on the hull, lost most of the hull and then died. I tried to get the fleet to fall back and we lost more of the fleet on the way and then I spent a story point to quit the engagement because we can't retreat from this situation. Which I could have done before the fight to retreat without losing my ships. I like to Iron Man these things so we're just going to go with that big loss. Completely pointless, I just misjudged how powerful my ship was. But on the left there, I did get an insurance payout. So there's the insurance system coming in. Not even a scam, a legitimate insurance payout. After that drama, I arrive at my destination. This low-level colony out in the middle of nowhere, somewhere at the bottom of the map, I think. And well, at first I have to come in with the transponder off and just pretend to be an ally to them because I need their stuff. I was wrecked after that battle, I needed more supplies. So first I go shopping. The bad news is there's not much here in terms of fleet stuff to buy. I can't like get ships back that I just lost. So I need to do what I can with the limited stuff available. And you might also see me here selling some marines because one of the things I was carrying on my way here was a whole load of ground attack forces 
because my goal was to conquer some place like this. The only thing holding me back is that I didn't really know how to do it, only that it could be done in this mod somehow, and it's something to do with this menu. You have an option to invade a planet, you say yes, and you get this quite complex invasion minigame. So this is a nice feature the mod has added. It's quite substantial, it's actual gameplay the invasion stuff, and you have to make decisions, which I quite liked. It's something where it's a bit imposing, you look at this and be like, well, what am I supposed to do? But in an incredible twist, it comes with a thing on the same screen that tells you what everything means and what you're supposed to do with it. So after learning what to do, I essentially decided not to invade this place, and we'll see plenty of invasions later on to see how this does work. I think my rationale was that I didn't want to get any retaliation from Tritachion by stealing one of their planets. In retrospect, I think it would have been fine to just take that planet and get the reward for doing so. It would have been quite useful. I may also have been thinking about going to do the colony stuff first before getting involved in the war, as I said I was going to earlier. But the fact I bought all those marines also suggests I was planning on getting involved in the war right now. But then I just backed down at the moment when I was about to do it for some reason. Well, we'll come back to it. And it does kind of matter that I didn't commit fully, because the earlier on you can give your faction an advantage, the more that advantage is going to compound. So we're going to let the Ludic Church actually fall into a state of disrepair by not really helping them, as we'll see as we go on, and we'll have to redeem ourselves later. We do get attacked by pirates again, but this time I managed to pull something off, even though my ship was half the time behind the UI. <laughs> More camera trouble is happening, but we do survive and carry on. And what I'm going to do now is skip over a whole bunch of time that was spent essentially surveying every planet. That's what I started to do next. I wanted to know where are good places to make colonies, more than just finding like one good colony, but to find a planet that's near other good planets so I can make them all together. Along the way, I found this research station with an alpha core, something that will be very useful later on once we get into the colony system. This is one of those things where I remembered finding one in my vanilla campaign and just having no idea what it was for, because I actually played pretty far into vanilla before I discovered the colony system, and then really far into the colony system before I discovered what to do with AI cores. One of those usability things that I think most players probably would never consider to be a problem. But just one of the strange things about Star Sector is it actually doesn't tell you that you can colonize planets up until you get to a certain point, because the game, I guess when it was originally developed, wasn't about that, so it doesn't contain like text referring to it or something. Anyway, doesn't matter. I end up surveying millions of planets, and we see here briefly on the map, on the right hand side, you might have seen there were loads of pins by most of the star systems. For some reason, in this spawned galaxy, there were remnant forces, forces that stop you from colonizing areas without fighting them first, basically everywhere. I'm not quite sure why, but the galaxy was very hostile, the sector was very hostile. And I struggled not only finding systems with colonizable planets in them, but just finding systems I could get into with a small fleet at all, because most of the stuff you'll fight if you go into a medium or high danger area would probably be able to take my fleet of tiny ships down, so I had to play things very carefully. I could go back to the core and get a stronger fleet to force my way into good-looking systems, and I did consider doing that for one system which had a water world in it. But I decided to just see what I could find. Here's a little clip to represent some trouble I had, because when I screen capture, you have to press F9 to start and stop the capture, which is also the quick load button, and this game doesn't have autosaves if you don't use mods. And I've got the autosave mod on, but in the way that it doesn't autosave still, maybe I'll talk about that later. So basically, at some point in my exploration of the sector, I lost loads of progress due to like playing for an hour, and then going to turn the screen capture off and just loading back to the start of that hour. So that was good, and that also happened to me the first time I played the game as well, I seem to recall. Aside from that, the exploration goes fine, because as mentioned earlier, we could just avoid combat whenever we need to and be fine. Although I did seek out the battles you have against the remnant forces, the not the remnant forces, the other AI forces, I forget what they're called. There's like the domain AI forces and the AI war AI forces in the lore. There's two AI factions, one of them's much weaker, this is the weaker one. They're often guarding things like probes or random things you can talk to in space. And killing them is fun because they don't have any shields, this was a point I used to make where because the game has this very back and forth rhythm to combat where everybody's flying backwards quite quickly all the time, 
when you fight something that doesn't have any shields, you get this more like impactful or even rewarding nature to combat, where if you hit the enemy, it really counts. Like you've progressed towards winning the battle by hitting them at all because you're hitting their armor instead of their shields, something they can't just get back. And shields regenerate extremely quickly in this game, like relative to other games that have shields in them, I suppose. So if you take hits on the shields, you fly backwards and press a button and your shield comes back. And the AI is pretty decent about doing that against you. And in contrast to that, whenever you fight whatever this sub-faction is called, the quote-unquote automated defenses faction that's different to the AI faction, they just explode when you shoot at them. And what are we here for? Explosions. So you know I'm going to like that sort of combat. And outside of the combat, we're doing the thing, the eight-step program to pick stuff up every time you secure a probe and that sort of stuff. It's only like six steps to... <laughs> survey a planet and that feels a bit more worthwhile i'm happier with the surveying planet ux at least that's something and as we see in the bottom left i'm also getting paid to do this by the luddick church because of the whole faction commission system having this monthly stipend you get which you get regardless of what you're doing which is extremely exploitable but less so in vanilla i'm actually going to try and do some exploits along those lines later because of the nature of this mod it's way less effective to do that, unless you really set the settings to be more like vanilla, so that basically there's no time limit or any time-based mechanics at all, so that doing something where you just exploit something that gives you money over time is viable. So in this mod, I'm going to try and do that. I wanted to see how effective it was later on when I needed some money and didn't feel like actually doing anything to get it. So we'll try it, but it's not quite as effective. But yes, theoretically at this stage, instead of surveying planets, I could do nothing, make loads of cash, and then make a big fleet that would overcome my issues with those remnant forces out there. But I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to play the game and give you some gameplay commentary, which, as you can probably tell already just from watching this video, is a surprisingly difficult thing to come by here on this game commentary channel. <laughs> the finest one you'll ever find. I ended up starting a colony on this planet that you saw me looking at in the previous clip. A planet where it's not really that good, but it has some industry potential. And I was really thinking, I just have to start any colony somewhere. Like, the earlier you start a colony in the game, the better, because they're like a time mechanic. You get stronger and stronger the longer you have a colony system. So I just wanted to get one down as soon as I could. Therefore, we have Absolute Nightmare here. And again, once you have a colony, everything else about the game gets better, I think, because all of this stuff here ties into everything else really well, to the point where not having this makes everything else just seem a little bit like... Well, it's missing something because it doesn't have the purpose, like the AI core system I'm using here, for example, actually doesn't have a purpose if you don't have a colony system. So it's less rewarding to ever find those things. Well, there's an argument to be had here that maybe you should start with some kind of really weak or tiny colony just to get things going and give the game sort of a feedback system, a reward system for everything that is to do with colonies, which does like apply to the player from the beginning even if you don't have a colony you'll be finding colony stuff from the beginning and you could be going out to do colony stuff from the beginning which could be fun we also have that alpha core as i mentioned earlier so we can use that to govern the colony giving it some better stats the core is better than human governors so that will do its thing in the background i remember it took me a really long time to work out you could do that when i first played through the game this time i won't complain about it because i don't remember how difficult it was i'll just throw that complaint out there for the record here's a nice feature in the bar on our planet you can actually take a tutorial quest for the ground battle system added by nexorellin because at this stage I had decided I knew how it worked, I didn't take this, but that's another step in the right direction. This is a game that I've often thought there could be one or two quests that focus on various mechanics of the game that are more like story quests than the randomly generated quests. So instead of getting your randomly generated Surveyor Planet quest, early on like a character might go with you and talk about the surveying process and give it some context in the lore in the world, like why you're doing this specifically, and do things like explain you can upgrade your ships to be survey ships and things like that, the stuff I didn't know when I was trying to be a survey fleet when I first played the game. And you could do something similar with like a raid on a planet, a bounty hunting mission, things like that just to fit it both into the world and into a new player's game experience of getting to know the game in a more fun and less to sort of try it for yourself and maybe fail and maybe even never work out how to do it sort of way, which is how it works now. Some people prefer it to be like that. They will scream hand-holding if the mechanic is introduced sort of through the game itself. I think in this game it would be easy enough 
to put that in there but also have it be optional so everybody can win in the end. Well, one thing I do like about the game is the entire colony system's general design. I think they've done it really well. It's very optimized in a UX sort of way, like a lot of stuff that could be busy work is done for you in the colony system, like all of the economic distribution happens automatically and it just does the best possible strategy itself, you don't have any input. And I think that's the way to go. It leaves you to be thinking about more interesting things, which to me is the exploration, which is where you get the stuff that allows you to do more interesting things with your colonies. And there's this general feel, like the UI is more beautiful and easier to use and has fewer clicks for everything. I'm guessing it was made literally just at a different time to the rest of the game, because the game was made over such a long period of time. Or maybe it was even made by different people, I don't know. I just really like the colony system, I think it should be the core of the game and the game might want to focus more on that, because everything else is made better by its presence. So what I need to do now is basically get more colonies, so I'm planning here my route for where I'm going to go. I've explored a decent amount of the map already. One thing to note is that I've picked the small map size thinking I'll have a shorter campaign than normal. But interestingly what that does is mean there are fewer stars. The map is actually the same size on the small map size, so it's a little bit confusing there. Looks like I just changed my course at the last second, specifically to avoid going through a slipstream, so I took a longer route just because I can't be bothered to press 4 to go through the slipstream, which is how you do it, another one of those things that turns out to be easy, so you'll probably have a little bit of frustration with them at first, and then later they just become a non-issue. And I don't know, there's some sort of game design question you could raise there about them needing to do more in the game, or needing to not be there at all, that sort of situation. After setting out, I immediately came back. I think I might have forgotten something and I was going back to my planet, but along the way, there are some pirates already for me to fight, and this is the thing, the big downside to the colony system that holds back me from saying that the game overall is really good, because the best thing about it is mired by this one treatment of it by the game, where once you have colonies, the extent to which the AI starts cheating against you ramps up dramatically and it has to do that because colonies are really powerful in the game's meta and internal number wars. So once you have them, the game will start going out of its way to really screw you over for having them. And you get into frustrating potentially situations where because things like this enemy fleet will just appear, they just spawn, they don't like come for you from anywhere, they're just here fighting your ships. And this causes all kinds of problems you get kind of stuck, that's the way I put it before, like every time you try to leave, you have to come back to do something if you want to keep everything fine in your colonies. And that in itself isn't necessarily an issue, but the game would need to provide a permanent way to deal with it, so something to work towards to overcome that issue. To some extent, some things like that do exist, and we'll explore that a bit later on, as we encounter an intensification of this mechanic, which I really didn't appreciate, which is added in by a recent patch. We'll see what I mean later. What I want to see, the sort of big solution I'd like to see to this general vibe of the game, is that it needs to be more like Mountain Blade. Yes, I've complained in the past about the game being too much like Mountain Blade, and suffering, I guess, from how much it lifted from the old Mountain Blade warband into the structure of this game. But I'm thinking now, Something like Bannerlord being taken from would be a good idea, where in Bannerlord, the enemy armies are, for the most part, almost like player characters like you. They have budgets, they have to find the resources that they're bringing to use against you. There's less spawning, basically. It still has spawning in that game, of course, but just to a lesser extent. And I want to see that spirit kind of brought over into Star Sector. Not that I at all expect them to do this, because this would be extremely difficult to pull off. But in a sort of hypothetical just looking at game design world, if the pirates had like a set of six pirate lords or something who had to actually go and find the ships that they're bringing against you and they had budgets and supply bases and you could do something with that, that gives you some mechanics to leverage against them and get the opportunity to not have to face down the pirates if you do something like in the game with your own intelligence, your own strategy to deal with that problem. There's more potential for fun there, and less potential for it just feeling like the AI is cheating. Or to speak more literally, to just have the AI not be cheating. <laughs> that would be nicer. So, essentially our colonies will just have relatively substantial fleets appear out of nowhere to fight them. And there's no, like, place where these 
ships are being built that you can go and take out. Although there are pirate bases that spawn which you can take out to make the pirates spawn less, but the bases themselves also spawn and respawn. So that's that's just the same problem again, but bigger basically. So I end up dealing with it for a while in the early game or the early colonial game, but then I stopped. Here's another thing I need to deal with. We're getting a remnant raid, so on top of the pirates attacking you, the factions can attack you now that you have colonies. And in Nexarellion, that's a bigger risk than before. Not only because the other factions are much more aggressive about attacking colonies and can permanently take them, but they also add the remnants as a sort of active faction. So in vanilla, the remnant AI was just an obstacle to get into certain systems so that you can't explore everything early on. You can see what they were doing with that. But in Nexarellion, they take a more active role. I think this is optional. I think you can turn it off. I can't quite remember now. But they will also attack colonies that are vaguely near them. So we're being attacked by the remnants. It tells you it's going to happen in advance. And this is the thing where normally you'll get quite a few different cycles where something is coming to attack your colony. And you feel like you're constantly getting notifications that you need to go back to your colony because something bad's about to happen. And this can interfere with the exploration, which as I said is my favourite part of the game. And so, because it's interfering with that, this quickly became my least favourite part of the game in that it was the most frustrating. So I went back to Absolute Nightmare, my old colony, to try and save it from the remnants. When I'm there, well, the pirates are already here, of course, so I might as well kill them. If you don't kill them, they will just attack the transport ships that are moving supplies around between the various colonies, and you get all kinds of debuffs that I won't go into, but they're a problem. There's some stuff you can do about it. You can make, like, fleet patrol bases that may be able to fend off the pirates. In my experience, they don't in practice, or they sometimes don't, and as long as they sometimes don't, you still get the debuff. It needs to always work, or it's not worth spending the money trying to stop them, that sort of thing. And I almost think my overall colonial strategy has just become at this stage, try to make colonies that can vaguely work even when they're maximally debuffed by pirates having attacked them and cut off their supply lines. So just like minimize the amount of stuff they need, have them be as near to colonies as possible so they get really high accessibility bonuses so that all the debuffs you get from being surrounded by pirates all the time doesn't cause too much trouble. And one thing about Nexarellin is it makes that process easier because the various factions are colonizing planets alongside you your colonies are much more likely to be near to somebody else's colonies, so you're more likely to get the proximity to markets bonus thing to your accessibility score, and that score I'm referring to is something that basically determines how good your colony is going to be, how much it can grow, how much money it can make. It's just a number you need to get as high as possible for the colony to be useful to you. So it's going to be easier because our allies might colonize other systems near us, but also our enemies might colonize near us, and then you get the hostility to nearby factions debuff. So I don't know overall if it makes it easier, but it felt to me like it did. Like you're probably not at war with most of the factions most of the time, so you're usually benefiting from other people colonizing the areas around you. Other than that, it means you can't colonize the planets they're colonizing, but the AI is more sort of liberal about where it's going to colonize. It colonizes places that theoretically could be colonized, but from the player's perspective they would never want to because the hazard rating is too high or the, the nightmare level on a planet is so high that even someone as desperate as me to make any nightmare colony probably wouldn't bother to do it. But Tritachion will go and do it for you and then maybe you can trade with them so it works out in the end. While I was waiting for the remnants to show up, I can use a feature that I think I only used on this occasion actually, so I haven't really explored this, but you can mine all of the planets from space, and I think you can even mine planets that are colonized by other factions and they won't like you for doing this, but this gives you a way to get some resources by spending time on the map, and because in Nexarellin that actually matters, there are more time-based mechanics, there's an actual trade-off happening here. So I liked what I was seeing here. This is exactly how the salvage system should work if they want to keep the double salvage thing going, where the salvaging process overflows to a second or third salvage. If that took time, this would justify like there being some sort of risk, like you might be attacked while you're doing the second salvage, and that's why it needs to be a separate thing, that sort of thing. It actually is like that. that that's how it's supposed to be. It's just in practice that never happens. I've seen it happen once over the course of two and a half campaigns in Star Sector, where if you're under attack from something, you can't do the double salvage. It doesn't let you do the second round. It's just so incredibly rare. And all the other times, which is virtually all of the times you will salvage anything, you just have to salvage twice and very rarely three times to get everything that was dropped for some reason. So, well, there is a reason. It's the one I just said, but it's not a good reason. I reject your reason. 
as you can see, my big plan to defend against the remnants just went out the window because I saw the remnant fleet and I just fled. Like after waiting for them to show up, I just left when they showed up. I think it's because when, once I saw what they had, I thought I can't beat them. I'll just let them raid my system. This is similar to something I was ranting about in Total War Pharaoh recently, where it's kind of okay to let enemies raid you because the opportunity cost of stopping them is too high. I can make money right now by just going and doing some expeditions and progressing the game, looking for better colony sites. It's not worth my time and the resources I have to spend to stop the remnants from raiding me. So I'll just take the debuff and that's going to be my general strategy. I think I said that earlier. Where just letting yourself get raided is better economically than you would think it is and well, on a meta level, it's just easier in the game. Like, it's too annoying to deal with the raids, and in that case, perhaps too difficult. I don't know on what basis I was making the judgement. I barely remember what the fleet was. I decided I couldn't fight it, and instead, I'm out here fighting some of the easier AI stuff. This was a nice battle where there was just loads of general action. As I said, I like fighting this AI faction because they explode a lot, but I decided to put this in the video of all of the random fights that happened around this time. Because of this little moment in the end, you can see that I don't click on anything after the battle ends, and I feel like I probably wasn't at the keyboard. This is evidence that I was just letting the battle play out, and I was just watching it, and I sort of le leant back on my chair. It might have been on my phone or something, and then eventually I was like, okay, I'll click the button. Which brings up another point. Look how many times I have to click continue or yes or go and do it in order to get all of the salvage from this battle. We have three rounds of salvage and multiple menus in between them. And all of the menus, I think, are either a menu where there's only one option, so it doesn't need to be a menu. It might as well just presume you selected that option. It's like that because it's trying to be a text adventure, trying to be old fashioned in that way, but it's a waste. Or it was an option where it was like, do you want to do the thing or just do nothing? Where doing nothing is the wrong choice. Like you should presume the player does not want to do nothing. So again, that's the sort of UX situation where I went through three menu systems and a bunch of dialogue trees to do something that could have been done in zero to one clicks in an ideal world. After that expedition, I've got some cash again and ended up back in the Ludic Church's core because I need to pick up some ships. I think I was picking up all the ships that I'd left behind in the Ludic core on previous like journeys through the area because I want to take them over to my new colony system. On the way, I got into this sticky situation where I was stopping off at a system to do a mission and, well, there's a neutron star here. I think several times over the course of the campaign, I kept forgetting there's this one really convenient stopover between the core and my colonies that I'll eventually be setting up, we'll see them in a second, that has this neutron star in it. And I kept stopping there for various reasons and then remembering there's a neutron star and getting annihilated by it. So that was good. But essentially, I need to move on towards the top right of the map. That's where I've set up my new colony system. You might have seen me doing it over some of the previous clips I was ranting over, where I've set up three colonies, I think, in this one system. There was a, a system with loads of habitable planets on it, so that was great. None of them are particularly good, but it's better than that nightmare planet from earlier. So we've got something going over here. I think I went over my colony administration limit to do this, so we're taking a stability hit. However, in Nexarellin, that's less of a big deal because the game does provide, or the mod provides, ways to earn new administrator slots, which is absolutely essential. I love that kind of spirit. It's just so, like, antithetical to the game's original spirit, where the limitation was there to stop the colony system being overpowered. You weren't allowed to have many colonies, or at least not allowed to have them very quickly. To me, they should have made starting colonies harder because the initial investment is really cheap for how good colonies are and how much money you make off them. And I think the at least old school vanilla way of dealing with that problem where you could theoretically make loads of colonies and just be really powerful early on was to put hard limits on things. Just say that you can't, like for a balancing purposes. Just say the game is you can only have three colonies. Now, theoretically, quote unquote, you can have infinite colonies. At least people have said you could have infinite colonies in vanilla if you could find an infinite supply of alpha AI cores. I think they're sort of being a little bit naive. I don't know if it's me or them. Can you get infinite AI cores in this game? I've never found a way to farm them. I've only ever found like four or five over the course of a couple of campaigns. And that was like exploring the entire map. And then there was no more to find. 
So I don't think it's true that you actually can have infinite colonies. But in Nexorelin, you can level up your colonies and earn more administrator slots, which is, again, an absolutely ideal way of dealing with that balancing problem, because you can only have a couple of colonies at first, but if you level them up, you'll be able to have more colonies. So you're sort of rewarded for doing something. It's removing a limitation in response to your success. That's more like it. If you're going to have a limitation, you have to have mechanics that are about removing the limitation. If that limitation is at all stopping the player doing something that might be fun, which in this case it is, it's a real like low-hanging fruit that I think Star Sector leaves unpicked. If you could upgrade the fleet limit for how many ships you can have, if you could upgrade the administrator limit, which you can in Nexorellin, if just like all of the things where there's a hard cap or an arbitrary cap on something that's just put, been put there for balancing purposes, if you could upgrade it, it would feel less bad that it's arbitrarily capped. Let's leave that aside for now. What's happening in my campaign is that I realized I'm not going to be able to help the Luddic Church with their problems right now. They're being attacked by the Sindarian Diktat with an absolutely massive fleet. I decided I would dive into this after saving first in case it went really badly, which of course it is going to go. But because of the deployment limits, we're going to gain something of an advantage early on. The enemy won't be able to use their six battleships or whatever it was they had. They're really powerful fleet elements. And it seems they chose to hold them all back and send in the weak elements first, which will take up all of their deployment points and stop them deploying the strong elements. Now, it doesn't quite work like that in this game. Like, if they just deployed their battleships, they might be a bit weak in that we could surround them a bit easier or something like that. Well, it tends to depend on various things that are hard to get a handle on. In this case, because they deployed ships that we can kill, that we can like overwhelm individually, we're able to score loads of kills against this enemy fleet, but what we're not doing is taking out the big capital ships, and there's one or two of them somewhere that are gradually going to town on our allies and killing them off. I think I did actually have a mod installed that increased the battle size by increasing the base deployment points you get for both the player and the AI. I think it was by 50% if I recall. But I also think I didn't have it activated for a lot of the campaign because you have to install a mod and then activate it separately to make it actually apply to a certain save. And in this case, that probably helped me out. I probably would have faced more enemies if that mod had been working. There are various mods to make battles bigger. The big thing you can't get in Star Sector, which I guess is disappointing, is just mods that affect battles broadly. Battles and how they work and the mechanics of battles are much more hard-coded, apparently, than everything else. There's only one mod that changes how battle works, and it does it in such a way that it's incompatible with everything else. To me, that's a shame, because I would absolutely love to see Star Sector, but with the way ships move change. So making flying backwards have some sort of penalty versus flying forwards, for example. Or even better, making flying forwards faster rather than flying backwards slower to make things a bit faster overall. There's something in the game where if you fly with your shields down without firing your weapons, you get this speed boost. But the momentum you get from your speed boost doesn't carry on if you enter combat. And that's one like huge thing, or tiny thing I should say, that would make a huge difference where it changed. If your momentum from your speed boost just carried into combat, so as you went into combat and turned your shields on, your speed starts going down to your real max speed from the boosted speed, but you keep that momentum and you keep flying forwards at a fast speed. There would be so many cool maneuvers you could do with that, and I kept wishing I could do it. You can do that basically in Avorian, which I was playing recently, which has similar inertial physics, but are just a bit better in my opinion. And that's one thing you can do in Avorian, for example, that is better, which I think would work really well in Star Sector and remove the really floaty and sort of weird to me nature of combat and its controls. But as I think I mentioned earlier, this is all deliberate. It's supposed to be like this for gameplay challenge purposes rather than sort of fun purposes. Well, as always, it would be nice if the player got to make that decision, I think, because it's something so core to the game. Something so close to many players' hearts, I suspect, like how they fly their ships and how the ships control. If they had more control over how the game works in that regard, it might be better. And there are various arguments you could make about immersion. Basically, I'm like a physics loser, so when I see the designs of these ships and they don't pilot like their designs, like the engines don't work in a physics-y sort of way, there's no propellant system, and the inertial physics isn't enough, like it's not complete inertial physics, it's a start. I always think you go fully in one direction or the other, basically. I get mad at things like that, that I'm just mad about privately in my own head. There's no real like game design, like this is objectively bad argument you can make. All I can say about those sorts of things is, well, I don't like them, and it would have been nicer if we had the option to change it. 
but I wouldn't expect the option to be there. Again, I'm just throwing out wish list items. I would never expect them to have actually done that. Well, as for the battle we're fighting right here, our allies get really heavily owned. I decided to fight on myself. I was kind of thinking maybe we can somehow take out more and more of the enemy fleet without having to engage their big battleships. You can theoretically do that, and you saw, you saw me there giving an avoid order. So this tells your AI to try and stay away from certain ships. It's going to be difficult for us to do because of the lack of maneuverability we're going to have. We can't sort of drift around to the other side or attack from another direction easily because they're going to be moving at a similar speed to us. And this plan isn't going to work, essentially. You can see my ship here boosting in, trying to attack the enemy on the right. But because we're on the left, I have to go into the line of fire of the enemy's battleship to do this. And it's hard for me to just take my formation and sort of rotate it around the enemy's formation. You can do it with one ship. Doing it with a formation is harder. You can do a combination of escort orders to sort of do it. And that's kind of what we're managing to achieve here by, to some extent, luck. Like we're sort of relying on the AI to make certain decisions in response to our orders. And of course, the big thing about the whole like playing Star Sector as if it was a strategy game is that you are limited in how many orders you can give, both in terms of like what the orders do. Like you can only give vague orders, and there's a hard limit to how many orders you are allowed to give. So once you've given four orders, that's sort of it. That's like your battle plan. You have to wait and see what happens, which is one way of doing things. But it just really invites the suggestion that if it wasn't like that, there'd be more for the player to do. Again, it's because you're not supposed to play like I'm playing right here. Like I'm not controlling a ship. I'm switching back and forth between the strategy mode and the ship view. I'm just using the ship view to see what's happening and get more data. I'm playing this more akin to something like Homeworld. We are switching between two views and you're not actually controlling anything directly on the map. You're just looking at the fight so you can see what happens and using that to inform your decisions. And then on this screen, I'm making those decisions. The decision we need to make here is to get out of here because we're in a really bad situation. We sort of fought our way around the enemy's front line, but the enemy have a battleship back there. So now there's a battleship both in front of us and behind us, making it extra hard for us to escape. We've really done it here, and well, I hope our allies appreciate me doing weird stuff like this, because it doesn't really pay off for me to help our allies. It's again, probably cheaper to let the enemy just do their thing, let them take a planet, and then pay for a fleet to come and retake it. That might be cheaper than the value of all the ships and supplies we're losing here, trying to hold them off. And it's this asymmetric thing again, because the AI doesn't pay for ship repairs and doesn't pay for supplies and things, it's fine for them to participate in that kind of gameplay. But for the player, not really. And I think the only reason people would think that you should participate in that sort of gameplay is because the numbers that tell you you shouldn't aren't readily available. It's hard to tell how much money you lose fighting in an engagement. Or how much you gain by fighting versus how much you could have gained if you did something else instead of fighting. This is again the opportunity cost brain worms back at it again. Star Sector really opens up those cans of brain worms by being a really asymmetric game where like in Total War Pharaoh that I was complaining about recently or just sort of commenting on recently rather than a complaint. There are so many scenarios when if you really think about it, playing the game isn't very economical for you. And there's like other counterintuitive routes that involve like just sacrificing things and not paying any attention to things that give you more money in the long run because the cost of having to deal with problems is higher or the benefit is lower than just ignoring it and plowing on with something more important you could be doing. So for example, right here, I'm wasting my life trying to fight off this diktat invasion of my allies. As long as my allied faction isn't completely destroyed, it's okay. I just need to keep them vaguely alive. What I should be doing is making more colonies. I need to find administrators or just level up my character or something to become more powerful so that I can deal with this later. I need to be able to show up with six battleships on my side to really deal with this in a long-term sort of way. However, there is one aspect to playing a video game that I have skipped over in my analysis right here, and that aspect is having fun. And that was essentially what was happening with that battle. I just wanted to dive into it to see what would happen and to get to be in a big battle. And obviously, because I saved right before, looks like it actually didn't happen. The opportunity cost has not been incurred. We are saved. So basically, as yes, I did that, had a bit of fun. I probably would have kept going if it hadn't gone too badly, but because it did, I just 
said it didn't happen, so we are not Iron Manning this campaign, at least anymore. I didn't really intend to Iron Man this campaign because I kind of just wanted to explore everything, and I guess I just wanted to have fun even when it's a bad gameplay decision, and I guess allowing myself to save scum there achieves that, so don't be too harsh on me for not Iron Manning it. I would actually have used that save scumming to my advantage if I could, in that like, I would have kept playing if it had gone well and because it didn't I went back, so I am using this to my advantage in the game. I am quote unquote cheating. I'm doing something the AI itself is not allowed to do I guess, so finally the player has something going for them. Oh well. Let's go back to the game, which is going to be the part I'm going to cut out some more of. We need to find more stuff and we need to get stronger. So we'll do the stuff that I like privately in the background and come back to what I was looking forward to, the war, a bit later because it seems we're still not quite ready for the scale and the endgame-ness of Nexarellin's wars. Something that will help me out with my exploration campaigns will be the gate system. In Nexarellin, you can choose to have the gate system be active from the beginning. Normally, you'd have to do a quest line to be able to use the fast travel gates that teleport you across the sector to certain locations. And that's the reward you get, I think, for completing that quest line I was talking about, where I just sort of lost interest in doing the quest line and presumed it wasn't going anywhere, and so we didn't do it. I think in vanilla, if you do complete the academy quest line, it unlocks this teleport ability. Well, it's not actually teleport, you still have to pay for the journey, you just don't have to actually do it, so that's useful. It's basically fast travel. So that's good. We teleport from one side of the map to the other because one of the gates is right next to where I've set up my colonies, so that's handy. We get home and as usual, the place is under siege by pirates who would have been just killing all of the transport ships and meaning my colony has tons of debuffs. But oh well, I've actually built a space station here and that gets involved in this battle with them so we can easily water resolve and kill most of them, that's handy. Next up I'm back in the core because I was looking to use a nice feature the mod adds somewhere in the core. On the way, I get attacked by this gigantic special task group or something. I had the easy chance to escape from these guys, but I kind of like wasn't quick enough about running away from them as I teleported into this system. So I end up getting locked into battle with this powerful looking enemy fleet that was hunting me down in this area. I don't know what the special task groups do. There's something the mod adds, like special armies under each faction. I'm guessing they hunt down powerful enemies or something, who knows how the AI for them works. This one was following me around in the core, but I eventually spent a story point to make them forget about me and carried on my way. Where am I going? To the Prism Free Station. This is a new, like, capital of the independence faction the mod adds, which allows you to do various useful things, including trade in the duplicate techs you tend to find for points and spend the points on other techs essentially to unlock various ship mods and various buildable ships, you find technologies throughout the star sector. Broadly speaking, in my own personal opinion, this doesn't matter very much. I find you can get away without really using any of the techs and stuff, or well, most of them anyway. And a lot of the ships you can build, you probably won't want to build them, so it doesn't matter if you unlock them or not. So it might even be better to not bother handing in just your duplicate techs, but all your techs to the Prism Free Station, because that allows you to unlock good techs, like Battleship and Endgame tier techs, which you might actually want to use. The other thing this place does is it sells good weapons. I mentioned earlier there was a way for me to find out what quote-unquote good weapons are, sort of contrary to the advice I'd received that there aren't really good weapons, they're all just useful for different things. Well, here I could finally look at some tooltips, again using mods to expand the tooltips to have more info on them. And because this was like an expensive high-end weapon store here, I could know that these ones were supposed to be good and start getting some sort of handle on like how the weapon system works a bit more than before. We can also do a refit here to presumably upgrade my ships, but again I'm not checking what specifically it's doing, I'm really looking for like a just give it better gear button. People told me you simply can't do this in this game. I think you kind of can sometimes, like refitting at a place that has good weapons will just make your ship better even if you don't look at it that much. At the very least it'll make it more expensive and well it's good to flash your cash. So we theoretically make a better fleet here. We need bigger ships to really support the big endgame weapons that this place sells but it's good to know about. We'll go back there later to sort some more stuff out and I just found that to be a very useful addition to the game. I especially liked the high-end weapon shop because you can't unlock the ability to get the kinds of weapons that the AI can get normally. You have to find them or find the blueprints for them and then manufacture them yourself through your colony system. 
being able to buy at least a small amount of endgame equipment, not that we really did that because we didn't have the ships to mount them on, but the idea was there. I think that's a good addition. I think it's debatable though, you could argue that you shouldn't reward the player with endgame equipment at any time unless they've done something specific. It shouldn't just be for sale because it's too special in the the law or something like nobody would be selling endgame equipment, only the high-end militaries would have access to it. Something like that you could argue. But I'm fine to not argue that, even though I'll accept that argument if you like. Anyway, I'm back at home, again fighting pirates. I had my space station helping me out this time, but it got blown up. The good news is that the space stations rebuild for free, and you don't have to click anything. It's one of these things where I start thinking like a handwriting analysis person, I don't know the word for it, but like, you know that thing in like CSI stuff, where somebody looks at handwriting and goes, ah, this was written by this person. When I see like space stations can be rebuilt for free and you don't have to interact with it to do it, it just presumes you want to do it and does it for you. This is like the opposite spirit, as I keep saying, to the way the game is made otherwise. And because it's part of the colony system, it reinforces this sort of private conspiracy theory I have that the colony system was made either by a different person or by someone like at a different time in their life since the game was developed over such a long time. And it's just made with different considerations for player experience and better ones, in my opinion. Looks like it's time to use a mod feature again. I think my planet out in the middle of nowhere, that absolute nightmare colony I set up as my first colony, is under attack. I don't want to actually defend it from whatever it is, but I can pay money to send somebody else to deal with it. So we're really benefiting from this. It would be annoying for me to have to deal with this personally. <laughs> Looks like it's going to get bombed by Tritachion, as it says here. I think there might have been like multiple problems that kept affecting that one colony out in the middle of nowhere. I didn't care about it that much. And we'll see that eventually does come back to bite me. In the meantime, We've got some business to attend to. You can see I'm flying about with this tiny fleet of like one or two ships. Because it's time for me to find administrators. I remember doing this when I first played through. I had to do it a couple of times. The administrator checking run. Where you search the galaxy for somebody to run your colonies for you. The colony limit is, I think it's five in the default setup. Once you get to three, you start having having debuffs unless you bring in the administrators. And if you bring in three administrators, that brings the limit up to five. And the reason only three are available is because there's another limit on administrators. That's one of these classic cases where because it comes with a cost getting administrators, it doesn't need to be hard capped. It's like that to stop you exploiting how overpowered the colony system is. And again, we need that to be taken from a different angle. We need the colony system to be made different rather than to just have some limits put on it so you can't use it as much, that sort of stuff. Because I like using it, all of the things in the game that try to stop you using it because it's overpowered, I presume anyway, that's why it's so limited, are just annoying to me. Like, I want the colony system to be brought further to the front of the game and for the limits to come from something else. For example, the other things that are already in the game, like the administrators costing money and actually being kind of hard to come by as well. It's like, would it be faster to try and find an alpha AI core than find an administrator? Well, it depends on your luck, essentially. We got pretty bad luck with this run. I've had a run before where I found an administrator, like in the first place I checked. Here, I went from east to west of the sector and got all the way to the Ludic Path area, the Ludic Church area, which is towards the west end of the core, before finally finding somebody available for hire. So we take the guy on. There are two kinds of administrators you can get to run your colonies, a bad one and a good one. Which one do you want? That's right, the bad one, <laughs> just to be confusing, because the good one gives you one extra production point for every industry in your colony. What that actually means in practice is hard to say because the colony system is kind of simplified. You don't necessarily like have a quick handle on what it means to produce one more machinery at your colonies. But what it actually means is money like you make a certain amount of money from that extra production if your colony has the access score to sell it to somebody so the question is you look at how much it costs you to have a good administrator which i think is 20,000 credits per month and you say will my planet actually make that amount more and then some more profit on top if i add this good governor and generally the answer is going to be no until the late game, when you have big planets that let you put lots of buildings on them, there's a restriction, if you didn't know, on how many buildings you can make on a planet. The planets are very small, I guess. It's kind of like in-universe, supposed to be like a category of buildings. So you make a mine on your planet, and this sort of makes it a mining planet. So it might imply you've built one mine. I think the economics of the game does imply that, and the planet's just very small, but well, whatever. It's because 
the cities are just supposed to be like towns in Mountain Blade or Sid Meier's Pirates or something. Like in the old-fashioned games, this is sort of modelled on. And that doesn't translate into space very well. It's pretty normal for sci-fi games to do stuff like that, and just sci-fi in general. Like, you watch a Star Wars film, they go to the X planet. There's no such thing, guys, as an X planet. Planets are pretty big, let me tell you about that. Well, it doesn't matter. One day we'll have a realistic sci-fi game where once you get a planet, it allows you to build 15 billion building slots. And uh, good luck making the UI for that, I'm sure it can be done. A fun game design challenge for sure. Well, I'm dreaming once again. The point is, I got an administrator, so I can now make one more colony without being debuffed, and I'll need to get a couple more to get up to the cap where I'll be able to have six colonies if I don't find any more AI cores. But as I mentioned earlier, you can also level up that cap in Nexarellin, which is very much appreciated. That's the way to do it, and again, that's the way it should have been done, it's the way it should be done in vanilla, if they were willing to start implementing mod features as part of the core game. And I think they should be, I suspect they aren't though. I think I'm spoiled recently because I've been playing Project Zomboid, which is a game where I think they have bought out modders and brought in mod features and put them in the base game. And the game's better as a result, and I just think this should be done more often. I want to see more collaboration in the game development world between the official studios and the modders who are putting effort into their products for them. Anyway, what I did next was start colonizing another system. There's this other system that's actually right next to the system I colonized before. I ended up getting pretty lucky with all this, where there's another system next door that also has multiple habitable planets in it. So, we can set up a nice empire in the corner of the map, in the upper right corner. To do that, I had to first go and grab some administrators, which I've already done mercifully. We did end up with one of the expensive ones, which isn't going to be too useful to us right here, but I got bored of looking for cheap ones, so that's the end of that, really. So we set up the first colony. There's another habitable world we're going past on the way out. Also on the way out, I wanted to note how quickly this place gets attacked by pirates. We set up the colony three seconds ago, and the pirates have already spawned just outside the door and were coming in. Luckily, I have enough supplies and enough income in general that I can just sort of throw larger ships at pirate fleets at this stage and not have to worry too much about them. You can see my generic just catch-all battle strategy. Just have a bunch of cruisers escorting the battle cruiser and leave the battle cruiser to do all of the work for me. And you can see it jumping about because this cruiser has the ability to jump forward suddenly with that weird explosion thing you see now and again. And with a max level pilot inside, it's just doing the business on its own, and I don't have to do anything. And of course, because we're using double battle speed, this is much less tedious than it would be in the base game, and feels less repetitive. So even though it still is repetitive, we're still fighting the same pirate spawn over and over again. It just comes back every time you kill it. It's a bit faster to do so. Here I am coming back into the system after going out and finding the supplies I needed to make a new colony, fighting them again. And really, I'm just cutting out all of these battles. These battles happen constantly, and I'm being a bit merciful here in that I'm skipping over them and not criticizing the game too much for the fact this keeps happening, because it's less bad in the modded version than it is in vanilla, or at least I didn't mind it as much anymore. So we get through that. I'm making this new terrible planet here in the new system. This planet isn't habitable, but it does have some good stuff on it, so I want to get some mining going. Going to be another system that basically drains our cash for a long time because we're going to have to hazard pay these planets to make them grow at all. You don't necessarily have to make your planets grow, but in the long term, you want your colonies to get bigger, and that usually means tricking people into living there using cash. So the economics will be a bit hairy as we go forward. But more importantly, I finally realized that something bad was happening to my overall colony system. I noted in a tooltip somewhere, I was getting all these debuffs, and it said it was from hostile activity. And I eventually cottoned onto the fact, this is like an actual mechanic. It's different to actual hostile activity. So you get debuffed by pirates attacking stuff near your systems. But then there's this more abstract hostile activity system where other stuff is interfering with your colony system. It's been taking effect for a while, but I didn't realize it was anything. You get this notification sometimes on the left saying hostile activity plus five or something. And if you click on it, it brings you to this sort of semi-secret menu where you can find out what it's talking about. And there are plenty of debuffs to the colony system coming through this menu. So we're still on that theme of the game adding stuff to try and make the colony system less powerful. 
and this is a big one, and I hated this, and this is the thing that the recent patch added, and I just, once I realised that, I was kind of mad. I want to vent about that, but just first, here's something weird that happened. I completed the game, or to put it another way, I lost the game, because the Persian League completes the victory conditions. I didn't actually realise there were victory conditions, but Nexarellin does add an actual end game, like the game ends, literally. Although I still don't actually know what causes this to happen. I don't know what you're supposed to do. It probably says somewhere in the mod settings or something what the objective of the game is. But whatever it was, the Persian League did it, and I guess it's something to do with conquering a lot of systems. So because of that, we've technically lost. And you might note, I still haven't really participated in the mod content at all. Because it was just happening in the background while I was quite slowly making my colony system and just exploring every system on the map. We lost while I wasn't really paying attention. What you can do is just keep going. There's a button somewhere that says something like cancel victory, where the game sort of restarts based on the current situation. And if nobody has the victory conditions, then somebody else is then able to get them. What that means is, if I actually get into the game properly, or the Nexarellin part of the game properly, and beat the Persian League back to the point when they don't have their victory conditions satisfied, they can be reversed, and then I can still technically win the campaign from there. So we are back at it again with the shenanigans. I'll just say I reject your victory, Persian League. I'm still going to kill you. And it reveals the sort of 4x folly where, yes, after one faction wins, another faction can still win from there. Your victory state doesn't last forever. And we're going to prove it by making sure the Persian League don't maintain their grip on the sector. First though, I still need to get my colony system a bit more powerful to give me a bit more income so I can justify throwing out all of the powerful ships I've been collecting and then we'll really get into the strategic space combat aspect of Nexarellin, which after these hours of commentary we've still not really got to. And we're not even ever going to get to some of the other stuff you can do in Nexarellin. There are systems where you send out agents, I think, and you do diplomacy with factions and try to sort of play them off against each other and do stuff in the background. You might have seen sometimes on the left, there's news about other factions doing sabotage and diplomatic actions against each other, which changes various things. And you can do that as well. But on the forum posts recommending this mod and explaining how good it was, etc., there were people saying... They preferred to play it without using those mechanics to keep it closer to vanilla. So for one reason or another, I decided to strategically ignore those mechanics, which gives me the advantage of not having to learn those mechanics. I know it's possible to play without, and maybe it's better to play without all of that stuff the game adds, which is less vanilla -y. Not quite sure about that. Let me know your thoughts, of course, in the comments. Right now, as I said, I wanted to just talk about this hostile activity system. I kind of brushed it off at first, and... You see me here trading with the pirates, and now I'm going to kill them afterwards. What I need to do is not kill the pirates. There's this slightly roundabout way to try and get out of the hostile activity downward spiral. Essentially, that spiral is that your accessibility and stability go down as you add things to your colonies, which slows down their development and lowers their profitability. And you can get to the point when you're not really gaining any advantage by upgrading your colonies because the downgrades you get through the hostile activity system are worse so you might as well try to keep your colony kind of low tech and i ended up after this session going online to try and find out more about this system and particularly to find out if there's any way to get rid of it you can't disable it but some people on reddit and the star sector forums had found ways to make it not be so much of a problem the interesting thing about this feature to me is the reaction to it, I guess. Like, when I saw this feature, I was like, well, I hate this passionately. Like, this is completely the wrong direction for the game to go, as far as I'm concerned. It's taking one of the big problems with the best part of the game in the past, so the way it constantly tries to debuff the colony system and try to stop you from using it, just limit your options for balancing purposes, I presume, and it ramps that system up. So now, on top of like factions raiding you to disrupt your economy because they don't like how much stuff you're exporting, on top of hegemony coming over to inspect your AI cores, on top of pirate spawning, on top of pirate bases spawning, which is what I'm doing now, which makes more pirates spawn, on top of the Luddic Path doing terrorist stuff to debuff you if you have too much tech and too much high-end buildings in your colony systems. Well, on top of all that, now there's another number that makes things worse for you. So 
like every in-game day that things are bad, things get worse because it's constantly adding to this number where it's like every day you have an AI core installed, you gain some negative hostile activity points from logic path activity on top of the old negative thing you get from logic path activity which is still there. And that adds up filling a bar, as the bar fills up you get less and less stability and accessibility. Someone was saying that if you get the maximum number of hostile activity points you get invaded by somebody. And they were just saying, well, I just deal with it when it happens, you know, it's just another thing to deal with. But I think what's harder to deal with is just the debuffs you get along the way, because you're going to be getting like minus three stability and minus 30% accessibility, which, well, we won't go into the numbers, but that's a significant debuff because it comes on top of the other accessibility and stability debuffs you get from the same thing that causes those debuffs, from the Ludic Path terrorism, from pirates attacking you, just from the stuff that happens to stop you from getting too powerful once you're in the colony system. And as I've said a couple of times, I really like the colony system. I don't like the way they've tried to nerf it and try to sort of keep you out of it by adding those various things. And that means I extra don't like this new system. And the interesting thing for me about this is that I was thinking, surely everyone's mad about this. Like, surely nobody wants this to be here because... Well, the problem with this is it limits the number of possible playstyles to one, and a lot of the stuff that's in the game becomes much less valuable, and things like exploring, which, as I keep saying, is a part I really like, is now less valuable as well, because the stuff you get from exploring is the stuff you would use to do the stuff you're being punished for through this new mechanic. And because the punishments are severe enough, it's probably better, and according to people on the internet it is better, to not use it. So that is to say to not use like the AI cores and these special industry upgrades you can get and to not build too many things in your colonies so that the Ludic Path leave you alone. Someone was saying the only viable build is the Ludic Path like roleplay run where you just make primitive colonies or don't make colonies at all. Well, isn't that a problem? That's what I was wondering. Like, what do we do about this? And I was looking through the forum posts, like trying to find where this feature was introduced and has to try to see how people were reacting to it. And there was this interesting reaction to it where, as far as I could tell, like I couldn't find anyone saying it was good and I could find plenty of people saying it was bad, but there was still like loads of goodwill. That's probably the best way of putting it. Like people weren't saying, I can't believe they've made it so there's only one viable build. They were saying, well, but now there's only one viable build. Haha, <laughs> I'm sure they'll fix it in the next patch, that sort of thing. There was this expectation where people were saying like, well, I, this is a problem, but Alex will fix it next time. Like Alex being the lead developer or the guy who talks to people on the forums at the very least. So it's just a really weird situation where it's, it's sort of like you could imagine people review bombing the game on Steam or something for doing something like this and like hammering home a part of the game that people didn't like and making it a bigger part of the game where people who were very defensive about how the game was before would be riled up by that and they'd say like, you're ruining my game. But there was just... Like this weird situation of exclusively negative feedback, but with loads of like positive, like optimistic outlooks on it. Like, yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, it sucks. I hate it. But it'll get fixed one day. It's fine. Like, <laughs> I'll try and find a mod to get rid of it or something like that. I'm just curious about where those sorts of sentiments are coming from and like whether people really don't like it or not. I can't really tell at this stage because it feels like there should be more pushback. To me, I hated it. I was like this is something made in that spirit I keep talking about, the negative spirit, the spirit of like band-aiding problems, the spirit of adding more clicks, of deepening the menu complexity, and taking away player freedom. That's the sort of core spirit I don't like about Star Sector. So many mechanics are designed to make you not do something, and this isn't some accident, that's what the game is supposed to be. Like you're supposed to not be able to trade, you're supposed to not, not to be able to give orders in RTS, and indeed you're supposed to not really interface with the colony system too much. It's put all that stuff on the table so that you can use it, but you're not quote unquote supposed to. And this is less of me reading into the developer's intent, but the developer's stated intent on the forums. I'm in this rare case where like the developer has explained their motivation behind all of these things. So I don't know, I just lost faith. I was like, this is not what this game needs as far as I'm concerned and it's going in the, the wrong direction. It makes the game worse and even makes the modded game worse because you just have to deal with this stuff. The good news is that there are ways to deal with it. 
the main way I'm going to be using in this video, I only found out because somebody on Reddit had discovered it, and well, I don't know how many other people know about this, so maybe you'll be learning this as well. You can basically disable this system in a way by doing a certain thing, a thing I never would have thought to try and do, and a thing I don't like having to do. If you were playing this game for sort of roleplay purposes, this mechanic heavily damages your possibilities because you have to do certain sort of uh, non-roleplay friendly things to deal with this. And it's a shame because I was actually planning a roleplay campaign in this game, which you might have seen some of my other save files earlier were for. And this mechanic being here will be a problem. Now I'm thinking like, what am I going to do when this mechanic messes up the story I want to tell in the game, because I know it will. I'm going to have to just think of something, which will be interesting. I like those challenges when it comes to writing about video games, my other hobby. But in terms of just playing the game, this straight up sucks, and I was mad that this wasn't a mod I could disable, that sort of thing. I would love to see this system be optional, just like everything else in the game that I sort of have questions about. The more options, the better. If I'd had the choice, I would have just thrown this out immediately. Instead, we're going to have to explore the in-game ways to deal with this mechanic. One, which you can see me looking at here, is making patrol bases. Now this mechanic is sort of like another slap on top of the previous slap because theoretically, you can reduce your hostile activity score by making military buildings to patrol your systems and fight pirates, which already reduces the amount of debuffs you're getting by fighting the pirates, so that, that's something that deals with the old debuff system. It now also helps with the new one, but in this sort of insulting almost way, where only one of your patrol HQs counts. So if you have one, you'll get a small number of points taken off your hostile activity every month, but for me that still is nowhere near the amount we need to stop it constantly going up. If you start making more of them, you don't get additional points, and it's just like, why? Again, this is like the spirit of the game going in the wrong direction. It doesn't make sense in universe for it to be like that. It's like that for game reasons, it's like that for balancing purposes, and specifically a balancing purpose to try and stop you doing something in the game perhaps because they think it's overpowered, or perhaps because they really think you shouldn't do that. They really think the game is more enjoyable if you don't have an extensive colony system, and they want to try and stop you from doing it. But someone put this colony system in the game, and they just have to deal with it now because it's too <laughs> ingrained in the code. I don't know. I just find this fascinating. I want to know the story behind all of this, and the fact that I have some of the story through the forums makes me even more intrigued. You can perhaps tell how crazy I've gotten that I'm interested in my life in this one niche change to a relatively niche video game, and I want you to tell me what you think about it as well in the comments. Do you have any input to my craziness here? What we'll eventually do in this commentary is talk about how I got out of the hostile activity system, basically using walkthroughs. Somebody told me the secret ways you can do to get around this system. So we'll do them and see how it works. In the meantime, I started actually playing the mod content, after the mod content has officially come to an end of course. It's time for me to actually participate in the wars, I felt strong enough to do it, let's get out there and do some business. As you might have seen just now, I managed to capture a planet for the Ludic Path, and we'll come back more into how capturing planets works, but that's the big thing you can't do in vanilla. We did it right there, you can't change who owns a planet in vanilla, which means while the vanilla game does have an invasion system. It's just a debuff on the colony system, it's just to give you minus 3 stability, that sort of thing. In Nexarellin, it does something more permanent, and has game state objectives linked to it, so it's more like this is what the game is ultimately about. Everything builds up to you being able to do this, and that makes the game much more complete in my opinion. So, we are going to be invaded. As part of the colony system now, we are also going to be subject to permanent invasions by the enemy. This isn't your old vanilla invasion where they just come and like steal one unit of machines and give you minus three stability for two months. Here they will just take your planet from you. You have to stop them this time, and that makes it much more worthwhile to actually interface with these invasions. And of course, you can do stuff like try to stop them from invading you by invading the place that's about to invade you first. The way it works is that systems invade each other, so it's not like the faction is invading you. A particular planet is sending an invasion fleet to one of your particular planets. If you go to the invading planet first, there's usually like a one or two month period where the invasion fleet is gradually spawning and then it sets off. You can show up and just interfere with things, which in some cases allows you to not have to make lengthy journeys to do defensive actions. 
Here's something, by the way, I really like about fighting the Persian League. I remember this from my first campaign as well. For some reason, if you fly around with the transponder off in Persian League space, they will constantly try and ask you to put it on by sending over tiny fleets that come over and say, hey you, turn your transponder on. But if you're hostile to them, they don't like change that behavior in any way. They just assume you're nobody and will ask you to turn it on. If you say no, they just explode and die because it causes an auto-resolve fight to take place. So you get loads of like free wins and free money and free commission by just killing millions of tiny Persian League fleets, which also actually depletes your hostile activity, if I recall correctly, killing enemy fleets like that. Can't quite remember. Anyway, the ending to this little bit of the commentary is my plan failed because while I went to where the invasion fleet was gathering, I think I arrived like literally just after it left. I could try and find them and chase after them because I know where they're going, so we can probably find their course. What I decided to do instead was some, I don't know, some Sun Tzu style stuff. I always just think, like, I've come to your territory, you're invading my territory, it's gonna take you a while to get to me, but I'm already at you, so I can start being in your base killing your dudes right now. And what I hoped was that I would be able to deploy my troops and do something, and then still go back and defend our system. I probably thought my ships were fast enough or something. We'll see if that ends up being the case. For now, it's time to get to grips a bit more with the military invasion system. You saw me there doing a space bombardment, and the space bombardment mechanic from Vanilla is now like more integrated because you can use it to actually kill troops on the ground. It works in a slightly odd and broken feeling way, actually, which I'll talk about more later. For now, what are we doing? Here's the ground invasion system. It shows you the various sectors, the various buildings on the planet, quote unquote buildings, and you send numbers of troops to try and contest each one. It tells you how many troops the enemy have there. In our case, this planet here is mostly defended by militia, so we can quite easily take it. We'll just drop a whole bunch of marines from our inventory. You just carry them around like cargo. They'll go down and do the stuff. And also there's something in the game called heavy armaments, which I think in vanilla is just a commodity you can buy and sell, but you can use them to do invasions here in Nexarellin. They're like tanks or something in the lore. So you can deploy them as well to help out with your ground invasions. And the ground invasions, again, utilize a time-based mechanic, which is more like it. You set them off to invade the planet, and then they're just doing it. While the battles are happening, you can fight other things. You can set the AI to automatically run the battle for you, or you can stay there and you give a fresh set of orders every day to determine where on the planet your troops are going and what they're doing. It's a pretty simple system, but it's definitely enough as something that is tacked on to an entire other game. So it's all good as far as I'm concerned. You can see I'm going for the leave our troops be option because I'm just completely annihilating all of the minor Persian League fleets in this area and that's going pretty well. The problem I'm going to have right here is that we're not just at war with the Persian League. You can see that Tritachion have this special task group chasing me. We're going to do an emergency burn to try and get away from them. What I need to do ideally is like pick up my troops on this planet and then just whiz away. Because once the planet is yours, it will take the enemy a while to take it back because they'll have to gather a ground army to attack it. We are lucky in this case because a Ludic church fleet appears right here and they will distract Tritachion for me and then we can sort of swing back around into the planet because our troops take it in a second. So that's all good. What I didn't know at first was do you get any like reward for fighting for your faction in this way? And I thought this is a way the mod could be falling down. Like you capture a planet for your faction, it doesn't go to you, it goes to the faction you work for. And what I thought is, the faction you work for should pay you big money for doing that. Occasionally, there's a new quest line where they'll give you a quest, or a new randomly generated quest rather than a quest line, where they'll say, please take this planet in particular, and they'll give you an absolutely massive payout if you do it, like hundreds of thousands. However, you can also make hundreds of thousands by taking any planet, because if you look in a planet's inventory just after you take it, there's like a whole bunch of stuff, like all of the goods the planet had, can be freely picked up by you. You put them in your inventory, sell them back to the planet immediately if you can't be bothered to sell them somewhere better, and you will make loads of money through doing that. Well, anyway, we'll get into that. For now, we've done it. We've taken two planets in this one system somewhere in the star sector. We'll look into the actual strategy and the situation on the map a bit later. Here's the stuff. All of this stuff here needs to be picked up by me. Some of it is just your army, so our troops and tanks and stuff are still down there. We can pick them up ready to fly away and we pick up the other stuff that just happens to be on the planet. There's decent money to be made doing that, so while it kind of feels like you're just spending money for somebody else's gain, 
not only is that the actual pur purpose of the game, like that's where your money ultimately has to go to, like on top of the colony system, because there's this now third thing you do in the game, you get money to help your faction win, but helping your faction win can also get you money in the form of you get war spoils and can sell them to people. There's also this system where what's available at a planet and what markets you sell things to changes its rebel strength. You can see it there on the screen, it says modified rebel strength, because planets can rebel and change factions. And if you sell weapons to the rebels, for example, they might become more powerful and be more, more likely to succeed. A nice, cool mechanic that I didn't really take advantage of. I just sold to anyone who gave me the maximum amount of money, basically, not ignoring whether I'd be igniting a rebellion by doing so or not. Well, anyway, once all that was done, it's time for me to face down the Tritachian Special Task Group, which I can do with the help of the Logic Path Fleet. The Logic Path Fleet isn't very good, or the Logic Church Fleet, whoever these guys are. Logic ships tend to be of lower quality, and because I have quite a few Logic ships in my fleet from buying from their markets, I also have those low-quality low ships. But we can swoop in with a couple of real ships, a couple of hegemony ships basically, and start helping out. And by help out, I of course mean watch somebody else help out, and sometimes give orders as well. I remember coming into this campaign thinking this is going to be the one where I like really learn how to pilot the ships and actually like do stuff myself in combat, and it just didn't happen. I don't find piloting the ships very enjoyable or fun. I think though it is more enjoyable at double speed because the sort of input lag, quote unquote, like the slowness of things to respond to your inputs and the lack of feedback is less intense in that way. So we do take out this Tritachion fleet, we took out that battleship there and that's basically the end of that. And the nice thing about doing a big fight right next to an allied world is you can immediately sell off salvage and repair your ship. And we end up with a bit of money now, you might have noted we had no cash before. And that is because my colony system is in very bad condition, partially as a result of the hostile activity thing, we're losing all, all of our accessibility, which means we can't sell goods or import goods and because you can't import goods this impacts your manufacturing of goods, so then you can't sell things. And generally, we need to sort this out, so we're going to start moving towards that now. First, we rush home, because, as you might recall, we are in the process of being invaded. We arrive, and there's this weird, like, invasion fleet where it's saying Persian League Invasion Fleet, brackets Tritachion, and it has some Tritachion ships in it. So clearly the mod does something where it can cross over the factions, and they can use each other's units, maybe if, like, a Persian League fleet spawns from a Tritachion native planet or something like that. It was actually a really small invasion fleet and we just auto-resolved it really easily, which was surprising, potentially because of the much bigger fleet right next to it. The real battle, once we got home, was against the pirates. The pirates had loads of ships in our home system. This is one of the like three massive fleets that was marauding around. It makes me think that maybe the pirates actually fought the Persian League invasion fleet as they came in and that's why only a few ships were alive once we got there. So it could be the case that me ignoring all of these problems is causing them to start cancelling each other out to a minor extent. That would be nice, isn't, wouldn't it? If you can get the pirates who are killing you to also kill the other people trying to kill you, then that would be great. That would pay off a little bit, maybe, I don't know. Well, as for this battle, you can see again, I'm just sort of micromanaging our big jumpy ship and having most of the other ships just be on a standing order to escort the big one. This allows you to give a lot of orders and move the fleet around without it costing too many order points, because generally you're just giving orders to one or two ships and the others are following their lead. So this gives you some ability to maintain a semblance of a formation and to generally maneuver the fleet's formation around in sort of a trailing way in that they follow the leading ship. It's not very accurate, it's one of these things where I've gotten used to it, like this is so frustrating to play, like we're losing ships needlessly all the time and we end up getting absolutely obliterated here because we're just surrounded and outnumbered. But I didn't feel like so frustrating. At this stage I kind of feel like, well it was nice to try, like I've stopped caring that you don't really have much control over your ships. You're supposed to then move on and take control yourself but I just can't get to that part of like enjoying the game, I just don't like doing that. So what I did enjoy instead, I suppose, is just straight up losing. We retreat from the battle, you then do another retreat battle where, like, the enemy can just re-engage you after you leave, but if you leave them extra hard, then you, it puts you back on the campaign map and you can actually leave. So after that fight with the pirates, we lost most of our existing ships, and you can see the other pirate fleets are now closing in as well. We were about to get attacked again, so even if the battle went better, we would have had to face another battle right after. We may still have been ground down there. We're just outnumbered by the pirates right now. 
We need to do something about that. And I need to do something about the fact I'm making minus 50,000 credits a month from my general economy system. And that's even with the Ludic Church paying me 90,000 credits a month to do absolutely nothing. We've got the exploit money coming in, but it's not enough to cover all of my expenses. We're spending loads on administrators because one of them is the good administrator that sucks all your money away. And I'm spending loads on hazard pay. So I'm trying to grow a lot of my planets, which increases their long-term income by putting money into them in the short term. We're going to have to stop doing that. And of course, everywhere is at like zero or negative access, meaning we can't make money off these places. What we can do is try to get a small baseline income from just the taxation revenue you get. If your colonies like don't export anything or do anything, they still make you money because the people there just pay you money, I suppose. There's some sort of tax system going on in the background. So even though our supplies are like 100% cut off, which is all the red stuff on the right there, we have no imports left and we have no exports because we have no access. We can still make money just sitting here under siege by taxing people. How are they staying alive? I don't know. I think there is actually a system where if your planets don't have a food supply for a really long time, it will lose stability and it can rebel and go into like a de-civilized mode or something, but that's just another debuff it puts on the planet. I don't know if you actually lose the planet. Well, it's never gotten that bad, so I don't know. There is some consequence, I think, to being under siege for a really long time. But, well, in this campaign, I was barely paying attention and the bad thing didn't happen, so if there is a bad thing, it should probably happen a bit more. Anyway, what we're going to do is try to get out of this situation. The issue I had is that almost none of my planets had any supplies on them, so I couldn't supply my ships. So my fleet gets basically destroyed as I had to fly across hyperspace to get to my old colonies to find some supplies. We end up with a couple of ships still alive in terrible condition. We've got zero money in the bank account. This is less than ideal. We need to bounce back and we still can bounce back from here. We're still going to iron man it from here. We're not going to try and reload and like try to win that battle earlier or something because I had something in mind. I had some plans that wouldn't require me to need a fleet for a while, so we're going to do some stuff. The first thing we're going to do is try to just grind some cash using time mechanics. As I said earlier, this is less effective in Nexarellin. And it's because if you want to sit back and just make money off your colonies, there's more stuff that might actually go wrong in Nexarellin because you might lose the colonies if you say AFK and somebody invades a planet and takes it while you're not looking. And I think that actually happened. I can't remember looking through the footage, but at some point, I suffered a penalty for doing what I'm doing here. That is nothing. See, I got 17 credits doing nothing just there. We're making big money. Well, as I micromanage my colony system in the background and then just AFK, we can start making serious cash. So this clip now is three years after the previous clip. Basically, loads of nothing happened. I either lost one of my planets or I made them autonomous. I think it might have been one of each, actually. There's some way in Nexarellin to take a planet and say it's an autonomous planet now. In fact, we've lost Absolute Nightmare, it says there in the list, to Tritachion. So we'll have to get Absolute Nightmare back at some point. We did lose one planet over the years, but we're still alive. This system makes money for us now. And that autonomous planet thing is a way to have a planet without it costing a governor slot and causing all of the debuffs from that, basically. Although I think you make less money, I can't remember how it works. You get a percentage of an autonomous planet's money, but not very much. It is essentially like the correct solution, I guess, or a correct solution to the colonies being overpowered problem. Don't limit how many you can have, limit how profitable they are. Like, just stop making them overpowered. That's the way to do it. Well, anyway, it's been done there. I didn't use it very much because I don't really need any more colonies than what I have right now. What I need to do is this. This is the next no fleet required business I wanted to get to. I was looking around for a pirate base and I found one relatively near our home system because they spawn near your home system. And that means we can come and talk to the pirate lord. This is something someone on the internet told me you can do. I never would have imagined you could do this. So this is where I'm like basically getting out of this bad mechanic with a walkthrough. If you make a deal with the pirates, you can ally to the pirates by promising them 10% of your profits, which is absolutely a deal. Like, that's so cheap for you to do. You get so much out of this. Not only does it give you the same hostile activity reduction as killing the pirates, but it also gives you a daily additional hostile activity reduction forever. And that makes the hostile activity system not happen because it will eventually just be reduced down to zero and you never have to look at it again. I was going to show you 
like what that actually does on the numbers on the hostile activity screen, but I genuinely could not work out how to open the hostile activity screen. It's something I'd only ever opened before because when a notification comes up on the left that it's changed, you can click on the notification and it shows you the screen. I don't actually know where the screen is in the UI, and I did spend some time looking for it, so there's some UI design <laughs> considerations there. That mechanic's been tacked on, but it's been really like slipped under everything else. I don't know where it is in the game. But basically, our hostile activity after this stage, after making that deal, just went down to zero after a while, and we don't have to worry about any accessibility or stability debuffs. We're going to get back in the game right now. And as you might have noted, I also now have 800,000 credits from my doing nothing time, just actually making money from the colony system and from my commission where they pay you to do nothing. So we jump back into our home system and get all of the ships I had in storage out, including this really powerful 14th Battle Group battleship, which comes in very useful, well, right now, when I have to fight, yes, the pirates. It turns out that allying to the pirates doesn't make you an ally to the pirates. It's just sort of a thing. I'm guessing it's just a thing that was added on along with the hostile activity system. You can pay money to not have to deal with the hostile activity system, but the sort of in-universe thing you do doesn't actually affect the game. So while we are now working with the pirates, they're still fighting us, we're still fighting them, and this is a completely separate system. So it's sort of weird. It makes me think that after allying to that pirate base, if I also destroyed the pirate base, it probably would have kept my alliance going in some way. There it is. The hostile activity notification came up. That means I'm allowed to look. So in here, it's saying something about us getting reduced hostile activity due to a pirate base doing stuff. The actual number is pretty small, minus four. But you have to remember it's minus four instead of like plus 10. So like if you don't have the deal, you get plus 10. So it's kind of like you're getting a minus 15 thing off that deal. Basically, it means we're now in the green and eventually hostile activity will stop, which will make our colonies more prosperous. I also, I think, removed some of the AI cores. I tried to make it so there was less Ludic Path terrorism because, well, this is the thing I mentioned earlier where you have to do the Ludic Path like roleplay run. The debuffs you get from low stability and from low accessibility that come from that terrorism are actually big enough to offset the advantages of using the various items you can get to upgrade your colonies. So it is better to not use them. Well, somebody claimed it was better. I tried not using them, and I guess I did make a whole bunch of money without doing anything, so there you go, it works. But is there still a way to make it work with the AI cores as well? Well, I would hope so, because finding the AI cores and putting them in is like something that's good about the game, and now it's just something that's been removed by a balancing thing trying to stop you doing all of this. I don't know. So, well, I guess I played by the rules. I'm now not doing that. We're going to get rid of the problem. We're going to get rich. We've already gotten rich. And now we're going to start deploying some big fleets to do some stuff. Here's where our colony is. I don't know if I've made that clear so far. We're up there towards the top right. The one that's shining right now is our first co colonized system. And one directly north of it is one of the other ones. So what do we need to do up there? Well, what I need is to get the Ludic Church to control part of this area as well. Because right now, the nearest colonies are Tritachion, Persian League, and Hegemony. And at one point or another, we're always going to be at war with one of those factions. And you get a big debuff to your accessibility due to proximity to hostile factions. And vice versa, you get a buff if you're near a non-hostile faction. So if we can get the faction we're always not hostile to, to control the colonies around mine specifically, I personally will get tons of buffs from that. So that's the goal. We need to try and conquer areas nearby. And we're going to start moving into the mod content for real, for real this time. We've got a fleet that isn't just going to die in combat. We're going to start buying and recruiting and maintaining good ships and keeping them in the fleet. And we're going to start trying to actually win battles and not just die to random pirate spawns. <laughs> it's time to get serious. First, we're fighting random pirate spawns, of course, because they are just all over our home system. And it seems I decided to finally try and kill them. It was partially because of this 14th Battle Group ship. It's just really powerful and fun to use. And by use, I again mean look at. I'm just telling it what to do, because I think the AI does a perfectly good job of doing what I was going to do. It shoots at the enemy, and one advantage the AI has that I somehow still haven't mentioned so far, but I think about constantly when playing the game, is that the AI has like quote-unquote better controls than you. The AI can accelerate in every direction, which makes their maneuvering really good. They're really nice and smooth in the way they maneuver around and are quick to get out of danger. That's what I quite like about the AI controlling your ships. 
You can kind of do that sometimes, but it requires you to tap the keys in a weird way, unless you want to move in a cardinal direction. It's because you can only accelerate forward, sideways, or diagonally by pressing forwards and sideways at the same time, which is already sort of difficult on the left hand to be doing, because you have to do other things in vanilla, like hold shift and stuff at the same time. It's like, if you've ever tried this, playing something like Dark Souls on keyboard and mouse. I remember when Dark Souls first came out, I played it on keyboard and mouse, and it's really annoying, it's super unfun, whereas it sort of controls flawlessly if you're playing it on a controller. And it's a similar feel to that, because you're limited in what inputs you can give on keyboard and mouse for Star Sector, and the AI doesn't play with those limitations. I don't know, the AI does a really good job of piloting the ships around, except when it's doing something really stupid like going in the wrong direction or not doing something tactical. And with a few orders from the player, and assuming you have the entire fleet just like escorting one ship so your orders onto one ship are going to have a big strategic impact, you can do something about that. And I ended up sort of enjoying it. I felt like in the end I had some mastery of the orderless order system and trying to conserve orders. I've also got the skill build that maximizes the number of orders you can get. You can go various ways down the skill tree to get more. This is partially because of mod reasons. In one of the mods, it raises the level cap from 15 to 25, which allows you to get all of the passive skills at max level, just about anyway. And on top of that, in Nexarellin there are more sources of experience, so you level up faster naturally. You get experience points just for making profits from your colony system, so there's a kind of management experience thing happening in the background there, which is quite nice. And you also get loads of experience points for successfully capturing planets, which we've done a couple of times, and we're going to do a bunch more times after this, because it's time for us to actually start conquering the galaxy, <laughs> once I've conquered my own home system from the millions of pirates I'm allied to. So here's where my grand crusade begins, quote-unquote begins. This is like the third time that I've pretended to begin playing the mod content, but there's going to be trouble. We're actually getting close this time. <laughs> we'll see what's going to happen. So I went to the nearest enemy system, just to the west of my home colonies, where Tritachion have this planet that hasn't finished building its space station yet, so if I attack right now, I have an advantage. The issue is that once we come to invade, we see it's actually defended by quite a lot of stuff, and it looks like they have more number than me. There are actually some things we could do to overcome that, that I hadn't learned yet. But for now, I just thought, oh, I don't have enough, like, marines and tanks in my inventory, so I can't take this planet. Because of that, I'm going to instead do the vanilla attack. So this is what the marines were for in vanilla. You can do raids, which I think really is just to get money and stuff off of them. There is a theoretical strategic aspect to this, because you could raid a planet to disrupt its production of something, and if your colony system also produces that thing, then your market value, or your market penetration, might go up because somebody else stopped selling the thing you're trying to sell. That sort of thing, you could do something with that. That's a case where like the cost of doing it would outweigh how much money you'd make by doing it, but it feels fun anyway, that sort of thing. And people will say like, this is cool that you can do that, and perhaps not realize that it's not actually a good idea to do. He's back at it again, the opportunity cost brainworms man is here, second guessing every possible decision you can make. Star Sect is a good game for doing that, slash a bad game for doing that. What I did was I decided to go out and do some missions to get some more cash. I thought I'll just get a massive pile of cash and just buy loads of troops. I don't want to roll up anywhere and be like, I can't take this place. I want to have more troops than any defending planet has. So that was my plan, just get rich again. Thus stalling my crusade even more, I just might be claiming I'm going to start it. I'm showing you this clip here of me picking up a whole bunch of ships. Just to be annoying, I think I put this in here for, you know, I like to put annoying clips in my commentaries. This is just to show you how many times I had to click the mouse to do this. It's a classic case where, like, there's ten things I want to salvage, and what I want to do in the game is just take everything I can from this, but it takes a really long time to do it. Well, not even a really long time, it takes like two minutes, but it feels like it could take way less time if the developer had done something here. Like, I need some more help from the devs to get that gameplay task done, because it's not that interesting, but I do want to do it, and I want to do it faster. After that, I got the troops I wanted. I was going to go back and attack the same planet near my colonies that I was attacking before, but instead I realized I needed to spend some time in the core, because the core situation is very chaotic right now, and the Ludic Church is on the verge of defeat. We're actually in one of the Ludic Church's core systems right now, I think, and Tritachion are just all over them with fleets everywhere. So it's time for me to step in. We're going to turn this war around right now. 
First, I'm going to sneakily take a planet that's near the main battle zone, because you can land your troops separately and then just have them do the thing while you pay attention to the space battles. And we've now got absolutely loads of troops. When you land troops, you need to pay attention to the movement points it says there on the screen, which is kind of like the deployment points in space battles. It's essentially the same mechanic as deployment points, but this time it's good, even though it's really similar. So that's a subtlety I wanted to sort of focus in on. Here, while you have to spend currency to deploy your troops, it doesn't feel arbitrary because it represents something you're doing in game. You pay supplies to land troops on a planet, whereas in normal battles you pay supplies to quote unquote deploy from your fleet to participate in space battles. I don't really know what that means, and well, the reason I don't like it is because of the way it sort of impacts the game overall. I'll talk about that in a second, I think. You might have noted there, you can do some special stuff in ground combat as well. I think that Nexarel in ground combat system is surprisingly detailed and well implemented. You can do like bombing. If you stick around over the combat, you can bomb enemies down there from your space fleet, which is handy. I kind of just like snuck around during the fight. It wasn't there, but I was stalking, watching what was happening here, because Tritachion is annihilating here. They've just got finished annihilating basically some Ludic Path or Ludic Church stuff in this area. So I stalked about, thinking I'm going to have to deal with this, but I needed to wait for the opportune moment, which was right now, a few days later in game. After the planet has been captured, that means that any battle damage I take right now can be repaired instantly at the planet. And it means the enemy's combat readiness has gone down. I don't know how I got this far without talking about combat readiness. But for completeness in this complete commentary of the game, I must mention that all of your ships have a combat readiness stat. It's something like their morale and it represents how good they are. Somewhere in the game it does say what combat readiness does. It's one of those things where I can't remember how important it is because it doesn't make a big deal about how important it is. I think it does things like increase weapon damage or increase weapon range if you have high combat readiness. And many of the upgrades you can get in game are about increasing the maximum combat readiness your ships can have. So far, so good as far as I'm concerned, but it's just the rest of the stuff combat readiness does that makes me sort of sour on it and not like it as a mechanic overall. I'm one of the people where I'm like, if you took Star Sector and completely removed combat readiness, I think the game would play very similarly and potentially better from a player experience only perspective. Well, let's try and fill out those points a little bit while this battle takes place. Combat readiness is this stat that's going down all the time in combat, so it provides the de facto time limit to combat, where your ships gradually lose this number. You can see it is a percentage under the health bar on some of the little pop-up tooltips over your ships. And over time, it goes down. If it gets down really low, your ships have like accidents or something where like their ammunition explodes inside them and they start taking damage and you're supposed to withdraw them from combat before that happens. This theoretically happens to the AI as well, but it's one of these asymmetry cases once again, where because the AI can lose combat readiness but it doesn't have to pay to get it back, it doesn't matter for them. And of course because their ships are free, it extra doesn't matter for them. So it's a player facing mechanic that the AI has and the AI having it is sort of like the justification for it being in the game at all. You can use it to do tactics, like I did right here. I was able to engage an enemy fleet that's just stopped engaging somebody else, and we can fight them when their combat readiness is lower, at least on some of their ships, which means some of their ships will have some debuff on them. I guess I wish I knew what it was. If it was important enough, it probably should be telling me what it is all the time, that sort of thing. Well, it's a mechanic where... It feels like it's coming from the right place. It's coming from the heart. It's a mechanic that's supposed to represent this idea that your ships are undergoing stress in combat, like they're being poorly maintained because these combats are sort of in, an, in the abstract sense happening over a long period of time, and they're degrading because your crew aren't maintaining the ship properly due to the rigors of combat happening around them. And it also represents, in another way, like ammunition or something. That's a very abstract thing where, like, Theoretically, combat readiness represents like how many torpedoes you have, but uh, whether you fire them or not, you still lose the combat readiness. There's like several different abstractions and things it's supposed to simulate being rolled into one mechanic here, which I think is part of the reason I don't think it works that well. But my main objection, I think, is probably 
well, two uh, two main objections, actually. One is the way the AI doesn't really have to deal with it. So it's just an asymmetry that's against the player. I think asymmetry should be in favor of the player in a game where the, the AI has the advantage overall in that their ships are free. Their ships will just appear. So your ship should be better, should be easier to maintain in some way than theirs to make up for that, which is both a sort of balancing concern. And my second concern, which is just player experience, it's not very fun to have to decide whether or not to deploy ships into combat. And that's for a specific reason. It's not that it's not fun in principle. It's, fu it's not fun because of how Star Sector does this specifically. So I'll try and clarify that. When Star Sector asks you to pick what ships to deploy into combat, it tells you how many supplies it will cost to use it-ish. So it says, here's the recovery cost, I think it says. That's the way it puts it. So you spend 40 supplies, for example, to deploy my big battleship here but you're not actually spending it right away. It's trying to say that it will cost you at least 40 supplies to recover the ship from the combat readiness loss they will automatically take by having taken part in battle. But also, as I said, combat readiness declines over time. So you pay a bit more based on how long the battle actually took. And maybe you can sense what the problem's going to be here. How long the battle takes depends on how many ships you deployed. So there's a really kind of hidden but complicated decision to make there like it feels like it's strategic at first and you, you can see why they put that mechanic in and why people will think cool i like this mechanic i like having to choose and sort of know how powerful my fleet is know which one of my ships will be enough to overcome what ships they have but in reality that decision is almost impossible to make because the more ships you bring the less combat readiness reduction you get due to the speed of combat and due to taking less damage as well which also costs supplies in the same way so we have again off ed the man who wants to sort of analyze something and finds a strategic decision going crazy over a mechanic because it's too difficult to work out what the correct decision is well i think the correct decision that i landed upon is to always go overkill that works for me which i think is what the game is actively trying to stop you from doing in fact that is what it's trying to stop you from doing because if they weren't trying to do that they wouldn't need this mechanic at all and i would argue of course that they indeed don't need this mechanic to the extent that they might want to remove it another one of these things where you are already limited in how powerful the fleet you can have is by its maintenance costs so adding a different thing where it also costs more to use it in combat isn't that interesting to me because it represents a limitation on the player that's been added to stop you from doing something once again that I don't think is an interesting decision to make, both because the actual decision for real big brain strategy losers is too difficult to make because the numbers involved aren't shown on the screen. It's very difficult to calculate what the correct decision would be in a scenario which also makes it less accessible as a game because having any idea like what to do as a beginner is just out the window. Like you'll never know what ships to bring into combat until you're very experienced and you'll just make the wrong decisions constantly. But it also is doing the thing where two mechanics have the same effect so you can remove one of them. That is to say, the game is already punishing you for having a big fleet. It doesn't need to punish you for attempting to use it, that sort of thing. It should just be the case, like, if you have a big fleet, if you have enough supplies in your inventory to field a big fleet, if you have enough money to field a big fleet, then you can use it. And there's no like questions asked. Like when the enemy comes upon you, your fleet will fight them. You don't have to say, well, ah, now you have to pay again and you pay extra if you actually want to use the big ships because you already paid to bring the big ships to this situation. I already paid extra supplies to have an extra powerful fleet. The reward is I get the extra powerful fleet I don't then want to have to make this decision where it's like, well, should I even use it now that I've brought it here? I can see why it's there. You can see the potential for strategy and doing things where having just a powerful fleet isn't automatically better to make people think about that a little bit more. I've thought about it too much to the extent that I don't think it's worth thinking about, basically. <laughs> I'm done thinking about it and I don't want to anymore. It was solved in this campaign for me for a simple reason because of that mission thing I did, the big change that actually didn't come from mods, by expanding the mission range and allowing players to just take on missions kind of whenever they want and to take on four missions at the same time, for example, getting money becomes less of a big deal. Like there's always some work you can do to get money and it's always gonna be worthwhile. You can always put in an hour and come away with enough money to go and do something else, as I put it earlier. And because of that, 
I was never really low on supplies, because I was always making decent cash by just going out to get missions earlier on, so I had plenty of supplies. And then once we're in Nexarelin, chances to get supplies will keep coming along. We've got the salvage bonus from the skill tree, we've got salvage ships in the fleet, so we can get supplies by killing enemies, or at least mitigate our supply loss by being in combat. And because of that, I was able to usually deploy all of my capital ships in combat, and we'll see that as we go forward some more. This meant I had more fun with it, I think. I got more of the experience I probably would have got if you didn't have to make decisions about what to bring into combat at all. It's not that I'm totally against it in principle, and I kind of like where they were trying to go with it. I just think it doesn't work because of the reasons I said before. Let's try not to repeat myself too much here. One thing I will note is that I've just been playing High Fleet recently, which also has the concept of quote-unquote deploying into combat. But in that game, it makes a tiny bit more sense because you actually se separate the ships that are going into combat from the fleet and you now have two fleets for a very short time, like as the combat takes place and your other fleet might be doing something else. This makes a bit more sense and makes more sense in terms of like what deployment into combat means because to make some history points here, in like real life, like in the Pacific War for example, large fleets did actually select small portions of their fleet to go and do stuff to save fuel because it really does reduce your quote unquote combat readiness to deploy ships into combat because you actually have to spend something to do it in real life. So this mechanic kind of represents something as I said earlier, it's an abstract representation of something that really does happen. It's just specifically the way it does it in this game doesn't work for me and it does make it a worse game I would say. And it's a case where just removing it would be fine because all of the stuff it's trying to punish you for is already there elsewhere in the game. You're already being punished for going around with big fleets and you should want it to be fun to go around with big fleets, starting to bring in fun as a concept now to game design, a rare thing to be doing. So I think it just kind of sucks to be like, well, you went out there into space, you found this cool battleship, but you shouldn't use it. The game is trying to think like, try to get as far through the game as you can without using it. Wouldn't it be cooler if because I paid for it, I could just use it, that sort of thing. I don't want to worry about using it. It shouldn't be a bad thing that I, that I brought it into combat. And you go into the combat, you win the combat, but you're thinking, oh, like the combat went too well. I shouldn't have brought my big ship because I could have got the combat done cheaper if I hadn't brought the big ship. And while you're thinking that, you're probably wrong, because the presence of the big ship actually made the combat go so much faster that the combat readiness savings on all the other ships made up for the cost of bringing the big ship. But you can't know that because it's too complicated to work out and the numbers aren't shown to you. I'm repeating myself. Hopefully somebody knows why I went insane, in the past at least, over the combat readiness system. And it was solved for me by making the game easier, making it easier to make money, so that I didn't need to worry about the money so much, so that I wasn't worried about this money draining mechanic so much. And I would like it if just none of that had happened at all, because all the fun I had in the game was completely separate to that. It feels like something about the combat readiness system and the deployment system in tandem, the way it all works together with the economy, stood in the way of me having fun, and I only solved it by getting to the point when I could just ignore it and pretend it wasn't there anyway. So that's that, that's my rant about that over. So from here on, it's going to be pure war. It's going to be the thing that I basically tried to do much early in this video when I was like, yeah, next run's about a war, let's dive in. Now we're really going to dive in. It's only like the seventh time I've tried, but we are actually going to do the stuff. Our fleet isn't that powerful, but luckily in this particular system, we're not facing any of those enemy fleets where it has like five battleships in it. So we can engage, fight and win. And I thought I'd talk about, well, very vaguely, what's happening right here. So as I said earlier, I kind of got into controlling the battle via the RTS mode, the tactical map, and kind of getting a feel for, like, what would happen when I gave a specific order. This is a difficult game to get a feel for that, because the AI is doing its own thing. But you get into a kind of rhythm, a kind of pattern, where you start to understand, you start to see through the lines of code in the Matrix, and you think, if I give this specific combination of orders, this thing will happen. Where like here, because I have two escort orders and a positional like anchor order somewhere behind my fleet, my fleet will vaguely stay in a line facing up and left in that situation. And like you can know you can use that to position your fleet with that particular combination of orders. This is very dumb, and you're not supposed to play like this, as I've said. 
but I kind of enjoyed it. It got me close to what I wanted Star Sector to be. It just took a lot of experience and it's still frustrating and constantly things you don't want to happen will happen. It's a really interesting setup because they've got the hard bit down and they've missed the easy bit of making a cool RTS. Where like the AI's reaction to the dynamic emerging situations in battle are pretty good overall. Like you want a game to be like if I give this order but the ships or the pilots of my ships notice the battlefield situation changing, they will ignore the order and start doing something else to keep themselves alive. That's a really cool idea and that part, the difficult part, is kind of available in the game and I like that. It's just that the basics, like get in a formation or like go somewhere, aren't available because those orders aren't given to you. You're not supposed to be giving those orders. And it's a shame, like it feels like with a little bit more work, a huge leap forward could be made there and it would make this a really unique strategy game. Again, I don't think they want it to be that, but they've accidentally almost done it. And I want to really encourage the developers in some way to try and push over that finish line because that would be something special. It's just that as things stand now, with only what's provided, it's like really unspecial. It's gone completely the other way because you've got pieces of these mechanics that totally don't work on their own. So you get like a really bad strategy game or a really frustrating strategy game, shall we say, where you have all these ships. It's really important that you sort of keep them alive and have some control over the battlefield, but you're not supposed to be thinking like that. And to people like me who want to think like that and see the advantage in thinking like that, it's just a constant problem and source of frustration. I remember my very first initial reaction to playing Star Sector was that I hated the battle system. Like I just thought like every single like minute thing about it is wrong. I've gradually like sort of learned to love it in some way. I sort of think, well, it's okay. I can see what they're trying to do, but I still think like all of the initial disappointment is still there. Like the controls still aren't there. The slow pace, the physics, the lack of control of other ships, the small scale, the massive pylon of like costs and punishments that in vanilla at least means that doing combat for fun isn't necessarily the game is going to lean towards. But at the same time, you can feel those ingredients of a special game in there. You can feel that something good could come of this. Although my perspective is warped, of course, because I'm not piloting the ships myself. And again, I don't think you're supposed to play like this. So who knows? What does my input mean? Probably nothing to the developers because they're not trying to appeal to me. But I really do think that the me demographic would get something very special if Star Sector lent only very slightly more into that. It's 95% done, just in such a way that this only provides 20% of the quality. A tiny bit more work would have a gigantic increase in quality for the RTS experience of things, I think, anyway. So what's going on right here in the campaign? As you can see, we're just doing more gigantic fights. I'm doing some sort of crazy order setup to keep things under control. And this felt satisfying to me. I liked kind of somehow getting to grips with this and feeling like what I wanted to happen was actually happening. That should just be the base gameplay with like no mastery or weirdness or reliance on RNG required, I think. What I'm doing strategically was taking out an invasion force that was forming nearby to go and invade my colonies. With them dead, I could sneak over to a nearby Persian League planet and sell off all of the loot, ready to take on another round of loot. In that battle, I did some manoeuvring beforehand, you might have seen, to avoid having the battle be fought along with this space station involved. So that means we can take out the invasion force, then once space is clear, we become the invasion force, now we'll take out the space station, ready to attack the planet. And we see me here trying to do some tactics again. What I want to do with a space station attack is to attack from at least three sides at the same time. This is difficult again because giving move orders is kind of like an unsupported feature which you can kind of do sometimes. You can give waypoint orders where the AI will consider going where you wanted it to go but it also still considers the battlefield situation and reacts so dynamically to it that it's probably going to do something weird. For example, right here. The only order I think I have given here is that the, sh the ship should A escort each other and B attack the station. That's the order set up. But we have something occur here which I saw occur actually many times during the campaign and got really annoying after a while. Sometimes if you have an order attack on a station, the ships will be kind of trying to keep their distance from the station I think because the station has long range weapons and they'll tend to cluster up at the bottom of the screen. They sort of rotate back around towards the deployment zone if you don't have waypoints out on the flanks as well to draw them in those directions. 
and they get stuck on each other because they're escorting each other they're also being given some AI incentive to <laughs> stick together and they also stick to the place where they think it's safe on the map I guess and you get pile-ups which is super frustrating because you're losing money when your ships pile up like if they sit there just not really doing anything even if you're not taking damage you are well taking damage actually due to the loss of combat readiness your ships will eventually just explode even if they're sitting in a safe zone so it's really annoying when they're doing something weird like that in this case by cancelling all the orders and speeding up time they eventually shuffled away from each other they have to be careful because ships can't collide with each other's shield bubbles so they're very slow when they're quite near to each other the weird thing is I don't remember that happening in vanilla, although I don't see why it would be different because there aren't any mods affecting the way the ships move, I don't think anyway installed. Well anyway, anecdotally, when I played before I didn't have that problem, but maybe it's just because I have this specific combination of ships that happen to behave in that way. Something bad was happening, but we did win the battle eventually, and we start landing troops to take the planet. I quite enjoy the planetary landing system, I like the entire UI around it and in particular the idea that it's based on a real time mechanic so we wait an in-game day for the turn to pass the quote-unquote turn this restores some of your movement points and gives you the chance to give more orders if i wait one more turn i can do some more fire support where you bombard the enemy from space if you're nearby we can spend a story point here to inspire the troops and give them more morale luckily the fight's easy enough we don't need to do that Really, I'm just deploying troops and moving them around, which just costs supplies, so you might want to have some strategy about, again, trying to use like the minimum amount of force to win, like in space battles. It just matters less because the reward for victory is very large, so it's more about just optimizing your reward rather than like trying to get a reward at all or trying to avoid losses by participating in combat. And it makes more sense in-universe, it's more immersive and less sort of questionable overall. You could also criticize the UI, I guess it's like complicated looking, but I kind of appreciated how it works. It's sensible at the very least, even though it's a bit complex. But you have to give them plenty of slack here because they're making this UI like within a game that they don't control. So they have only limited options for what they can do with that UI and what the mechanics of ground combat can be. And for what presumably was available to them, it seems they've done a good job. So we capture the planet just before another fight starts, allowing me to effectively stop time, sell a bunch of things, repair the whole fleet and, well, sell things the planet used to have to itself to make some cash off this whole endeavour, which more than pays for the endeavour, which is all nice. So that's the extra rewarding thing I was talking about just now. Doesn't really matter if you spend like 100 extra supplies than you could have, because you make so much money, it doesn't matter that much in the long run, and you don't have to stress about it if you're someone like me who stresses about those sorts of things. Or perhaps to make a more broad point, it's not going to impact the gameplay balancing very much to have those decisions be made incorrectly on your part. And by incorrectly, I mean you chose to become too powerful and that proves to be an incorrect decision. That's going to be less of a punishing power move to make. Anyway, one thing I wanted to say there that shot past very quickly was I had this enemy fleet coming in to attack me and... I was able to go to the planet and instantly repair my fleet before this fight, which brings up another time mechanic point to make, I suppose. There's some kind of inconsistency, I guess, where I just like to see the docked repairs take some time on the map and have some kind of risk associated with them, where you can still be attacked if you're docked at a space station. The space station can still be attacked while you're being repaired and you have to fight with whatever health you have. Again, I've been playing High Fleet, so if you know what that is, then <laughs> it's coming from that sort of direction, that sort of thought. But there's a, a longer-standing thought, a more deep-rooted thought, which is just that a mechanic like, say, Double Salvage makes so much more sense if the game had been made with time mechanics in mind, which, which Nexarellin does more of. So that's one of the reasons I like Nexarellin. It's gone more in the direction that I think supports the existing vanilla mechanics, where, for example, with Double Salvage, it makes sense for you to not be able to salvage somewhere twice if it takes real in-game time and something bad might happen during that time. Then you have a decision to make. Oftentimes you're still going to be wasting your own time by having to make the decision, so it's still questionable in that regard. But it's less questionable, it makes more sense. You can imagine the tactics and the strategy and the risk-reward decision-making coming into things a bit more in that scenario. And I liked that idea. Well, it doesn't matter very much anyway. What I wanted to actually talk about in this fight is another thing that I like about Nexarellin, which is this vengeance system. 
well, I'm not even quite sure if I like it. What I wanted to complement this vengeance system on is that it doesn't interrupt the gameplay too much. So allow me to explain. Normally, in the sort of vanilla quote-unquote spirit of the game, if the game wanted to punish you for doing well, which is what this mechanic here does, I'll explain it in a second, what it would do is attack your colony system. And that would mean you have to go there, usually anyway, which means you can't do whatever gameplay activity you had in mind because this takes over. I'm not a huge fan of that. You can see why they do it, it's just as a balancing thing or like as a punishment to stop you doing the thing the developers don't want you to do, perhaps, if that is the correct interpretation. Well, in Nexarellin, we have this vengeance system where if you harass a particular faction a lot, there's some kind of vengeance bar or like vengeance level that levels up. So we're at vengeance level one now as opposed to zero, meaning that faction is hunting you specifically, not just your faction, to a greater extent. And they'll send out the hunter fleets to look for you and try to stop you from doing whatever it is you're doing, probably capturing all of their planets. So this is more like it in that if you want to have an anti-player balancing mechanic where the player doing well causes something bad to happen to the player, having it happen to where you are as the player, like ha having it local to you is a thousand times better than having it be done against your faction or be done somewhere else where it's like now you just have to do a quest where you go somewhere and do a thing and then go back to what you're doing. This just takes place as part of what you were doing already. So I don't have to stop my invasion of this system because the stop doing stuff mechanic has occurred right here where I was already. This is 10 times better while being almost the same as vanilla. Another like tiny change with a big impact mechanic that I like to focus down on. If your gameplay success means the AI will just cheat to try and level the playing field, it should be as unannoying as possible, and all that means in Star Sector is making the stuff happen to you and not happen to your planets. Because you are you, and you can do whatever you were doing before, and also deal with the cheating AI if it comes to you to be dealt with. I don't want to have to go out of my way to deal with it, unless there's some sort of special circumstance or it's more mechanically integrated, like perhaps Nexarellin's planetary invasions where there are actual mechanics behind it, it's not really cheating or doing something as unfair as something like this where it's just spawned some enemies to attack me because they don't like me i've done too well against tritachion so tritachion gets free ships just to deal with me to bog me down in this case it wasn't enough but you can level up your vengeance level to the point when they send bigger and bigger fleets just to hunt you down i think there was a mechanic something like this in one of the best strategy games of all time, Godless Tactics, that I mentioned earlier as well, where some of the enemy factions will, in some circumstances, send out really powerful teams to hunt the player specifically. A similar game with sort of a similar design considerations to be made there. So my point is that Nexarellin gets this a bit more right than vanilla Star Sector, I think. Even though it's doing basically the same thing, the slight difference makes a dramatic improvement. So it's a case where that's good news for vanilla, I guess, because vanilla can be extremely easily improved by implementing those same sorts of decisions. If, of course, you accept that not having to go out of your way to do something would count as an improvement. It depends, again, what the developers want players to do in the game, which is this thing that I'm perpetually confused about. Well, it's good news. Like, it's either how it's supposed to be, or it's really close to, to something that I think would be better, generally speaking. So, whatever, even the worst case scenario here, there's not very much work that anyone needs to do. And in fact, if you install Nexarellin, which isn't much work for you either, it's already a bit better. And of course, the whole argument that people were making that I was referring to at the beginning, that Nexarellin should just be vanilla still exists like they could still buy out this mod and just have this vengeance fleet system that somebody else has made instead of the thing in vanilla where like some faction gets angry that you sold too much metal and decides to just come and kill you so you have to fly across the map to stop that or just be like oh whatever just kill me i don't care because i <laughs> mean the game doesn't want me to have this colony system let it die anyway after a few victories in orbit of this planet we need to get some more because there's another mechanic in Exorellin, the automatic counter invasion. I don't quite know how this works, but essentially if you take a planet where there's another planet that the same faction controls in the system, that other planet can immediately try to take back the one you just took by 
doing the invasion mechanic but outside of the usual invasion mechanic cycle. Although I, I presume it still costs the same resources for them to do it, so by spawning a counter invasion like this you're stopping them from making a regular invasion, probably anyway. The bad news for them is that their fleets aren't big enough to take our fleet down, in that they tended to only have one or two capital ships, so by just deploying more than that, and by using something called tactics in battle now and again anyway, we're able to overcome the enemy quite easily. The main tactic I sort of lent towards is just splitting the fleet into two quite powerful portions. The AI usually splits its fleet into a powerful portion and a weak portion, if the map has capture points on it, I should say. So it tends to like really heavily go left or right and then only slightly go in the other direction. And you can easily win one side in that fashion and you tend to get cases where you can surround the enemy and things like that. We'll look into that if it comes up as we go along. I'm going to be skipping over quite a lot of the battles because there are just going to be loads from here on out. Like I'm doing the part of the game that I was trying to get to. But I don't have that much to say about it. Like if I wanted to really commentate on the tactics of the battles, we would be here for even longer than we have been already. So I'm not really going to. I'll just have a few notes here and there. There were two counter-invasion fleets coming in. There's only one other enemy station in the system as it is, so maybe one of them came from another system or was a regular invasion fleet that just happened to be arriving at the same time. Not quite sure, but we had to fight essentially the same battle twice. I'm having some trouble here with these phase ships. I still don't really know how the phase ships work. I've never used them and I haven't fought against them that much. They can go invisible and not take damage sometimes. Still not really quite sure how it works, but it seems that firing at them makes them explode anyway, and that's all you really need to know. So I'm doing what I want, and the AI is playing ball here as well. We saw there, like, there was the opportunity for the enemy to move into the center of our formation, but the AI automatically pulled some of my ships back and clustered them into a line. And you have to sort of get lucky with that, because it's not guaranteed to behave like that, but your order setup will influence it to do that sometimes, or to be more likely to do it. In particular, having lots of escort orders, because even giving an explicit escort order to a ship to escort another ship, it doesn't work like that in the game to be extra confusing. It's more like if a ship has been ordered to be escorted by another ship, it can also kind of give that order itself to other ships. So it's more like you're just giving the concept, like I want conceptually this ship to be escorted. While you can tell specific ships to do it, other ships might also just decide to do it and things like that. So. The AI is really dynamic, it's too dynamic, but the dynamic part is really good in that if you had perfect orders yourself and then the game adjusted, like it changed based on the situation using the dynamic part of the AI, that would be really cool. Like if the AI decided I need another escort to do the thing I'm about to do and it just pulled one from your reserves itself, that would be absolutely fine, that would be really good. I kind of like how it's working so far, but it's a bit too abstract, it doesn't tell you what it's trying to do enough, it doesn't listen to what you want it to do if you're trying to micromanage it enough, and it's all just because you're not supposed to be doing that, as I keep saying, and I'm just saying that to counter the quick excuse that people will make about my complaints here. Well, I'm imagining a better game as usual. So we go on to take the station that sent those counter invasions and we have an advantage in that station battle because the enemy had a few ships guarding the station. It makes your fleet tend to go out to the flanks much more so you avoid that problem where they bunch up just south of the station and it's hard to attack because they end up accidentally attacking from all sides which makes the station weak overall. You saw that me doing the tactical bombardment so that's the vanilla bombardment mechanic, you can do that to give you an advantage in Nexarellin's attacks, and then there's also a Nexarellin specific bombardment, which is that fire support thing you can see there at the top, and you can actually use the vanilla one in a certain way to get a real advantage in the Nexarellin combat, which we'll see later. Here's me starting another combat company. The game automatically, or the mod automatically, divides your forces and your inventory up into companies. And you can micromanage that to some extent, but it doesn't matter very much. So seems I decided I needed another company, so I was <laughs> dividing my forces up a bit more to do something or other. Once they're doing it, we wait. You can choose to have the AI to move your troops around so you don't have to go back every turn and give the orders yourself, and that will do a fine job. Soon we've taken the place. The inventories here are full of stuff, so we'll take loads of free things. And it's just nice because you can overload your inventory, which normally costs you loads, but it only costs you loads if time passes, and it doesn't pass in this menu. So if you immediately sell off your excess stock, you can get some stuff. And of course, we can utilize the fact here that because we're actually part of the Luddic Church, 
we don't have to pay a really steep tariff to sell into Ludic Church markets, which really opens up your options, and that matters because which market you sell to changes the rebellion chance on the planet, or the rebellion strength I should say, I forget how it works because I never really looked into it very much. There's something going on here that wasn't in vanilla, but the main point that I prefer is just that you have the choice at all. Like in vanilla you weren't quote unquote supposed to, there's that word again, sell into regular markets and that's why the tariffs were very high. Here you often have the option to sell to regular markets, which is nice because sometimes that actually matters and changes things mechanically a bit, or maybe you just want to be nice and not really heavily support the black market because it does make your faction get annoyed and start sending patrols after you. It can be fun to just play things straight even if you make less money, and even if the downside of selling to the black market isn't really large enough to justify not doing it. Sometimes you want to roleplay, and I like that Star Sector will sometimes, in its modded form at the very least, give you some roleplay options like that. After that capture, I rushed back to the northeast of the sector to take that planet I wanted to take earlier but gave up on, the one that was building a starbase. Now that starbase is finished, so I'm going to have to attack it before I can make my assault. And it seems to be a higher level starbase. The starbase has come in three flavors, and I never really paid attention to which one was which, but. When you build them yourself, you can see it. There's like a weak one, a medium one, and a powerful one. And then there's three themes of each one where it can be low-tech, mid-tech, and high-tech. I seem to remember somebody saying somewhere that high-tech is the best one, which is what Tritachion are using here. So anyway, we had trouble actually breaking down this station, and we lost a few ships trying to defeat it. That doesn't matter very much because really early on I took one of the upgrades in the skill tree that means that your ships that are piloted by officers can't die and I think it also means there's a high probability that all other ships can't die. That meaning if they get blown apart in combat it will count as them being damaged rather than destroyed so afterwards it will appear in the recovery menu. You have to spend some supplies to get them back but that's fine same with regular damage and that just undoes the downside of getting obliterated. I think though you can get demods by going through that system. There's a probability your ship will have a permanent problem, but I also have the skill that removes demods, so we're relatively free to lose ships in combat as long as we have a bit of time afterwards to get them back. After that we capture the planet easily enough. In terms of the ground combat for the rest of this campaign there's not going to be that much to say because I got to that point that I was trying to get to earlier where my ground attack force is so strong there's nothing that can stop me. I have tons of marines and tons of heavy armaments in my inventory, basically filling it up, which is bad because it means it's hard for me to salvage things. I'm always going to be going over the cargo limit, but just carrying around this massive army means that whenever I can take a planet, I can just do it instantly with no second thoughts. So boom, we've taken this world, and this world is close to our colony system. So this will now permanently be providing extra accessibility to all of my colonies. They'll export more, they'll have their supplies come in more, and generally will make more money, be more stable, and I can worry about them less. My home systems are still being attacked by pirates, which I know because here I came back to the home system and had to fight tons of corsairs to get back in, so that pirate alliance isn't going very well. But overall, things are pretty good. That access score, real high. I've got no debuffs active right now, so the pirates clearly weren't actually defeating my local transport fleets. Things are good, although this system does have a patrol base in it, so maybe that's why. Perhaps the other one is getting annihilated. The reason I came back was to refit, because I have this captured enemy Paragon battleship that was just using weapons I found in space. I have loads of weapons stored at my main planet, so I went back and sorted it out a bit. I also decided to go through and play with the S mods, the opposite of a D mod, this being a thing where you spend a story point to permanently install one of the optional upgrades which causes that upgrade to lose its cost, giving you extra quote-unquote ordinance points to install either another upgrade or to just increase the health or firing capacity of the ship. So there's a whole bunch of options here. In my experience most of them are usually not very useful, but there are a couple that I liked. I forget what I went for, but I remember going for the efficiency upgrade quite a few times. One that just reduces how many supplies a ship needs to be kept in your fleet. Which is nice, because I was a little bit worried about like going around with a big battle fleet, because if you end up not getting into a hard fight, then you've spent more money than you need to. It's that sort of mindset, again, trying to be as weak as possible while still winning. I don't really like that idea, so I'm trying to make it so I don't have to worry about it too much. Anyway. I next went after 
A planet called Hog, which had been flagged up on the intel screen as somewhere that Tritachion was trying to invade, and we arrive just as it's being invaded, so we can jump in and take part in this battle. This is a nice battle because it's one where you have an allied space station. I like these battles because the space station provides a sort of terrain item. Normally there's not much going on on these maps, but when there is something on the map to fight around, I don't know, it feels like there's more to think about. There's more possible strategies when there's like a point of interest on the map to be working with. So we do our thing. Looks like I have some kind of strategy going on here, but it's being hampered by the fact that one of my battleships is stuck behind the space station and can't fire at the enemy very well. Doesn't matter, because we've got our decent battleship from the 14th battle group doing its thing, and we obliterate that enemy paragon, their flagship, and with that, we win the fight. We have saved the Luddick Church here. This is a case where it's like they should reward me for doing this, but they don't really. They don't sort of recognize that you just save them from something bad happening and give you some money or something like that. They just give you the, the normal commission, which is a bit of money at least. I captured that Paragon and I think I just landed it at Hog and left it there because I don't have it in my fleet afterwards. I had something I wanted to urgently do that I didn't need that ship for, but on the way to do that, I was attacked by the Executors here. We are now at Vengeance level 2 with Tritachion, meaning they'll send more powerful fleets to hunt us down. This one didn't look too powerful, it had a ship I'd never seen before in it, this big battle cruiser, and I thought maybe that's going to be a problem, but the way the battle went wasn't so bad. You can see we got the enemy to kind of split into two groups, and now we can entirely focus on moving south, which will take out a whole bunch of enemy ships, and the other ones up north will then be near their retreat zone and will be in trouble, and I think they did just retreat after this. So we've got a really good tactical setup essentially. The only thing is that while I had this strategy in mind, and I, I was like, yes, here's the chance, go, 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 do it. Because it's hard to tell your fleet to just do it, and because you rely on them sort of wanting to do it, again, you feel a bit out of control. You can sense the strategic opportunities, but you can't always pounce on them in the way that you could if you had a bit tighter control over stuff. Once again, I'm just going to keep saying that over and over again because it's something that I think about in every single battle in this game. Anyway, we go on to fight another Executor fleet that was also in the system. This time it was back over at Hog. We actually lost our space station, or the Lodic Church space station, to that enemy battle cruiser, but we also took them out without much trouble. It seems that our 14th battle group thing just did the business. We're benefiting here from the double battle speed. It's sort of not quite obvious all the time, but we're running the battles at double speed, which just makes things go much more snappily, especially when you really know what you're doing and you don't need to sort of pay attention to what's happening like right here like sometimes you'll see me switching to the regular camera mode and like looking at, at the health bars of enemies and stuff to kind of work out how things are going if i'm really confident just slap it on double speed and let the ai do its thing which you can't do in vanilla and once you've done that one time you're like right i can't go back it's one of those things it's too good to be able to play the game like that here's me taking on one of the relatively rare missions where you can get paid massive amounts for taking specific planets within a time frame. So I'll do that next, but as I said, I had something I wanted to urgently do first, which I'm heading off to attend to. It can be done with an even greater sense of urgency by getting there quickly, by again using the fact that we're at four times speed here on the campaign map, so I can make these journeys real fast. Makes those uneventful journeys real snappy and kind of fun to control as well, because you can just zip around the storms as I did there. Anyway, where am I going? I'm going back to that original colony I set up, absolute nightmare, it's somewhere in the south of the map, just on its own, not really doing very much, it's a terrible colony, but I thought it's time for revenge. Tritachion have been holding on to my colony for a while. On the way to attack it though, we saw there was this special task group here. Some special task groups can be ordered to defend areas, so this one is just defending this planet against whatever might show up, and that includes me. However, we can try and do some shenanigans to get around this. I could just attack them, but I saw they had three paragons, and I was like, well, maybe they would actually defeat us. But we don't necessarily have to fight them, because if a fleet doesn't have a ground army component, which I think just means if it doesn't have invasion fleet in the name, then if I take the planet, these ships will just be stuck here, they can't do anything about it. So all I need to do is not engage their fleet and touch Absolute Nightmare, then I can drop my inventory of troops and run away and the troops will just capture the planet for me. So that's what I'm doing here, I'm sitting around in go dark mode that I think halves the distance at which the enemy will notice you and that's what those weird pulses on the screen mean. I really like that pulsing UI element where it's like them scanning you and it changes based on how visible you are, how far away those pulses are like in your view. 
It's just a really nice way of getting around the complexity of how sensor range and sensible range inter interact. Like, ships have a range for how far they can see things, but the things they can see also have a resistance to being seen, which means you can see certain things only when they're really close to you. And this sort of pulsing thing <laughs> is a great way of communicating all that, unlike my words right now. There's something really good happening there in the UI, so I just thought I'd point that out. Anyway, in terms of the strategy, the plan worked out. I was able to land without the enemy attacking me. The troops captured the planet, and that's that done. So now I can just leave if I want to, because we don't really need to do anything here. I think possibly the special task group will just despawn after a while. I think they only exist for a certain amount of time. We are now over our colony limit right now, and of course this colony is terrible. It's costing us a huge amount of money. I can't remember what I did about that. Making it an autonomous planet would be the optimal thing to do. This would mean I don't have to pay for it and would maybe even make a bit of money for it, but it still remains as part of our faction and we can use it as a base. What I actually decided to do is, well, quick save and then just go in for the battle anyway. I probably wanted to do the battle because I was having a good time fighting these big enemy fleets, so I wasn't confident that I could do it and I don't need to do it anymore, but after all those shenanigans to avoid combat, I just thought, oh, let's just dive in and do it anyway, it seems. So there you go. Clearly something's going well because I ordinarily wouldn't have bothered to do this. And things do go well, because the enemy's paragons are out of position, two of them weren't in range once the two sides clashed, so we take out one by just focusing it down. And now we're in business, we'll move down the line, obliterating them. I'm again trying to use some kind of tactics here. I got into trying to use capture points to influence orders, so like, fighting in front of a capture point makes your ships always kind of like be like looking over their shoulder and not moving too far away from the capture point because they want to defend it or they want to retake it if the enemy take it. And this allows you to have some kind of handle on what your fleet will do, in that if you know they can't move too far away from a certain position, they'll tend to form lines, like at the extremity of where the AI wants to go, or how far away from that position the AI is willing to go. Meaning your fleet is more likely to be in a formation, basically, which is the thing you want, the big control you don't have, because formation makes such a big difference to your combat performance. You have to do anything you can to somehow cause an effective formation to come about. And it's happening right here. We've got our two battleships attacking their one side by side. Absolutely perfect. Just what we like to see. Although that carrier is out of position, getting absolutely obliterated in front of our much more powerful battleship shields, which are more suitable for taking the enemy's fire. It all works out, and again, I don't want to talk too much about the battles in the rest of this commentary. There are all kinds of considerations to make, and a lot of the time it's just sort of looking at what's happening, being frustrated, and screaming at your ships to do what you want. And over time, you get used to the, the rules by which your ships are deciding what to do for you, and you kind of start to get a sense for like, yes, if I give this combination of orders, the thing that I want will maybe happen. And using the capture points came to be something that I tended to do more and more after in my first playthrough, kind of not really using them because I didn't like how they wrested control away from you and constantly had your ships like going back to recapture them when I didn't want them to or at unopportune moments, something like that. Anyway, we did the business, we took out that fleet for no reason. For entertainment purposes, I'm literally playing a game. I did something for fun, I had the fun, and that was good, wasn't it? With our colony re-secured, I took all of the ships that I landed at Hog earlier, so we've got our full fleet available here, to go and do that contract we took on, to take a certain planet, and it's here somewhere in the core. And we're going to spend some time just rampaging around the core while we're here. This system has two Tritachion targets for us to go after. The more distant one needs to come first, because that's the one with the contract on it, and there is a time limit. On the way there, the Persian League was coming at me, and I was like, oh no, did we get declared war upon by the Persian League while I wasn't paying attention? This is one thing that sort of kept happening throughout the campaign. I kept forgetting who we're at war with, because it's sort of hidden in a menu somewhere, and it's easy to miss the declarations going past. Luckily, we're not actually at war with them. They were just harassing me over the transponder, as usual. However, on that topic, once I arrived at the Tritachion target, it was telling me we're not hostile to them, so I really did miss some diplomatic action. We got a peace treaty with Tritachion while I was making the journey. And that's a big problem for me, because it doesn't cancel the mission to take their territory, even though we're at peace now. So I'm missing out on 750,000 credits right here if the war's over. So I was like, no, 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 we can't be at peace. There's been an outbreak of peace in the galaxy, and now there's nobody for us to kill for money. That's not right. So I thought, well, what do we do about this? The answer is just attack them anyway. I wasn't quite sure what this would do. 
because to some extent you as the player are your own faction, but because I'm also commissioned by another faction, I'm sort of part of the Ludic Church as well. So I wanted to see, would it be like just the explosion in Joyous Faction has declared war on Tritachion, or would it be the church as a whole? And the answer is the church as a whole. So we've restarted the war. I don't think there's any downside to forcing a war or breaking a peace treaty or anything like that. So that's all good for us. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole diplomacy system that you can get involved in. Somebody recommended that I don't. And to be honest, I don't even know where it is in the game. I've seen it like mentioned here and there in the game, but I don't know where the UI for it is. <laughs> Same with the hostile activity thing. There's systems in the game which are so hidden from me, I couldn't even find them if I sat down and tried to find them. And indeed I have done. So that's good, isn't it? There's something going on with the user experience. And this time it's a mod feature I have to complain about for this. Anyway, we take out an enemy star base, one of the max level defensive structures. It cost me basically half the fleet, but again, we just get the fleet back by spending some supplies, so that's handy. And the thing we killed dropped some supplies, so overall, it's fine. I land my troops and start taking the planet. There's actually a problem here that I didn't really catch on to for a while. When you have a mission to take a planet, the reward for the mission is based on the current production of the planet. That means when you invade, if you do what I do, which is bombard everything first and just be liberal about doing ground support fire from space, the planet's value is going down because it disrupts production for a while. It gets all these debuffs attached to it that take a couple of months to go away. So by the time we're going to capture this planet, it's going to be like really unvaluable. And that reward went down from something like 750,000 to like 300,000 over the course of this invasion. You might have seen just a second ago, it was down to 400 and something thousand at this stage. So that was a shame. I guess it doesn't matter that much because we're okay for money. I can do nothing and get money if I want. And I'm just making a profit overall doing my gameplay activities, which is the one thing I was trying to do in this entire campaign. So we've got there. I can play the game as I want and it's profitable for me. But we missed out on 400,000 credits by not taking this place more intact, which I think I could have done. Now after that, with the time limit stuff out of the way, I went over to the Prism Freeport because I need to refit the ships I've been capturing from Tritachion, those Paragons, and try to give them good weapons. Again, I'm still not completely sure like what good weapons even are. I'm confused because I've been given various like kinds of advice by different people. And my ultimate answer is I just say autofit, which I think is the thing people were saying, like the one thing everyone was saying, don't do, don't autofit. Well, I'm sorry, everyone. I just autofit anyway. I think autofitting at the prism station is a good idea. Because there is good stuff available, you'll probably get a good setup, even if you don't really know the difference between the weapons, as I do. I made some effort in this campaign to learn it. It's not easy enough. It's not fun enough. That's all I can say about that, really. I don't know how the weapon system works in detail, and that in itself is a comment. If I was supposed to know, something needed to happen there, because I just didn't want to. It wasn't enjoyable. Anyway, we go on to just start conquering more stuff now, and here's another example of the weird ball up thing as I'm trying to attack this station. You can get around it by cancelling all of your orders, but you see me there instantly uncancelling all of my orders, cancelling the cancel, because if you just let the ships do what they want, they're gonna attack in a weird formation, like the faster ships will go out in front and get focused down by the starbase's defences. So you have to be careful with this stuff, but, well, our ships are being too careful, they're just not doing anything. The ultimate solution to this situation is to use the fact that you can switch your personal command ship. You can jump between ships and control them manually. So I started doing that to control each one manually a bit, to make them move apart from each other, and then jump over to another one and do the same thing. And over time, we managed to get a forward trend in the formation. You can see how many waypoints I put down as well, trying to get the AI to think about moving to places other than where they were. It works in the end, but it's real weird and frustrating. I don't know what's going on with that. Here was me discovering another way to deal with the hostile activity system. And this was something I'd seen somebody mention online. There's a certain pirate station that isn't randomly generated, that's always somewhere on the map, the Cantor station. You can go there and do something similar to what I did earlier, where you talk to the randomly generated pirate boss. But this time it's like a pre-written talk to the pirate boss scene, so it's a bit different. The mechanical aspect is the same, in that you are allying yourself to the pirates. You can use a story point to basically get it for free. You just say you'll owe them a favor 
and I'm guessing that never gets called in or something. Like, it would be cool if you had to do something at some point about that, but I guess if you do, then it didn't happen to me. We got this for free, and it's another thing where you get a big reduction in hostile activity, and then a constant reduction after that. So, we don't need it at this stage because I already had it from the randomly generated pirates, but now the official, like, pirate faction also is on our side. Again, I guess that solves the problem by just taking us back to how things were before the problem was, was introduced, but... I had to do something that I wouldn't necessarily want to do to achieve that. I don't want to have to ally to the pirates to deal with that mechanic. I've also, as I said, removed all of the tech from my colonies, and I never bothered to put it back. So we're doing everything we can to play in line with what the hostile activity system is sort of pushing us towards. But I don't like it. I'm just playing less of the game and doing stuff I didn't want to do in the game as a result, and I don't think the game's any better for it. Again, I'm just going to say, can we just get that mechanic and just throw it out or make it optional or something like that? Here's another attack against the Tritachion station, and on the left you can see I was doing something with some transport ships. This is because there's this electronic warfare score your fleet has, and I started realizing I could use this to do something. If you deploy a bunch of random transports and hide them in the corner, you can have the transports modded so that they increase your electronic warfare score. Again, it's something where it doesn't tell you what this does, at least it doesn't tell you at the place where it does something, which is right here. I think we've got some number somewhere that is increasing the range and attack power of all of our ships based on the so-called electronic warfare score, and deploying a bunch of transports makes this go up by an unspecified amount because they're modded in such a way. Something something something, we've got a new big brained strategy which is deploying non-combat ships and hiding them in the corner, which legitimately does increase your combat capability for some reason. Just another thing where there is a mechanic going on but it's not communicated well enough that I got until you know, 2.7 playthroughs of the game before I even discovered that mechanic. I don't think it does anything too significant, but maybe it should, or at least it should be communicated a bit better. It's one of these things where, because in this playthrough, I, I'm doing what I don't normally do, which is like look at the forums and look at walkthroughs, and other people haven't mentioned this. It's like, I wonder what percentage of the player base even knows about that mechanic. Like, that's probably a problem for the game. Now we've just taken a random Tritachion colony that's way out in the bottom left-hand corner of the map, because Tritachion are starting to run out of systems at this stage. We've almost defeated them, and I decided to make this my general campaign objective. Yes, we've already lost the campaign, technically, but we're fighting back, and my strategy was just to kill Tritachion specifically, since they've offended me in this campaign. And strategically speaking, we want the Ludic Church to gradually conquer the weaker factions, to have any chance of in the future being able to go up against the Persian League, which will be the ultimate goal. So I'm just working out where the last Tritachion places are. They are trying to invade my colonies at the same time, but we can sneak on over because we might as well go there and stop the invasion fleet so that we can kill the place that spawned the invasion fleet. So really they shouldn't be poking me at this stage, they need to try and hide as much as possible. Doing these invasions just puts their systems even more on my map, my second map, because there are several maps in the game. That was something that I was thinking about while playing actually. There's a thing where there's like multiple kinds of map that show different information on them, and what the game lacks is one map that shows all the information, and I hated that because I was constantly switching back between this kind of map, the like intel map, and the navigation map, which is the same map, it just doesn't have the intel on it. Well, it's this map right here on the screen. I would love it if on this map, which is where you actually interact with the game, it told you where your quest locations were. For some reason you open up another map from the map screen to look at where the quest locations are. I don't know why that is. It feels like it's some sort of gigantic oversight where like systems were developed in parallel and never will merge together at some point. I'm guessing it's okay, because nobody really minds about that. I'm probably the only person who cares, but I cared a decent amount, and I just remembered to mention it. One of those little things that just sort of happened throughout the campaign where it contributes to an overall sense of frustration a little bit, but not that much. But if you were trying to really optimize the game, you'd probably combine those maps together. At this stage in the game's development, it's too late to do that. It would be too annoying, too costly, too, like, bug-causing to bother doing that now. But Star Sector 2 should have one map, I think. I was lying earlier about going to stop the invasions at their source, because I did it the hard way for whatever reason, I decided to go to the planets being invaded and stop them. Here's the first one at Absolute Nightmare once again, only a quote unquote small invasion fleet, so nice of Tritachion to not invade us too hard. We ought to resolve the fleet, but they'd already landed their troops here, so the ground battle is ongoing. And now we have to try and get into it ourselves. It says something here in the intel screen warning me that there is a deployed invasion force. What I wanted to know is, what do I do about that? Because the ground battle menu 
is behind the hostile action menu. And you can't open the hostile action menu on one of your own planets, so if somebody else is attacking your planet, I thought you couldn't open the screen and do anything about it, but you can actually find this somewhere in the intel screen, which is also where the hostile activity thing is hidden somewhere, in one of the like 17 intel menus. There's another one which shows you what's happening on your planet in terms of ground invasions, and you can say, I want to join the ground invasion on our side and try Tachyon get mad at you for trying to do that. What I thought that might do is unlock the ability for me to come into the planet menu and go into the ground battle system like before, but it's more like you just have to do it separately through the intel screen. Where things are a bit different, it doesn't automatically deploy your troops into companies and you have fewer movement points available, there's some kind of slightly different ground battle system for supporting existing battles versus starting a battle yourself, where the numbers and the UI are a little bit different. Some things going on there, but at least it does have the consideration for that scenario being covered. So I was able to do what I needed there. Now I need to go back to my main colony system. On the way I was considering stopping at the two Tritachion colonies that are between me and my home system. I didn't stop there because I didn't have time. I rushed back to fight this invasion force and arrived just in time to kill them. Once again we can just auto resolve them so that's very kind of the game. I'm guessing there is some system where the Nexarellian mechanics will decide how strong an invasion fleet will be, and because Tritachion are half dead as a faction, maybe they just can't invade us very hard, so that's all very nice. As for our colony system, if you were wondering how it's going, well it's fine, it doesn't matter anymore at this stage, there's not that much for me to do, because we're playing by the rules of hostile activity, I'm not really using AI cores and upgrade items, and here's some footage of me actually doing that, I was adding a couple more AI cores and installing things, because... I wanted to, I guess, and because we have that double pirate protection, maybe it doesn't matter so much if the Ludic Church hates us, or the Ludic Path hates us, whoever it is that comes after you if you install the items. Just a shame, because there was this kind of puzzle aspect, where you'd get different items that upgrade different buildings under different circumstances, and you'd have to arrange them across your colonies to get the most out of them. But now the meta is, don't use any of them. So in many ways, like, you've just lost something in the game. Here's me actually using one example of one thing I was just talking about, the Corrupted Nanoforge, which I have three of for some reason. This is an upgrade that, which applies to your ship production, sort of quote-unquote ship production. So I can make this planet, the better sand factory, have better ship production were it to be producing ships. So if you put a patrol base here, it would spawn slightly better patrols. Or if you were to order it to make ships for you, which you can do, but I didn't do throughout this entire campaign, I think it would make them faster or better in some way. You can have your colony system build you ships rather than capturing them or buying them. But I never needed to do it, I guess, so I didn't. Although I did have some nice designs to use, I just never really got into doing it. I think that's a mechanic that would really suit a sort of alternate version of Star Sector, where you can deploy other fleets, have fleets that aren't yours doing stuff. The ability to make fleets at your home systems would be much more useful. For me, I didn't use it in either of the big full game playthroughs of this game I've done so far. Now, I was going to go and trade with Hegemony, I think, but along the way, we started a war with the Persian League, or a war was started, and I'm immediately diverting my course to go and fight them because they do have a colony that's near mine, so getting rid of that will remove any access debuffs from this war. Also in that system was one of these cryosleeper locations defended by an AI mothership. This is a slightly different kind of AI encounter where a single powerful ship tries to stop you from taking a point of interest. It's supposed to be quite hard, but because we had tons of stuff, we have our full battle fleet here basically, we just overwhelm it and take it down. The problem is, I don't think I can get the reward from this scenario. The idea is you take these cryosleep locations, which occasionally spawn on the map, because they add to your population growth in your colonies, but only within a certain distance it seems. We have to be within 10 light years. There's no like ruler on the map, so I don't know if we are within 10 light years, but I'm guessing we're not. And the reason I guess we're not is because I'm not really being given an option to do anything with this. I'm here in the menu thinking like, right, we've got these people. Yes, yeah, send them to the colony. I don't care. Like, just do it. Because we only have the option to do nothing. I suppose that means we can't do anything. Again, that's a UX issue. You probably can do something with that, but it's just not obvious enough. So it looks like you can't. And so I walk away, not even bothering to fight those automated defenses. I don't care about that survey ship. We don't need whatever it's going to drop at this stage, because as I said, you're not really quote unquote allowed to use the stuff you get from those drops, because then the Ludic path will come and kill you. And it's not worth the hassle. 
Instead, let's just go and kill the Persian League. It's lucky we're playing Nexarellin, because if I wasn't in Nexarellin, there would be actually nothing for me to do at this stage. Like, I wouldn't be able to do this either. So we do take this planet easily enough. That's going to sort out the access issues. And of course, it's another blow against the Persian League, who are the number one faction in the sector. We'll want to do something about them along the way, but first I thought, let's kill Tritachion some more. I'm just going to keep hitting them while they're down. In particular, they had two colonies in the same system, the ones I was considering attacking earlier, that are kind of near us, so I thought, let's get rid of them. Here I am, caught in 4K, trying to work out like what the stats of space stations even are. I was kind of looking at this thing, thinking, we've had trouble fighting space stations in this campaign so far. I was trying to work out, is there like a strategy or some knowledge I can get to do something differently? I don't really think there is, because the one big thing that like the stats menus on ships don't talk about is their weapons, which of course makes a huge difference. You can't see what weapons the enemy are bringing and like think, I'll deploy this ship in response to the fact they've brought a ship equipped in this way. It's the kind of thing where it would almost be normal for them to have done that, and it's a bit strange that they don't do that. It doesn't gel well with the idea that you have to pick what ships to deploy if there's not that much decision-making involved. And having mechanics based around, like, improving your intel gathering so you can see what the enemy fleet is going to deploy and what weapons they have and react to it could potentially be an interesting sort of thing to do. Or at least I think it would justify the game being as it is right now. It would justify some of the limitations a bit more if there was some more sort of fun decision making to be had around it. And it's less about trying to be as weak as possible and still win that thing that I don't really like. Now in this battle against the space station, you can see the problem starting to happen. Our ships are drifting together and away from the enemy. They're starting to go into the ball. And again, what's causing this? I just don't know. You'll see me here giving some frantic orders, being like, please don't do this. Like, just do anything else. Like, don't go and sit back at the deployment zone. It's one of these things where I look back on it and think, ha ha ha, how silly. But this is like a game-breaking bug, to be honest. Like, the fact the game doesn't give you that much control over your fleet is actually a really big issue in Star Sector from start to finish. I'm sort of looking at it in an optimistic kind of way, like, I guess I don't mind it now that I've forced myself to like it, but like, I never would have played this game if I wasn't just here to talk about it online. I think these are crippling flaws in the game. And it's weird that this happened so much in my second campaign, I don't remember that problem specifically in my first campaign, but just the general not having control, just in all circumstances, continues to be a problem in my own opinion, and of course not in the developer's opinion. We eventually do get the business done, and then when it comes to attacking the planet, that's going to be the easy part. Essentially, we can only be stopped in space because our ground army is really powerful. So it's just like, can a space station be max leveled up or have some defending ships and get to the point when it can stop us from taking it? That's the only thing standing in our way, so we can't quite do anything we want, but we're close. And in this case, we do take the two Tritachion colonies here, including one which is a nice habitable world, which is in a great position as well. I would have loved to have discovered this one first and made it the basis of my colony system because it's near the core. Well, anyway, we do the business, we get the reward. The reward wasn't that much in this case. It's very variable how much cash you make from taking a planet because you get some stuff and that stuff might be worth a lot, it might not be, because it's also being affected by the fact that if you take something from a planet and just sell it right back to them, which is what I tend to do to keep my cargo space free, you're probably getting a bad deal because you're selling them something that they have a really low market demand for because they produce it already. Well, I'm just doing that anyway, just to be quick. We don't really need the money at this stage. We're fine for money. We go on into the core. First, I'm going to dock with Hegemony to get some more supplies. I'm in the core here, not actually to go after Tritachion this time, but to attack the Persian League, because I thought, it's time to start turning this thing around. I need to kill the Persian League, at least to the point when they're not winning the campaign anymore, so that I can justify saying that I've won the campaign. We're starting to think about the end game here. So we go on to attack Sphinx, one of the big planets in the bottom right-hand corner of the core. And while attacking this place, I discovered the secret technique for using the ground battle system more effectively. You can use your orbital bombardment system from vanilla to do something at, against ground targets in the ground battle system. But it works differently depending on what order you do things in. So normally, I bombard, then invade. But if you start invading, then quit that menu, go back into the bombardment menu, and then do the bombardment, it changes the numbers on the ground quite a lot. You can see here, we killed like most of the Persian League's army with our ground attack. But that wouldn't have happened if I did the bombardment before opening the menu. This feels like an exploit. I don't know, don't know how like intentional this is supposed to be. 
but there's clearly some sort of mechanical consideration where troops garrisoned in the places your bombardment is supposed to be attacking will be killed, but only if you sort of spawned those troops first by opening the menu to look at what's there. So you just have to do things in a slightly unintuitive order that's a bit harder in the menuing. Nexarelin, more like bad UXarelin, that could be fixed, or maybe it's not supposed to be like that at all. Feels like an exploit, but essentially from this point onward, I'm going to be doing that to just wipe out like a thousand points worth of enemy troops on every planet before I invade it, making it even easier to win the ground battles. We're absolutely fine for ground battles, as long as we have the fuel to do it. It does cost money and fuel to do that technique, but I'm just going to like buy and steal all the fuel I need as we go around, so that's fine. As I was moving around in the core, the Persian League sent this special task group after me. Unfortunately, we have to fight them in hyperspace, which is like a weird little thing that I hated to do and I've avoided it mostly so far in this campaign. Fights in hyperspace are exactly the same, but with one difference, you can't double salvage them. And I don't know why that is, it really feels like an oversight to me. Like, the way the salvage system works is that you can salvage up to a certain amount and then it overflows to the second salvage if the salvage has too much mass, too much value in it or something. And that can overflow to a third one if there's loads of drops from combat as well. So there's a certain amount you can salvage per round. In hyperspace, you can only do one round of salvage and it doesn't let you do the other ones. And this feels inconsistent, it should either be zero or all of them. In fact, what I really want is for hyperspace battles to be completely different. I would love it if in hyperspace these maps just weren't the same as in normal space, like there was stuff here. I just really want there to be stuff on the maps because they're too blank and empty in my opinion. For example, if in hyperspace battles there was like the slip streams, like pushing ships around, or like just something really, would be cool. And that might justify being able to say, right, you're not allowed to salvage hyperspace battles because they're too crazy and chaotic. The fact it lets you salvage it once but not twice is annoying in a fight like this where there'll certainly be a double salvage opportunity. And we've missed it because I didn't like go into normal space and make them pursue me in to fight me there just to get more loot. A minor consideration really, but something to think about if we are trying to make Star Sector absolutely perfect, which of course we are, that is our life goal, I think we've all decided. In this battle you can see I'm very concerned about this group I've got down at the bottom of the screen. I need them to fly all the way to the right and then up to go into the back of my main formation. But we have to wrangle, we have to pray that they're going to do that. The way we can do it is we've got them guarding quote unquote this position down here and I can order those ships to then try and capture the position over on the other side of the map. This will allow me to try and move part of the other formation down to intercept the large ship pursuing that other group. So there's some kind of tactical considerations going on there, where a lot of the time the main tactic you want to employ is don't have your ships be in really weird positions. An eternal battle, but it is one that can be won sometimes. Here I am invading some more Persian League space towards the bottom of the core, and there's more of this like really audacious action from the Persian League where they keep sending these tiny fleets to try and get you to turn your transponder on, and if you say no, they just try to challenge you to a fight. Do you even know like what this fleet you're attacking is? So we get a ton of free victories against the Persian League once again, and they do not stop us from going on to attack their space station. They had a low level space station right here, so that's just going to die instantly and we will take the planet. While I was taking the planet, there's this strike force looking for me over there. For some reason, they don't look for me at the planet I'm invading. They're just sort of wandering around nearby. I'm guessing the other fleets don't like share intel. It doesn't have that kind of AI. So even though the Persian League can see that I'm here, like that other ship can't receive information about that. So they couldn't find me and we were able to successfully capture that planet very cheekily. Then we can just ignore the strike force because it will probably despawn. Our business is done. Here's a look at the map. What I was thinking of doing is conquering generally from right to left so that we're conquering stuff nearer to our colonies to get more economic benefit from it. The other consideration is because of this counter invasion system. If you're going to invade a system that has more than one colony from the same faction, you need to commit to doing them all at the same time. That's perfectly doable because we have enough troops to take multiple planets simultaneously if we want to, but just something to keep in mind. And we can also attack places where the Ludic Church has a foothold. Also, if I ever spotted a Tritachion colony like right there at Hybrasil, then they're going to be in trouble because I'm still hoping to completely conquer Tritachion. The only thing holding me back is I didn't know where all of their colonies were because I couldn't be bothered to mouse over every star to actually find where they were. 
you can do something on the map to show only systems, or to name only systems that have some colonies in them, which makes that much faster, but I still couldn't be bothered to do it. We'll get them eventually. Here's a battle against one of the max level starbases, the low tech max level starbase. I like these ones the best, these are my favourite fights in the game overall, the max level starbases, because you break pieces off them as you gradually hack them to death, and that's just a cool mechanic. If you saw my Avorian video, you might know I'm into breaking pieces off things for some reason. And here you can do it in Star Sector sometimes, you can break certain modules off of the star stations to make them weaker in combat as you hack your way through to the core and then blow it up. And there are many explosions, and we are the explosion enjoyers. So yes, we took down a station. The station battles when a station like is the planet on the map are a bit weird because you blow up the station and then you talk to the station and invade it and also take it over with infantry. Just one of those things, like what happens in the battles is an abstraction, even ships that are destroyed in battle are still alive on the campaign map for reasons. So we take this place and we saw me there using the trick, go into the menu, go out, bomb the place, go back in. For some reason, even though all of the icons saying the enemy troops are still there will be there, the actual troop strength will be zero and you take the place easily. Here's me really trying to get some cash, I guess. I don't know if I'm feeling poor. I'm going and taking all the things that were blown up near the station and dragging them back in to sell. Normally you can't do that because you don't have enough cargo capacity, but when they're quite near stations, you can quickly go back and forth and only take a small penalty. So we sold tons of metal to the people we just occupied and killed, and they loved it. Now I'm thinking of heading over to the west part of the core sector, core of the sector, because there's plenty of Persian League over there, that's where they're most strong, but there was this one system where they only had one planet, and there was also a Ludic Path planet, so I thought that's a nice sort of little toehold to get to the west end of the map. Let's go take this random place. On the way, there's another battle, we win it relatively easily, there's some representative footage, and now we start taking this place. Of course, there were also millions of battles against Persian League patrols that I'm cutting out, where they constantly suicide against me. It's just sort of weird, it's kind of funny at, one, at some point, because they just keep giving you resources by killing themselves against you and giving you experience points as well, which leads me into doing this. I decided to finally bother to level up all of my officers. Some of them I got at max level, so I didn't need to do this, but in other cases, I've been leveling officers up throughout the campaign, and I just never bothered to give them perks because I didn't think about it or just never went in the menu where you do it, basically. I'm going to finally do it, and my overall perk strategy is to not pay too much attention to it, as you might guess. What you might want to do is give them perks with a certain ship of yours in mind, trying to make them good at using what weapons one ship has. Although I don't like being locked into one ship having a design to suit its officer. So I'm not a huge fan of doing that, and I broadly didn't really match up the perks to what the ships do. I just picked the, the most general perks possible. Here's a look at my perks as the player character. As you can see, we've mainly taken the green and yellow ones, which are the things the other officers can't get that I was talking about earlier, so they're extra special, and you should probably take them in the meta, and you probably shouldn't take the red ones in the meta, at least as far as I can tell. We do have the max level at 25 in this mod, so it's more justifiable to take the combat perks, although I still didn't because I just took all of the passive perks that are fleet-based, even the ones I didn't really need. To optimize our combat potential, the potential strength of our fleet, but I'm not using all of that potential as usual. You don't really need to either, so I don't know why I'm really bringing that up. It's fine to not use your potential, it's just that people had complained about it before. Yes, this fleet could be better if I could be bothered to make it better. Does it need to be? Probably not, and it's time to put that to the test right here. I decided to go right into the Persian League's capital system, if you want to call it that, their sort of core system, Western S, and just see if I could cause chaos and whether they would stop me, really. Of course, their first move to try and stop me is to send a suicide attack in, as usual. That doesn't work. I then attacked a planet which was defended by a space station, but for some reason, I don't have to fight it. Normally, you have to blow up a space station before it lets you do a ground invasion. Maybe it was being upgraded or repaired or something, so there was some reason to not have to fight it. Or sometimes it occasionally says, like, the defensive force is too weak and they won't stop you from invading or something like that. Maybe that's what was happening. Essentially, we took this random planet, it was very poorly defended, so we already got that toehold in the Persian League's very core sector. The problem was, taking it triggered some sort of revenge attack. It looks like they're going to move from somewhere in the east of the core over to my colonies with an invasion fleet. Seeing that, that really did throw me off my attack their core move. That's the right move from the Persian League, just do that. 
The downside to this plan is it makes me go over there and take this planet. So they still lose a planet, they sacrifice a planet on the east side of the core to preserve their planets on the west side of the core. Probably a good move from the Persian League, but it's not really going to help them in the long run. So I went to deal with that. There was some more stuff to take in that system, so I just kept fighting. Here's my favorite station design of all of them in the game. I'm going to claim that all of them are my favorites throughout this video. This is my real favorite, the fully upgraded midline one. I like the midline space stations because they have this like gimmick where one side is strong and one side is weak and they rotate quite quickly in combat. So there's something going on there. There's a bit more consideration than in normal space station battles, which I enjoyed. Soon, that station belongs to the Ludic Church, and we've secured another system somewhere on the other side of the Star Sector, the place where I was going to fight first, as I said earlier, but at some point I started just sort of marauding around. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second, actually. First, we've got Tritachion back at it again, and this is a mistake from Tritachion. They decide they're going to do a saturation bombardment of my absolute nightmare planet. First, I don't care, so like it would be fine if they did that. Second, all they've done is put themselves on my radar. They've shown me again where their colony is on the intel screen. So we go over there, we're going to stop the bombardment, and we're going to take Tritachion's final planet in the core. They do still have a colony or two somewhere, so this won't destroy them as a faction. But they'll be out of the prestigious area of the galaxy, I guess. They've lost all of their core territory, or they will lose it after I do this wrangling battle. We saw me there trying to do some orders to <laughs> surround their space station. Didn't really work. I was trying something there. But soon enough, we've captured this place. We are getting all the metal from space and throwing it back down to the surface for money. And that's that taken care of. I don't remember if overall I was making or losing money because over the last few shots my bank balance has been going up and down. I think it's because I was very liberally buying fuel and supplies all the time so that I could be very liberal about my ground invasions. This next one, which was a place in the same system as that Tritachion planet, was the most heavily defended planet I found in the campaign. For some reason I couldn't bombard it, and it was absolutely packed with enemy troops. And as we saw there, I didn't even show you me fighting it. That's how easy it was to kill them. So there's a balancing concern. What I thought I'd do is start complaining about the balancing in Nexa Relin. I thought that could be fun. Because it does have some problems introduced through its new mechanics. So it's not like a perfect add-on in any way, and really the problems are just balancing, I would say. So again, the easiest things to solve, the same kind of category of problems that are in the base game as well, and Nexarellin does solve many of those problems with the base game, or I should say, the mod suite I have solves them. I'm not, it's not just Nexarellin, it's easy for me to forget about that. I've got like 20 mods installed, Nexarellin is the main one, but actually probably the biggest things changing the balance are that mission range thing that I just did myself in the game files, things like that. So I'm probably being too nice to Nexarellin here because I forgot what features are actually in it. The point I wanted to make is that ground combat is too easy, like just having an inventory full of troops is always going to make your army bigger than like the army that's supposed to be defending an entire planet which doesn't necessarily make sense if you choose to think about it. And really, you're not supposed to think about these sorts of things in Star Sector. Like, planets are supposed to be thought of as towns rather than planets because it's based on games where that was the case. So if you think about it like that, yes, maybe an invading fleet could have more troops in it than a town might have defending it, and then it makes sense. But in terms of game balance, there's no challenge at all to taking planets in the ground battle system. So while I like the ground battle system, you don't have to use it very much. And I wonder if it needs to become more complicated or more difficult in some way. Or potentially, if you want to do the really like easy balancing change, just make troops really expensive or something like that, because I think they're still balanced as they were in vanilla, where you can just get them everywhere. They're pretty cheap to just have in your fleet, not doing anything. Because in vanilla, getting troops wasn't very useful. You could do little invasions that had no long-term consequences, and it was kind of like a side mechanic that you could easily go the whole game without ever actually using. Now, because it's like at the core of the game, like winning the game requires you to use these things, maybe they need a rebalance because of that. And the other balancing thing I wanted to mention is, well, something like what you see happening here. The Persian League came at us with another patrol, probably the millionth one they've thrown at me, and sometimes you can't auto-resolve them. And it's getting to the point where we need to talk about like repetition and tedium once again. That's like 
for me, the big problem I've seen other people complain about in Star Sector. I feel like I have my own like personal suite of complaints that aren't that commonly held about Star Sector. But when other people complain about it, they say that it's slow and repetitive, and I would agree with that. And here in Nexarellan, we're starting to get the same effect, where because you have to take loads of planets, you have to fight loads of space stations, you have to fight loads of ground battles and loads of spaceships, loads of space fleets, you do the same thing a lot of times. And while like it's going to be slightly different every time, the battles are different, there's not enough going on. Like, the battle system isn't deep enough to like just keep doing it as part of the game. There's not enough interest, I think. I think auto-resolves need to be more generously provided to the player, or have something where like once you've auto-resolved or won a bunch of fights, it starts to be more generous and just be like, okay, even if we think this is a balanced engagement, you always win this fight, so let's just say you don't have to do it. That's a very like advanced consideration that virtually no game would ever make. You know what, I think Godless Tactics, one of the best strategy games of all time, does do something like that, I think. But we got to the stage, or I got to the stage in this late game, when, while I was just here for the combat, I enjoyed the combat in Star Sector, or at least this kind of combat, like the RTS style, when you have loads of ships to play with and loads of orders because you've maxed out the orders build. I liked this, but not enough to carry the game through the endgame of Nexarellin. That's what I found, and that's the key thing, the key complaint I'm trying to make here. There's not enough to Nexarellin to justify how long it takes to do that part of the game. Unless, like, maybe it started earlier in the progression, like maybe if the AI fleets were just weaker, so you could start playing the Nexarellin stuff earlier in your campaign, and you'd get through it faster, maybe something like that would be the solution. But just having to fight like 30 planets worth of stuff, which is what I ultimately had to do to win the campaign from where I was when I started really focusing on the campaign, it was too much stuff to do that is just the same stuff over and over again. Partially, this is my own choice. Like I could stop invading the planets and just sort of think about doing something else. It's just that I've already done everything else. Like we've more than completed the vanilla portion of the game. I've explored every single place on the map. There are a couple of vanilla quests I could do, but I don't need to do them, like they wouldn't do anything in this context anymore. At this stage, we've more than finished the game, I'm just looking to finish Nexarellin, but playing the Nexarellin content continuously got boring. Which is why, as you might have noted, I keep saying, or kept saying in this commentary, I'm going to conquer from right to left, or something like that. And I eventually just gave up on the idea of actually conquering, like, pockets of territory. The idea of taking a whole bunch of planets right next to each other, got too boring, I guess, because I realised that it would just happen inevitably. There's not enough going on with the interplay between space battles and ground battles to make it really interesting to go and see what would happen this time you attack a planet. Basically, this time you attack, you will fight a space station, you will win, doesn't matter if you take casualties, you'll win the ground battle, instantly repair for free, or well, not for free, you repair by <laughs> spending the supplies you got dropped from the space battle, and then you move on to the next thing with no delay. So there's not very much strategy to it, other than deciding in what order you want to kill the enemy. And I got bored of it, I guess, so we're at the end of my commentary really here. We're not going to show that much more of the campaign, and I'm not going to show you the actual victory conditions of the Ludic Church, because it's too annoying to get to them. But essentially, I can do what I've been doing for the last bit, the last hour of this campaign, as much as I want. I could take every place on the map. I don't think there's anything in the game that can happen to make a fleet appear that might actually beat my fleet, although we have seen stronger fleets exist than the one I have here. Because of deployment point limitations, the AI wouldn't actually be able to use it, most likely. So finally, the annoying limitations that stop the player from doing things might even stop the AI from overcoming this sort of end game setup I have here. And the point is, there were loads of battles, we've been cutting quite quickly here, and this last shot has been me not cutting continuously to give an idea of the time spent doing these things. There are millions of battles where you will definitely win, there's not that much reward anymore to winning, we don't need to win, it's just that it's forcing me to do things. I wanted to auto-resolve, auto-resolve, or, in a more sort of broad and constructive sense, you'd want at this stage in the game to have the mechanics that Nexarellin still doesn't quite add in, where you do have multiple fleets and you can feel that as your empire is getting bigger it's doing more to help you as well so it's not just you doing most of the work which is still the case like the Ludic church with all of these extra planets i've been giving them would have more fleets going around i could have some of them supporting me or something like that to make all of this easier 
and to feel like we're gaining momentum and the repetitive endgame is sort of solved by just having you be extremely powerful in the endgame. So you can skip through it and just kill the enemy really easily, still achieving the sort of immersive in-game result that you did conquer them completely. Just the sort of inevitable part where you will conquer them but it's going to take a while is skipped over in some way. Essentially, it's still not quite there, Star Sector with Nexarellin. It's pretty close to what it, I feel that Star Sector should be like, but it just needs a little bit more, and that little bit more is probably being able to give more orders to fleets on the campaign map, which of course Nexarellin does add in as a feature, so I shouldn't complain too much. They've started doing that, they just need to do it more, it's not enough as it stands. And I think getting that right would actually be an important thing because it would affect especially this part of the game when I have plenty of cash I could send out fleets all over the place it's just that it's too annoying not effective enough too slow so I'm not doing it and that is harming my player experience to some extent I think and as the rant went on another battle has taken place another setup has to go be gone through where we like go and give all of our orders and try to get a formation in place we have to do the thing again where we gradually get through the battle and watch the enemy die one by one we are aided of course by the fact that one of the mods doubles battle speed which makes this way less annoying it would be unimaginably tedious to be playing the sort of end game of star sector where there are millions of battles if you couldn't speed up the battles but that is also true of the whole of Star Sector, I think. Not being able to speed up the battles is just a horrendous choice now that I've seen it without that. As I said earlier, it's one of those things where I didn't really think that it needed that change. But having seen that change, it's like, yep, that was it. That's like an extra point when you're out of 10 score added by just that tiny change. Really, really powerful change that I like to see. Because I'm really harassing both Tretagion and the Persian League, we're having to deal with both of them sending the Vengeance fleets against us. And this is another thing that started to drag on towards the end because he had to fight them so many times. Because we're doing so much damage to the enemy, I'm guessing that increases the vengeance point system. I think I mentioned earlier there's some sort of point system for whether the AI is allowed to do this to you. And I think in the mod settings, you can adjust how it works. So I'm going to complain about it and say that it's too annoying, like too many things come at you. This is the exact same spirit as the vanilla game where it just keeps sending stuff at you if you do too well. I think you can disable it in Nexarellin as far as I remember. Well anyway, with another system conquered from the Persian League, I next decided to move north to finally finish off Tritachio and I worked out where they were. They were right next to where I was just then. So we just go one system over and start taking two relatively weakly defended colonies. The only thing that really tries to stop me is another Persian League executor's fleet, so there's an example of how quickly they come at you again. This time I wasn't even killing the Persian League, and within a few minutes they're back at it again with another big fleet to attack me. At this stage though, I'm so rich, I've got so much stuff, I'm deploying like four battleships into every combat, so even though the AI sometimes brings two or even three, generally you can do something about that and if you focus the enemy down and do some kind of tactics and it don't, definitely looks like I'm doing some tactics here I don't remember what they were but I've got orders going all over the place I clearly thought I was doing something with this perhaps trying to cause some distractions by having separate groups away from the main fleet while having the main fleet focus down individual enemy ships that's probably what I'm trying to do here focus down the enemy's big hitters and then once they're out of the picture as they are just then we can basically just take out the enemy at our leisure which involves, as you can see here, cancelling previous orders. We're going to get rid of all these orders I have down on the field to try and stop whatever I was trying to do with all of those orders happening at the same time. Just an example of this thing, where I got into this weird brain rhythm that I can't describe and won't describe, of giving loads of weird orders to get what I wanted to happen. I feel like I somehow mastered the, IT, the RTS portion of Star Sector, although I don't think that was necessarily a good idea. I'm proud of myself for getting the results I wanted out of it and sort of feeling like maybe I wasn't supposed to, like I've beat the system somehow by somehow getting good at doing that version of playing the game, even if that is an inferior version of playing the game. Well, Tritachion gets absolutely obliterated with no resistance, and as it says here, Tritachion are actually dead. So we have achieved something, but not really the victory conditions. And this is where this commentary is going to come to an end. I remembered in my campaign 
going on to destroy the Persian League's core system. I went and took all of the core system just to be like, haha, that's what you get for winning the campaign before I was ready or something. For whatever reason, I don't have the footage, and that may well be because what I'm describing never happened. This actually happened a long time ago at the time I'm commentating. I don't really remember what happened towards the end of the campaign. I've played so many games since playing Star Sector or playing this campaign in Star Sector. I don't recall. But what I do recall is that the campaign comes to a sort of abrupt conclusion because I got bored at the end. That's the general point I wanted to make about all of these final thoughts here. I think Nexarelin adds the right stuff. It's still not necessarily enough to carry the game right through to the end because it's still repetitive, but it's just less repetitive than the base game because it all happens faster, it's more action-packed. And in the base game, none of this happens at all, which I guess if I'm saying it's too repetitive, having nothing happen at all is the opposite problem. So it's probably the better problem to have that there is some action in the late game, but it's repetitive versus the game just stops and there is no late game. I still don't really know what the developer intended late game of Star Sector is. It may well be the case that they're still intending to add something in the part of the game that Nexarelin takes place in at the moment. So something to, to do once you have a big colony system. It sits there earning you money, but what do you do with it? That's the question the game needs to ask. I suspect from what I've read, there's going to be some kind of eventually like a plot resolution to the game, because I think well, I remember when I played the game the first time, I was very intrigued by the scenario and the plot and the implications of like this Star Sector being part of a bigger universe and there being mysterious hyperspace entities. Like something was going to happen and this would lead up to something and this combines in with like the remnant AI or something. Like there could be something that happens towards the end of a vanilla Star Sector experience. I think they might intend for there to be something at, at some point, and it was only during this campaign, because I was reading the forums all the time, that I basically discovered that there isn't, and that there is no like law behind all of this. And I was very disappointed by that, although this does open up the possibility for me to write my own law, my other hobby as I mentioned earlier. So that is something, I guess. But it was disappointing to me that if you go through the exploration from a sort of immersed law-focused perspective, which is what I tried to do the first time, it actually doesn't go anywhere, as it turns out. Like, I was being strung along. I was being led on by Star Sector. You betrayed me, Star Sector. Or something like that. Well, anyway. That's something that I guess will become the eventual real ending in a hypothetical, like, finished version of Star Sector. At the rate that it's being patched, like, once every couple of years as it stands, I'm guessing that's not going to happen. It doesn't need it. Like, they can just release it as it stands, as far as I'm concerned. In my business opinion, if you just release this with full mod support, that's absolutely fine. That's going to get 90% on Steam reviews. Just go with that. People will probably note that it doesn't have an ending, and other people will just say, ah, get mods, play an Xarelin, because that's basically how it works now, and people are fine with that being the solution to the game's problems. Just get mods. I like to oppose that on a sort of principle basis, like... The developers shouldn't lean too heavily on mods. I mentioned this way earlier, this idea that I've been thinking about recently of whether it's really okay for a game to be really moddable and have great mod support. Because while that is good, it is kind of cheating in the great game of market competition or something like that, I don't know. Like, the developers are getting more out of this than they put in, and the only reason they're getting that is because somebody else isn't getting stuff out when they put things in. The mod authors of Nexarelin don't really get very much from having done all this work to make Nexarelin really good work as far as I'm concerned. But who does get something? Well, it's the people who own the game, because people buy it to play Nexarelin. And there's something going on there. I'd love to see more recognition being given to mod authors. And from a game design perspective, I'd really love to see a lot of the modded stuff just be made part of vanilla, and the guys who did that original work be compensated or brought onto the team, or something. That does happen sometimes. I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but I was playing Project Zomboid recently, which is a game that has had that go through. So that sort of inspired me even more to press on this point with Star Sector because it's a particular game that has that effect. Mountain Blade Bannerlord was the other one that has the same sort of thing going on where we can look at the stats and see that the extreme majority of players haven't played vanilla, but the people who made vanilla benefit the most from all of the other stuff that other people have made. And I imagine Star Sector is like this, where it does have a lot of very clear and in-your-face shortcomings in vanilla, that are solved really easily with mods. And that was the inspiration behind this entire commentary and campaign, was how much better the game is with those mods. It really just sort of 
clicked and started to become the game that I thought it was going to be and was disappointed that it wasn't when I played vanilla. And I remember thinking when I played vanilla, like when people talk about this game, it just feels like they're talking about a different game. Like vanilla Star, Star Sector just isn't the game that people show in YouTube videos. It isn't the game that people talk about and say like, this is the game that I love, my favorite space sim. That stuff, all of the reasons they give, I just kept thinking that isn't in the game, right? I've never found that in the game until I went on the forums, downloaded millions of mods, and it's like, okay, this is it. Same thing with perhaps like Skyrim even, where like your memories of being a power user of Skyrim are so ingrained with mods and things that you changed that you forget that this wasn't the developer's intention and maybe you credit them for that fun that you had. Well, they are to credit to some extent because they made the basis of the fun but the sort of key decision making that caused the fun to actually happen was done by somebody else and some of the key work as well. Something, something, something. There's some kind of point here to be made. It's a point that's more advanced than can be made by somebody just randomly saying things unscripted as a game commentary. So I think I'll just leave it there. But the overall message is that I enjoyed playing modded Star Sector. I enjoyed it a lot more than the base game because even where it's quite similar to the base game, the small changes that it that the various mods make make the game a lot better. It only took about 20 hours to play the entire campaign. That's long enough for sure. So like the speed up mechanics I was talking about, as far as I'm concerned, are required. Like if I was able to bust into the Star Sector offices and force them to implement one mod, it would be increasing the game speed. Because I think giving players control of the game speed is really great just in most games and in this one it makes the game so much better and I can almost guarantee you that most players would have the game speed be much higher most of the time. I really think the slowness of the game holds it back and adds to the feeling of repetition and the number two thing adding to that feeling is the short range of missions so this is the thing that isn't a mod the thing I just changed in the game files Allowing you to go on multiple missions on one expedition makes the game so much more fun to me. It just makes sense and it removes a lot of repetition as well because you don't go backwards and forwards to get missions. It makes doing missions more profitable, it makes going for a big exploration run more profitable and more cool and breaks up the flow of the game in a better way because you don't have to go on six expeditions to get the money you need to do a colony. You go on one big expedition that's more profitable, so you have like one gameplay mode, and then you switch to the other gameplay mode. And it's more paced in some way. That's what I think anyway. And those are just my favorite examples, like really small changes. You're basically still playing Star Sector, but it feels different when you're there. Something hard to describe by just <laughs> gesturing at my monitor and saying how much better it is. I think the mod package that I had here, which is basically the set of utility mods that were recommended on the main forum post. There's like a mod list of all the mods in the Star Sector forums. I took basically all of the quality of life mods and this easily changed the game from something like a 6 out of 10, which is what I was thinking in vanilla. It just had too many problems. I, rem I remember thinking this game would be 9, like to me. Like I really like the concept of this game. This game feels like it was made for me, but there's so many big problems that I just couldn't recommend it. And I did not understand why people loved it so much. Like these problems to me were enormous. And then I played the modded version and I basically, basically think that this is it now. Like this has easily gone up to an 8. You could go further than that if you like. Like, there's still some more work to do, I think, but it's basically fine. You could easily release Star Sector Next Arelin and call that the finished game. And because it's taking so long to make the finished game, maybe just from a practical point of view, that might be a good idea. Because at this stage, other games have come along to compete with Star Sector. Like, I was playing Avorian recently, and I was surprised by that. I was like, a lot of the stuff I liked about Star Sector is in this other game that I'd never heard of before, but is newer and is much better and is doing a lot of the same things, but with just more, like a bigger budget, basically. It's a different tier of game, but it's providing the same kind of feel that I had from Star Sector, and I really liked that, and I thought probably other people would if they found out about it as well. At least for now, Star Sector has its cult classic value, I suppose, something like that. It reminds me of something like RimWorld, where it's a sort of rudimentary game that has a lot of in-your-face problems, but it's really moddable, which makes it really popular. And it's something where 
There isn't quite another game that's like it, so even though you can get very similar like game style experiences from better or bigger, bigger budget games with more to offer, there's something specific about these simple 2D implementations that is appealing in some way. I guess the good news is while these games are sort of in competition with each other, and you might make comments saying like, well this game does this thing better so it's better value for money or something, and fine. The real thing is, well it reminds me of that meme where there's like two cakes. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> where like, you make a product that's competing with another product, and you're like, well my product is a worse version of what these guys with more money and a bigger dev team have done. So I should feel bad about this. And no, you shouldn't feel bad about this, because the consumers of that other product will just also consume your product. Like, you're not actually in competition a lot of the time, so even though there is competition, probably the demand for what you're making is greater than the supply, and your supply will be appreciated anyway. Something, something, something. Star Sector isn't as good as it should be, it isn't as good as it could be, that doesn't really matter. I still had a fun time, at least the second time around, playing Star Sector, and playing it with full knowledge of the game and full mods. All of the sort of major issues I had with the game were addressed by either the mods or me just knowing all of the like cheats and workarounds to not deal with the major issues of the game. Those issues remain, and for me, those still deduct points on the out of 10 scale, so I'm never going to give it more than an 8 until they fix some of these really easy to fix things, in my opinion. I basically think like you could change this from in the region of a 7 to in the region of a 9. If you did something like remove double salvage, or like put some more text on the title screen explaining what's going on, or just had an opening cutscene, or something like that, like some of the big stumbling blocks of the game where you could imagine like if this game had achievements you'd look up the achievements and you'd see like oh that's weird like 40 percent only 40 percent of players ever colonized somewhere and it was it would just be it's one of these things where it will be the players didn't know you could do it that sort of thing because out in the real world players don't read the forums they don't read reddit anything that's not like explained quite up front in the game might just be overlooked, and the game can fall down because of that. Like the other day, here's a random anecdote, I was playing Returnal on the PS5, which in like the critical reviews, it's like this is the one must play game on PS5, finally PS5 has a system seller, 10 out of 10, and I'm like what? I played it, and I was like well this is okay, but I can't imagine other people would like this or would get very far in it, it's basically a bullet hell game. and. When I looked at the achievement data, it's like, yeah, like less than half the players have completed the first level in this 10 out of 10 game. There's this like disconnect between what real people think about when they play games and how they experience games and how like people really in the know, really in the gaming world play games. And I'm making some noble gesture towards getting people to think about that a bit more. And I think Star Sector is an example of that. It has the advantage that so many people come to know about Star Sector through experience, like through seeing somebody else play it, that it doesn't need to explain itself quite as much just as a random other game. But it still should, and it would still benefit from doing so, and I think that's probably a big thing to focus on if they want to go for a big public release on Steam. Maybe that would help, although at this stage probably everybody who wants to play Star Sector already has, so maybe they like, don't need to think about it as a big public release on Steam. Whatever. I had some thoughts on Star Sector and I think we're going to bring them to a close right here. I had fun with this, I recommend the mod package I had, not going to tell you what it was other than XRN because I've forgotten, but it was just the mod list given in the forum as the like utility mod list. There are different mod lists, a lot of them add random other content like anime girls and stuff and like new factions and loads of things, didn't really play with those because I just wanted a better vanilla experience, and I got it, so thanks to the mod authors. You're doing the Lord's work, and perhaps the company that owns this game, that owns this property, owes you something for doing that. That's my overall big take for the video. Let's get out of here, hope you enjoyed this Star Sector campaign filled with rants. Thank you very much for getting this far through the video if you did, and if you really want to see more Star Sector rants, I'll link in the description my now unlisted original Star Sector rant, which is even longer than this, which was basically the rants I made as I went through the game for the first time. So it's filled with like first impressions where I just hate things like as they hit me and I was so disappointed, and then sort of gradually came to like it later, and then switched around to hating it again at the end after I realised there was no end game. 
And that's where Nexarellin, of course, has come in now to change my experience, change my opinion to some extent. But because it's through the mod, I feel like I shouldn't have my opinion changed again. Immediately going back into the point, I can't resist talking about this. Let's just say the video is over. There's more video that is like this but worse in the description if you really want some more. But uh, this video is intended as a replacement for that video, so you definitely don't need to watch it. That's all for now. Thank you for watching. Coming next will be High Fleet. I mentioned earlier I was playing High Fleet at some point while also playing Star Sector or making this commentary. Again, that's now like ages ago in real life. Like I can barely remember playing High Fleet, but I will go through my footage and make a complete commentary on the game of High Fleet, which is another kind of 2D indie darling of the quote unquote strategy world. It's kind of a strategy game and there's plenty to say about it. It's a very cool game. That'll be lots of nice material for me to talk about going forwards. Have a good time, everyone. I think I'm finally done ranting about Star Sector, if such a thing can ever be true.